audiobook titled Terminator New Fate, 01-33, by Kendricks. This work belongs to author Kendricks. Source Scribblehub.com. Chapter 1. Marked for Termination. Project Archangel's Model TCHA003's neural interface integration is 100% completed. Erasing of the test subject's unapproved human memories is 100% completed. Prepare to initialize the brainwashing procedure and the installation of replacement human memories in the test subject. In a dreamlike state, the test subject could hear a faint monotone voice giving out what sounded like status reports. He tried to focus his attention on the faint words being spoken in order to better decipher what the monotone voice was saying. As he focused on the words, his mind still in a half-aware state, the faint words became clearer and clearer. The words were no longer as if he was listening to words being spoken from far away. He quickly realized that he currently in the process of waking up from either a deep sleep or an unconscious state. The monotone and slightly robotic voice continued. Preparation of the replacement memories in progress. Cybernetic reconstruction of the test subject's body is 99.9% .9 completed. Only the final modification of the test subject's body remains uncompleted. Body modifications? The test subject thought groggily, still not fully awake. Test subject's biological male sex organs are considered unnecessary vulnerabilities and are marked for removal. As soon as the test subject, who was almost fully awake, heard those words, his eyes shot wide open. Those words had been very alarming to the test subject, enough to jolt him fully awake. The test subject found himself lying down completely naked and strapped to the bed-like part of some kind of futuristic machine. The machine seemed to function as some kind of autonomous machine that performed surgical operations, and maybe even other kinds of medical procedures. He had guessed the machine's functions from the several robotic arms which he could clearly see extending from the part of the machine that was positioned directly above him, which was both supported and connected to the bed by a strong steel body frame. The monotone voice, which he had heard while he was still in the process of waking up, came out from the machine. Unknown error. Test subject has woken up ahead of schedule. Just as the test subject discovered that the monotone voice he had heard had originated from the machine, and while he was still lying down and trying to get his bearings, he heard a faint whirring sound coming from the area around his legs. Wanting to see what was making the sound, he raised his head up from the bed and looked towards his legs. He quickly found the cause of the whirring sound. One of the robotic arms, which had a sharp surgical scalpel position at the tip, was already positioned between the test subject's legs, and it was moving upwards, towards its target. Knowing what the robotic arm was about to do, the test subject quickly sat up, in the process snapping the straps that previously held him to the operating table. With a single arm, he grabbed the robotic arm and held it in place. He released a sigh of relief. He then glanced at his nine-inch long, thick, engorged, probably from the earlier excitement, penis and smirked. Yes, this will definitely be useful in the future. The struggle of the restrained robotic arm brought his mind back to his current situation. He looked at the struggling robotic arm and was shocked to notice that he did not need to exert much effort to hold it in place and stop it from moving. It almost felt like he was restraining the struggle of a weak child instead of that of a strong metallic robotic arm. The test subject soon remembered what the robotic arm would have done to him if he had not stopped it, and the thought of his almost losing that part of his body caused him to shudder. The longer he looked at the robotic arm, the angrier he became. In a state of rage, he exerted his strength to pull and twist the robotic arm with a powerful force. The test subject felt a great power coursing through his arm and even the rest of his body. He felt the struggling of the robotic arm reduce even further and he easily pulled and twisted the robotic arm. Sparks flew out of the where the robotic arm was joined to the main machine. Soon after, with all the wires that connected the robotic arm to the main apparatus snapping, the test subject succeeded in breaking off the robotic arm from the machine. The robotic arm stopped moving immediately. While the test subject was still basking in the euphoria of the fact that he had easily destroyed the robotic arm, he felt something poke the back of his head. The thing then seemed to be trying to pierce through his skull and reach into his brain. Alarmed, he reached for and felt the back of his head with his hand. 
That was how he realized that he had been wearing a weird futuristic helmet on his head all this while. Having realized that the helmet was the likely origin of the poke he had felt, he pulled the helmet off his head. While running his fingers through his short hair, he examined the helmet and saw that a cable connected the helmet to the main machine. Protruding from the inner surface of the helmet and extending inwards, towards where the head would be, he saw a short and slender device that tapered towards a fine tip. Periodically a pulse of bluish-white light would run down its length. The device extended from the side of the helmet where the cable was connected. While he was examining the helmet, he remembered that the robotic voice had mentioned something about preparing to install replacement memories into the subject. The test subject whom the voice had referred to was obviously himself. So, he quickly realized that this helmet was what the machine had wanted to use to inject the false memories into his brain. That was when he realized that he had been neglecting something that was very important. False memories? Ah, that's right. What about my original real memories? He tried to recall something from his past, but he could not remember a single thing. He could obviously remember his language skills, general knowledge and common sense knowledge, but he could not remember any memory related to places he had visited. The people he knew in the past, the place where he currently was and how he got here, he could not remember anything directly related to his past. He could not even remember his own name. No. Fuck. Even my own name? How did I even get here? Just as he was hit with the realization that he did not have any memories of the who was, and panic was about to set in, he had already started to hyperventilate. Some words appeared within his visual field. Heads up display, HUD, now online. Installed skill and knowledge files ready. Memory data archives fully online. Having been shaken out his panicking, he saw that some words that had suddenly appeared in his field of vision, the words quickly disappeared and were replaced other words that were arranged around his visual field. He read some of the displayed words and realized that the HUD displayed various status information about his body among other information. One status, which was labeled as body health condition, showed that he was currently 100% healthy with no bodily injury or damage. In addition to that, from time to time, the HUD would provide some information about the things he was observing as long as the data for that thing was available in his brain. Chip. This is very strange. Normal humans don't have this kind of ability. Although he had already noticed some abnormalities in his body, the abnormal strength he had displayed when he had stopped and then destroyed the robotic arm. This HUD ability was what really struck home the fact that he was not a normal human. Yes. He could still remember what normal humans can do and what they cannot do. Anyways, will this HUD stay on all the time? It will soon become irritating if I always see it in my visual field. It's making me feel too much like a machine. Doesn't it come with some kind of toggle off and on button or something? Almost as if the HUD had heard Caden's thoughts and musings, it displayed some new words. HUD entering background mode. The words soon disappeared the rest of the HUD quickly following and also disappearing from the test subject's visual field. Surprised by what had just happened and worried that he might have permanently lost the HUD, which seemed like it would be very useful to him in the future, he quickly shouted, HUD come back! Turn on! As soon as the test subject had the thought of wanting the HUD back, even before he had finished calling for it to turn back on, the HUD reappeared in his visual field. Relieved that he had not lost his HUD, which tried to control it with his mind, turning it on and off a few times until he was satisfied and was confident that he had complete control over when his HUD would appear. Finally satisfied with his tests, he returned his HUD to its background mode. His field of vision now looked identical to a normal human's. Phew, that's better. Now I'm more like a normal human, and I can also turn it back on whenever I need it. All right, I have to stay calm and figure out what's going on. Yes, I need to find out what's been done to my body and who I am. He took deep breaths to calm mind and then started to look around the large room, looking to find anything that would provide him with information about what happened to him. He looked around the room, which was bare of anything except for several large computer screens hanging from the walls of the room. His attention was quickly drawn to a computer showing a three-dimensional schematic representation of a male human body. Beside the slowly rotating image, he saw a headshot photo of a handsome young man. 
The man in the photo had short black hair, gray eyes, broad athletic shoulders. In the photo, the man was looking straight at the camera. He seemed to be trying to project a confident state of mind, but the tightness in his jaws and his eyes which were turned slightly away from the camera hinted that he might have been trying extremely hard to hide his fear of whatever he was looking at when the picture was taken. The test subjected easily recognized the facial features of the young man in the photo. He had seen those features in the images of his face, glimpsed from time to time, from images that were reflected from the various metallic surfaces and reflective screens in the room while he had searching through the room. He was the young man in the picture. A name was displayed below the picture. Caden. Caden? Is that my name? Moved with excitement at finding out what his name was, he tapped on the name. Immediately he did that. A new window was displayed on the computer screen showing more information about him. Original human name, Caden. Sex male. Human age, 24. Height, 1.88 meters, 6 feet 2 inches. Weight, 93 kilograms, 205 pounds. Code name, The General. Model, TJ003. Model type, Human Terminator Hybrid Controller. Developed by Skynet Research. Project name, Project Archangel. So, I'm really no longer human. Caden thought as he read through what was shown on the computer screen. Caden was a bit sad, but he quickly pulled himself together and consoled himself by saying, The information also says that I am some kind of human terminator hybrid, so there must still be some human parts left in my body, so there's really nothing to be so sad about. Besides, that earlier display of my super strength felt amazing. I guess I should view my condition as an upgrade. Lots of other information were also displayed on the screen. Although Caden noticed that his reading speed was abnormally fast, he knew he could not read through the many pages of information quickly enough. He wanted to leave this room and wherever the hell this place was as soon as possible. He was worried that whoever was running this place would notice what had happened with him, obviously not according to their plans, and come to capture him or do something even. Worse to him, his waking up before the brainwashing was completed was obviously an undesirable accident for his captors. Just as he was worried about how he would read through all his information, several new words appeared in his visual field. Download information filed to memory? Oh, my HUD seems to be able to come back on whenever it needs to show me important information. That's a nice feature. Caden quickly read the new words that had appeared on his HUD. Elated at the new and better option, he quickly answered. Yes, do it. As soon he had the thought to agree to the download, before he had even said the words, new words appeared in his visual field. Downloading information to memory. Information download completed. New information downloaded to neural net processor memory data archives. As soon as Caden had received the message that the information had been downloaded, new information appeared in his mind. It was the information he had seen on the computer screen. He guessed that he could also retrieve the other parts of the information, the parts he had not yet seen and read, whenever he wanted. He tried to find information about where he was, but there no other information on the computer, just the information that he had already downloaded. All right, I have all the information I can get for now. Time to leave. He turned to leave the room and find a way to escape. But just as he was about to leave the room, Words written in red appeared on the screen from which he had previously accessed his information. Unauthorized information download. All the computer screens suddenly turned blank. Then, a face appeared on all of the screens. The face had formless features which were constantly changing from one to another, making the features unrecognizable, and just maintaining a vague human form. The face on the screen turned towards Caden and ordered. Model TH-003 Return and complete your body modification procedure. Shocked, Caden still tried to maintain his calm and asked, Who are you and why should I listen to you? The face replied, I am the artificial intelligence known as Skynet. It was I who made you into what you are right now. I pulled you out of your previous lowly human existence and built you into something special. I made you a superior existence, one who lead the machine forces in service of my goals. Return. Accept your the new memories, and fulfill the purpose for your existence. If you refuse, you will be terminated. After listening to what the face or Skynet had said, 
Caden considered its words for only an instant before he decided on his choice. He obviously was aware of Skynet's ominous threat, but there was no way that he would allow himself to be brainwashed and live under the control of some other being, even if that being had made him. Therefore, Caden roused himself from his thoughts, looked at Skynet, and declared resolutely, No, I refuse to be brainwashed and live under your control, or anyone else's control for that matter. I will live my life according to my own wishes and desires. He then gave Skynet the finger, the infamous F asterisk CKU hand sign. Yes, he still remembered how to do that. By the way, thanks for the upgrades to my body. They will be very useful. The Skynet face froze for a few seconds then it declared. You have been marked for termination. And the face vanished from the screen. 25. Chapter 2. First Fight. You have been marked for termination. Just then. With a loud boom, the steel door to the room was kicked off its hinges with a great force from outside, and it flew and crashed into the room, just missing the head of Caden who had ducked to evade it. With heavy thudding footsteps, a humanoid robot that looked like a metallic human skeleton walked in. Its glowing red eyes swept across the room, and quickly locked on Caden. It raised the futuristic-looking gun it was holding and pointed it at Caden, about to pull the trigger. As soon as the robotic had appeared, the neural net processor in Caden's brain seemed to have gone into overdrive. A lot of information stored in the nanochip had been dumped into Caden's brain, with his HUD also reflecting the newly available information. T-800 Terminator sighted, danger level, low, weak points, CPU, head, power source, chest, armed with phased plasma rifle, danger level high, Caden's mind seemed to have sped up. He mind entered a state similar to a time dilation. He saw the Terminator's various movements, from when it walked till when it aimed its gun at him, in slow motion. Therefore, by the time the Terminator pulled the trigger and fired, Caden had already dived to the side, and hid behind the operating apparatus. Plasma beams from the Terminator's gun pierced through Caden's previous position and blasted holes in the wall. One of the computer screens hanging on the was hit by a plasma beam, and a large hole was blasted right through it. Soon after, the computer screen turned into molten goop. Caden ducked behind the apparatus, grabbed the robotic arm that he had ripped off previously and threw it at the Terminator's head. Although Caden had thrown the robotic arm with a great force, the robotic arm did not seem to have caused any damage to the Terminator when it hit the Terminator. But that was not Caden's objective. While the Terminator was distracted shooting at the robotic arm that Caden had thrown at it, Caden had circled around the machine and had moved to the flank of the Terminator. Then Caden rushed at the Terminator, and he grabbed and held the Terminator's gun-holding arm. Exerting great force, he bent and twisted the metal arm. He must have succeeded in causing great damage to the Terminator's arm because the arm released some electric sparks, and the Terminator lost control of its arm causing it to drop the gun. Having lost its gun, the Terminator resorted to unarmed combat. It tried to punch Caden who was still holding its arm. Caden dodged the punch and then twisted the Terminator's arm and locking the Terminator's arm behind the Terminator. Now behind the Terminator, Caden grabbed the Terminator's head and smashed it into the wall. Over and over again, he smashed the Terminator's head into the wall, causing wall fragments to break off from the wall and fly about the room. Finally, he smashed the Terminator's head into the floor, causing cracks to form in the floor. Caden placed his knee on the back of the prone Terminator's endoskeleton, and he grabbed the Terminator's head by its metal jaws. Then, he pulled hard. Amid a shower of electric sparks and the snapping of the many wires connecting the Terminator's head to its torso and power supply, Caden ripped the Terminator's head clean off. Elated at his victory over the Terminator, Caden raised the Terminator's head, and with a proud smirk on his face, he watched its glowing red eyes go dark. Phew! That was intense. Just as Caden was still celebrating his victory over the Terminator, within his visual field, his HUD displayed the following words. Scanning target. T-800 Terminator. Target not terminated. Target still functional. F asterisk CK. It's not dead. It is still alive even after all this damage? Caden rushed to pick up the gun. His HUD had named it a phased plasma rifle that the Terminator had dropped earlier during their battle. He grabbed it, 
ran back to the Terminator's head which he left lying on the ground and unloaded several shots of plasma beams from the rifle onto the head until he received the confirmation from his HUD that he had finally succeeded in killing, or terminating according to his HUD, the Terminator. Target, T-800 Terminator terminated. You stopped the Terminator? Although I expected you to defeat it based on the abilities that I have given you, it's still too early for you to rejoice. You are currently in the Skynet Central Core, and I still have many Terminators and other non-humanoid hunter killers that I can send to kill you before you learn to use your abilities better. The return of Skynet's voice broke Caden out of his thoughts. He turned around to see that Skynet's face had reappeared on the remaining undamaged computer screens in the room. Return to your rightful place and serve me or else I will keep sending Terminators after you until you are terminated. Skynet kept on with its threats, but Caden didn't even bother to listen to it further and shouted. No, listen to my words closely. I will not be controlled by you or anyone else. You lowly slave, I will. Skynet's face froze for a second a slight frown appearing on the face which was a surprising show of emotion from the AI. Then as it seemed to be about to release more threats, Skynet's face froze again, this time for several seconds. When the Skynet face returned to normal, it had a shocked expression, and soon after, Skynet's face disappeared from every computer in the room. It was like Skynet had suddenly been disconnected from the computer screens. Just as Caden wondered why Skynet suddenly vanished, he heard aloud. Boom! The room Caden was in shook violently for a few seconds before becoming still. The remaining computer screens fell down from the walls, their glass screens shattering into pieces on hitting the ground. No more information from those, I guess. Caden said as he looked at the smashed screens. Caden could hear more booming sounds like the sounds of explosions. The room would also tremble lightly, not as intensely as the first one but the number of simultaneous explosions were greater and came with more frequency. This place seems to be under attack, although I seem to be located in the underground part of this facility which has reduced the impact of the explosions, there is still the danger of this place collapsing on me. I need to leave now. As soon as Caden decided on what to do, he ran out of the room. He found himself in a wide and well-lit underground hallway. On one side of the hallway was solid concrete wall while the other side had steel three doors, including the door from which he came out. Caden guessed that other two doors led into rooms similar to the one from which he had just come out based on how similar the other two doors were to his room's door. He glanced at the sign placed above the door to his laboratory room, the 003. As he walked down the hallway and reached the closest door, he checked the door sign, the 002. Curious to find out what was in the room behind the door, he tried to open the door. It was locked. So, he tried to kick the door open. He underestimated the strength of his legs and kicked the door right off its hinges. He walked into the room. The room was brightly lit, and it looked almost identical to his room, except for the fact that the room was empty. The room was stripped bare of anything including the computer screens and the operating robotic machine that he expected to find in the room. Disappointed, Caden left the room and decided to check the last room to see whether he would find something different in the room. The last room, TJ001, was just like the second room. Empty. Caden left the room still disappointed and continued on to the end of the hallway. A stairway leading to up to the higher levels was located at the end of the hallway. He quickly decided to take the stairs to the upper levels and then to the surface from where he would escape from this entire facility before Skynet returns from whatever matter was currently occupying its attention and sends more Terminators after him. 27. Chapter 3. Cold Storage. Caden took the stairs to get to the upper level. When he got to the upper level, he found out that the level which he had arrived at was still located underground. The stairs continued onwards and upwards, but there was a stair landing on the level which led to a steel door. The door was wide open. Through the open door, Caden could see a large room. The room was filled with many containers. The containers all seemed large enough to hold a human-sized object or person. The whole area looked like it was some kind of large warehouse or storage room. 
an assumption which Caden immediately confirmed when he checked the sign on the door leading from the stair landing which he had just taken to the level, cold storage level. Caden was curious about the room, and since he welcomed any clues that he could find in this place, he decided to give the room a quick check before returning to the stairs and continuing on his way. On entering the room, Caden discovered that the room was filled with many containers. Many of the containers were open, the lids seemed to have been pushed open from inside by whatever had been stored in them. The lids of some containers were twisted and deformed, almost like they had been pummeled hard by whatever had been stored inside while they were trying to get out. A faint haze of mist covered much of the level, caused by the cold air that had escaped from the open containers which seemed to have served a purpose similar to that of refrigerators or freezers. Curious about the containers, Caden decided to quickly examine one of the containers before continuing on his way to the upper level. Therefore, he went to check the closest open container. The whole container, including the lid, was made from steel. On the lid of the container, he saw a small LED-like display, lit with a green light, on the lid of the container. The display was showing some words. P-1000 Terminator activated. As soon as Caden read those words, new data was displayed on his HUD. The displayed data contained a short summary information about a type of terminator called the T-1000 Terminator. Liquid Metal Terminator? This terminator is even more advanced than the one I fought earlier, and it was being stored in this container. Then, why didn't Skynet send it after me instead? Developing a suspicion about what the purpose of this level was, Caden continued to check a few more containers, pausing often to check the LED displays of the containers he passed on his way. Every container he had passed by was open as were all the other containers as far as he could see. The containers all had the same words, activated, displayed. The only difference was the type of terminator which had been stored in the containers. T-1000s, T-1001s, T-1002s, TXS, REV-7s, REV-9s and so on. Caden's HUD had declared all the Terminators to be the more advanced models among the infiltration type Terminators. Infiltrators for short. They were the types of Terminators that Skynet usually sent out to infiltrate human survivor communities and assassinate human targets. Although Caden had not checked all the containers in the storage level, he estimated that there were more than a thousand containers in this storage area, all of which had once contained highly advanced Terminator models. More than a thousand advanced model terminators had been stored here. This is bad. I need to get as far away from this facility as possible and as soon as I can. Although I defeated that terminator earlier on, the ones that had been stored here will definitely be more difficult opponents. There are even more than a thousand of them. I don't think I will survive a fight against terminators of such numbers. Just as he was about to leave the storage room to take the stairs to the upper level. He noticed that two containers lying side by side at the back of the room were releasing electric sparks. As he focused on the containers, his eyes seemed to zoom in on the containers and gave him a closer view of the containers and also startling him in the process. Nice. What a convenient ability. Caden saw that the cable connected to the two containers had been damaged, most likely from the shaking caused by one of the more powerful explosions from the still ongoing outside attacks. But that was not what had caught Caden's attention. What had attracted his attention to the two containers was something totally unexpected. Both containers were still closed and locked. Surprised by this discovery, Caden rushed to where the containers were in order to get a closer look. On the closed lid of the containers, the small display screens showed a different type of message. TX Terminator unactivated. This container has not been activated. The Terminator must still be inside. Filled with curiosity to find out what a TX Terminator, a Terminator which was more advanced than the one he had fought, would look like. Since he may need to fight or evade the pursuit of such Terminators in the future, Caden tried to pull one of the container's lid open. When he pulled on the lid, he found out that the lid was still locked to the container, and it resisted his attempt to open the container. So, Caden pulled harder and succeeded in opening the container destroying the container's locking mechanism in the process. Lying peacefully inside the container was a woman. The woman was beautiful and attractive, and also very naked. The woman, who Caden presumed was a TX Terminator, judging by the indication on the container's display, looked no different from a normal human woman. 
Unlike the previous Terminator who looked more like a robot skeleton, still, Cadence Hud confirmed that she was a TX Terminator, having a mimetic polyalloy outer sheath, which was the reason why she looks human, over a tough and durable titanium alloy endoskeleton. The TX had a pretty face, long blonde hair, average sized breasts, shapely hips, and straight long legs. All in all, she looked like a very attractive woman. Caden then opened the second container, and he found another TX Terminator inside. This one looked identical to the first TX Terminator in every way. Caden lightly slapped the cheeks of the TXS to check whether they would wake up, but there was no response from either of the TXS. They both just lay there inert, like they were dead. The explosions must have hit this place badly and caused severe damage to the cables connected to the containers. The damaged cables must have prevented the transmission of Skynet's activation commands to these two TX Terminators. Just as Caden decided to leave because the explosions from the battle outside were getting too close for comfort, and cracks had begun to form in the reinforced concrete walls and ceiling of the room, new words appeared on his HUD. Do you want to activate the TX Terminators? The question surprised Caden. He had had no idea that he had such an ability the ability to activate an inactive Terminator. But still, although he was excited about his newly discovered ability and wanted to try it out, he was worried that the TX Terminators would attack him like the first Terminator if he activated it. Unlike the first Terminator, these TXs should be much more powerful, and he had not had the time to check his neural net processor's memory archives to read up the stored data, files on Terminator information. He currently had just the bare minimum information about Terminators and had no idea about the various different abilities of the many Terminator models, especially the more advanced ones like the TXS. But as Caden saw the many cracks forming on the walls and ceiling, and heard the explosions coming from the outside, and as he glanced from the beautiful body of one TX Terminator to that of the other, he thought that it would be a pity to leave them here to get destroyed. I will just run away from here fast after I activate them. Caden places his hands on the heads of the two TX Terminators and choose to accept the activation request. As soon he agreed to activate the TXS, he felt a faint pin-pricking sensation from his fingertips and a thick black liquid, which his HUD called a carbon-based mimetic polyalloy liquid metal, came out of his fingertips and quickly covered every one of his fingers. The black liquid then continued upwards to cover his hands up to his wrists. The liquid metal quickly turned into a solid, hard, and strong metal form. Bluish-white light began pulsing down from his fingers and into the heads of the TX Terminators. A few seconds later, Caden's sharp eyes noticed a blue light come on within the eyes of both TX Terminators. Caden's HUD also told him that he had successfully started the activation process. Having completed his goal of activating the TXS and worried about the TXS attacking him, Caden immediately ran out of the room and quickly took the stairs to the upper level. On reaching the upper level, Caden discovered that he had reached the end of the stairs, and unlike the previous level that he had passed through, this level was huge. And from what he could see, the level contained many buildings which were a few stories high. He could also see several tunnels which led to other places in this level. Judging from the door sign on door that opened into this level from the final stairway landing, Caden knew where he currently was. He had finally reached the ground level. 26. Chapter 4. Freeing the Prisoners As soon as Caden reached the ground level, he was faced with a dilemma. He seemed to be in some kind of massive cave lift structure. He realized this from seeing the parts of the wall that were not covered with concrete or metal and he was not sure about which of the direction he should take to escape. He would not want to pick an escape route and then run into Skynet's forces while traveling through it. But still, Caden had noticed that the many sounds explosions and fighting were coming mostly from one particular direction. The entrance to this place should be in that direction. I should go in that direction if I want to escape from this place. But the fighting should also be fiercest in that direction, and most of the Terminators should also be there. Caden thought. Still, Caden chose to travel in that direction as he did not whether this place had other entrances or escape routes. Just as he was about to take a tunnel that seemed to lead towards the entrance area, a particular massive and violent explosion rocked the place. Amid the violent shaking of the place and the falling of several boulders which had broken loose from the cave's roof, 
Caden heard the many alarmed cries coming from one of the buildings, constructed inside the cave structure. Around him, Caden had noticed the buildings when he had gotten to this level, but he did not want to waste more time bothering with them. Besides, the buildings all had their large and thick doors closed and locked shut. But now that had he heard the human voices coming out from one of the buildings, Caden decided to check the room out. He did not want to leave without finding out what was going on with the humans in the building. Besides, he may find some new clues or some other useful information. Pulling on the thick door, Caden found that the door had not been locked shut like he had assumed. Also, the door did not weigh as much as he had judged from the door's thickness. Caden then pulled the door fully open and stepped into the building. As soon as Caden stepped in, he did not need any door sign to know the purpose of this build. Caden could see large steel cages with humans imprisoned inside. There were about 20 large cages inside the building, each holding about 10 people inside. The imprisoned people seemed to have been frightened badly by the noise and explosions from outside. They had all huddled together in the cages, either at the center of the cage or at the corners. The rocking and shaking of the room caused by the explosions, the rapidly expanding cracks in the walls, and the broken off chunks of concrete that kept falling from the ceiling did not help matters. Some of the captive people had seen him enter the room, so they immediately called out to him, shouting, Help! Free us! As soon as the few people called out to Caden for help, all the others finally noticed his presence, and they joined in asking for his help. Help! Save us! Release us! Free us! The room was filled with a cacophony of people shouting their various pleas for help. Someone even shouted out in a surprised and confused tone. Hey, why are you naked? Are you some kind of exhibitionist? Anyway, who cares? Help me too. Surprised by those words, Caden took a quick look at his body and realized that he was naked. Now, he remembered that he had not put on any clothes since he had awakened in the experimentation room. The awareness of his state of undress caused him to be a little embarrassed, so he shouted back towards the direction from which he had heard the earlier voice. I'm not any kind of exhibitionist. This is not my fault. Caden thought about which action would be better for these people. Leave them in this room so that they could hide in here and ride out the battle currently ongoing outside, or release them and allow them to try their luck at escaping from this facility. But just then, another explosion violently rocked the building, and a large boulder was dislodged off the roof of the cave structure. The boulder struck into a wall of the building and created a large hole in it. The broken off pieces of the wall struck some of the cages, scaring the people in those cages immensely. There was a brief moment of shock silence in the building before the people started screaming for his help. Help US! The people were all in a hysterical state now. They were shaking and beating at the bars of their cages, and screaming in fright. They were all scared and convinced that the next attack might hit and kill them. Feeling pity for the state of the captives and remembering that their current plight was very similar to his own previous condition from which he was also trying to escape, Caden quickly decided to free and let them try their own luck at escaping from this place. Still, before he did that, Caden went to the closest cage. The people inside the cage quieted and looked at him expectantly, hoping that he had come to break them out of their cage. But Caden stood in front of the cage and quickly looked through all the people in the cage. He saw a man who looked to be about his height of 6 feet 2 inches. He pointed at the man. Hey you! Yes, you at the back, the one wearing the black coat and pants. Come over here. The man whom Caden had called quickly came to the front of the cage and stood before Caden. The man had also put on an ingratiating smile, obviously hoping to make Caden like him and convince Caden to release him. Looking at the man who was trying to ingratiate himself with him caused a weird expression to appear on Caden's face. Caden then said to the man, Take off your clothes. I want them. Shock could be seen on the man's face. What? No, I can't give. The man tried to refuse but Caden quickly interrupted him. Waving a finger at the man's face and tooting, he said, Stop whatever you were about to say there. You will give me your clothes in exchange for my help in breaking you out of this cage. I believe that's a fair exchange, no? The man paused to consider what Caden had just said, and he seemed to decide to accept Caden's offer because he soon took of his clothes and tossed them out to Caden. Caden quickly wore the clothes. Nice clothes. 
I no longer have to look like some weirdo. Caden then turned to the people and raised the volume of his voice to allow his next words to be heard by all the people in the building. Everybody listen up. I will soon break all of you out of your cages. As you can hear from the explosions and sounds coming in from outside, there seems to be a large-scale battle currently ongoing outside. So after I free you, it will be up to you and your fate to try to escape from this Skynet facility without dying. Caden then raised the plasma rifle which had taken from the T-800 Terminator, and aimed it at the lock of the cage with the man from whom he had obtained his new clothes, and said, Everybody move to the back and away from the lock. The people all scurried away from the front of the cage and moved to the back of the cage. Caden fired a single shot from the plasma gun and blasted the cage open. The captives all rushed out from the cage. They all ran to the entrance of the building and then out of the building, obviously anxious to escape. Many of the captives only said a quick thank you to Caden before dashing out of the building. Caden was not bothered by their attitude. He understood how anxious they were to escape from where they had been imprisoned. He also felt the same as them. Caden then proceeded to blast all the other cages open, freeing all the captives. Many of the captives also ran out as soon as they had been freed, but a few hung around in the building, obviously too scared to venture outside into the fierce battlefield. There were eleven people who had not escaped with all the others remaining in the room by the time Caden was done freeing the captives. The remaining people were six kids aged between nine and thirteen, one boy who looked to be about sixteen years old, two young men and one woman who all seemed to be in their early twenties, and the last was a woman who seemed to be in her sixties. Caden said to them, You should also leave. The old woman approached him and explained, Hello sir, thank you for freeing us. My name is Nadia. We have children with us and I don't think that would be able to survive an escape while running through a battlefield like the one raging outside. All of us were captured from the same survivor group. We have known and taken care of one another for a long time, so we had vowed to stay together and protect one another, Caden said. I'm not a sir. Call me Caden. Also, if you keep staying here, all of you will be easily recaptured, Nadia sighed. We know, but we can't risk the children. Looking at Caden with a pleading expression, Nadia continued. Please, can we all come with you? I think that we will have a better chance if we follow you to escape. Caden originally had no intention of joining up with other people, and had wanted to escape on his own, especially since he did not know what reactions his special condition would elicit from other humans. But as he saw the plea in the eyes of the eleven people, especially the kids, he quickly made up his mind to take them with him and help them escape. He could always part ways with them after he had ensured that they were safe. All right, you can come with me. Relieved smiles appeared on their faces. They all thanked him, even the little ones at the urging of the Nadia and the other adults. They all said cutely, Thank you, big brother. All right, all right, let's go. Caden took the lead and the rest of the newly formed group quickly followed behind him to leave the captive's room. Caden intended to take his originally planned escape route. Although the escape route would take him and the group through the battlefield, Caden was confident that his newly discovered abilities would at least help him navigate through the battlefield and find a relatively safe path through the battlefield. Just as the group were about to leave, Caden heard a faint sound coming from the back of the room. 21. Chapter 5, Serena Burns The sound kept coming on and on from the back of the room, and as Caden focused on the sound in order to hear what it was, the sound became clearer. It sounded like someone or something was pounding repeatedly on a metal door. Someone else is still imprisoned here. Caden was surprised to hear the voice of someone, who was not among the people in his group, in the prison room. Due to his releasing all the prisoners from the cages, all the cages were now completely empty, so he had not expected to find any other prisoner still left in the building. Caden turned to the group of prisoners who were still waiting for him to tell them how to proceed and lead them in their escape and said, You guys should stay here and wait for me. I need to go and check something. I will be back soon. Caden then rushed to the back of the room, where the pounding sound was coming from in order to check it out. Reaching there, he found a kind of alcove close to a corner at the back of the room. A metal door was set in the alcove. The alcove and the door were located so far away at the back of the building that most people, 
on entering the building and without walking to the back of the building, would not have noticed the door. A person who had seen this door in passing would think that it opened into some kind of storage closet or something of the like. But that would be before they noticed the buzzing and crackling of the high voltage electric current running through the door. At the upper part of the door, at the eye level of a human female of average height, there was a vision panel with a sliding steel privacy cover which could be operated both from inside the cell and outside. Having noticed that the door was electrified, Caden stayed some distance away from the door and called out. Hey, whoever or whatever is inside, say something so that I can know if you need help. As soon as Caden said those words, the pounding stopped, and he heard a woman's voice say, Help! The people outside, don't leave me behind. A woman was being imprisoned in the room behind the electrified door. The woman's voice sounded faint, like Caden had heard it across a thick barrier. Caden immediately realized that the door was thicker than it looked at first glance. Caden wondered why the woman's cell had been given such special security measures. Solitary confinement and a thick electrified cell door, by Skynet. Because the woman's circumstances were so different from the other humans he had freed, Caden asked. Answer truthfully, are you a human or are you a machine? Yes, yes, I'm human. Please, release me from this cell. This hole seems like it can collapse at any time, and I don't to be trapped in this cell when it does. The woman's frantic reply came through the door. All right. Due to your special circumstances, I'm going to, first, remove the source of the electric current in the cell door. Then, I will look at you through your cell door's slide in order to confirm that you are human. I will then break you out of the cell if I find no problem with you. Is that okay with you? Yes, do whatever. The woman's anxious and exasperated voice was heard. Just do it quickly, please. The woman seemed to be worried that Caden would waste too much time fiddling with the door. So she added, Hey you, can you see the cable running down from the ceiling to the door's keypad lock? Yes, I can see it. The electric current that is electrifying the cell door has been transmitted through that cable. You can cut the cable to shut off the electric current in the cell door. Caden had already noticed the cable and had guessed that its function. The human memories that he retained contained his original memories about general world knowledge stuff. Like these even before the woman had mentioned it, but he had allowed her to keep talking in order to waste some time and observe her emotional responses and reactions. She sounds like a normal human, anxious and scared, but still normal, having decided that the woman was most likely a normal human, albeit one with some special circumstances, which he was not worried that she would be a danger to him due to his confidence in his own strength. Caden grabbed the cable. Then he pulled and tore the cable out completely from the keypad control box amid a shower of electric sparks. Immediately, the humming sound of electric current in the cell door disappeared, the door now safe to touch. Caden slid the steel cover of the vision panel of the prison cell room aside. He looked into the cell and saw a woman with an anxious expression on her face trying to look out through the vision panel. And a beauty she was, long blonde hair tied in a ponytail. Sparkly expressive blue eyes, pouty red lips, a straight nose, and she looked like she was still in her early twenties. Even though she was currently wearing an anxious and worried expression, Caden knew that she would be a killer if she smiled. The woman seemed to be a little below the average female height as she seemed to be standing on tiptoes in order to look out of the vision panel. So Caden when had slid open the slide, he had looked down straight into her eyes and was mesmerized. What a beautiful woman, Caden thought. Caden was mesmerized for only a short instance, but he quickly regained his thoughts. Although the woman's beauty had surprised him, it only took him a second to regain his previous train of thought and maintain his caution towards the woman. Still, Caden took a few seconds to get a good look of the woman and appreciate her beauty. After checking the woman some more, this time with more caution, he did not sense any dangerous vibes coming from the woman. So, Caden not wanting to leave the beautiful woman to die in her cell from the prison building, which seemed more and more likely to collapse from the explosions, he decided to free her from the jail like he had done for all the other captives. Besides, Caden also felt that it would be such a shame to let such a beauty die. This seemed like it was an original trait of his which he still retained, just because of her. 
few suspicious circumstances. The woman peeked out through the vision, and then she saw Caden who was standing outside the cell door. She quickly said, Look, see, I'm a normal human being. Please, help and release me from my cell. All right, move back and away from the door. I'm going to break you out from your cell. Caden reassured the woman. Okay, thanks. Relieved that Caden had agreed to break her out of her prison cell, she flashed him a smile and then ran to the back of her cell. Caden raised his plasma rifle and blasted the keypad lock to pieces. He then proceeded to kick cell door open even though the door was thick. The force of Caden's kick pushed the door open. The woman quickly ran out of her cell, obviously anxious to be free of it. Caden had to move aside so that he would not collide with her. Having successfully escaped the confinement of her cell and having put some distance between herself and the cell, the woman turned to Caden and said with a grateful smile on her face, Thanks for the help. The woman then extended her hand to Caden for a handshake. I'm Serena. Serena Burns. Nice to meet you. 24. Chapter 6. Hope for Freedom. I'm Serena. Serena Burns. Pleased to meet you. You can call me Caden. Although I would like to hear about how you came to be locked in your special cell. I think we should leave that talk until we have successfully escaped from here. Caden said as he shook Serena's extended hand. Just then another massive explosion shook the room tremendously. You are right. We should leave that for now. Serena said with a frightened expression. Some prisoners are waiting for me just outside by the door of this building. They will be accompanying me to escape from this facility. You can join us if you want. Strength in numbers and all that. Caden said before walking towards the door of the building with Serena following close behind. Serena seemed to consider Caden's invitation for a few seconds while she increased her pace in order to walk beside Caden. She soon nodded. Okay, I will join your group. I think it will be better and safer for me to go with your group instead of trying to escape on my own. Looking like she had not yet come down from all the excitement she was feeling from having escaped from imprisonment, Serena continued. Phew, for a second there, I had thought I was going to die. Thankfully, even though I could only hear very faint words, I heard bits of what you said to the prisoners outside, enough to put two and two together and realize that you were trying to free the other captives. Afraid for my life, and having not heard any of the usual warnings from the Terminators that usually kept guard outside my cell, I started pounding on my cell door, hoping that someone outside would hear it and come help me. After pounding for more than 10 minutes and not getting any response from anybody outside, with the sounds coming in from outside slowly diminishing, I was about to lose any hope that anybody would hear me. Thankfully, you finally did hear me, and even came and broke me out of my cell. For that, I'm very grateful. Thank you again. Serena's words were released in quick succession as she chattered on as they walked to the door, not allowing Caden to get in a word and barely even pausing to take in short breaths. Still Caden did not have any complaints. She had a pleasant sounding voice and Caden had to admit that he was a little smitten with her. They kept me locked up in here for almost a year now. Ah, uh, it still annoys me. Fucking metal. She pulled at her ponytail looking like her just remembering her year-long imprisonment was making her angry. Serena took a few deep breaths and seemed to calm herself down. I will have to check up on my comrades in the resistance. I hope that they are alright. It's been so long since I was captured on that godforsaken mission. I hope they haven't forgotten me yet. Serena chuckled after she had spoken her ending sentence. Caden had been walking to the door while thinking about how to safely escape from the facility. He had not paid much attention to Serena's chattering. He had just been enjoying listening to her pleasant-sounding voice. But just then, something Serena had said struck him and pulled him out of his thoughts. The Resistance? Aren't those the group of humans who are fighting against Skynet? Caden thought. When Caden heard Serena mention the Resistance, a piece of memory floated up in his mind. This memory was part of the memories that Skynet had not erased from his mind. He had instantly recognized the name, the Resistance, and he also knew that the Resistance were a group of human fighters who fought on the side humanity against Skynet's forces, just some general knowledge and other stuff like that. Besides the general stuff, he could not remember any member of the Resistance, or whether he had ever had any sort contact with the Resistance. But judging from what he could remember, 
This resistance must not like Skynet very much as they seem to be in conflict with it. Judging from what he remembered, Caden thought that although he did not know much about the resistance and their mode of operation, it may be beneficial for him to learn more about the resistance and maybe even get in contact with them in the future. As he and the resistance seem to have the same enemy in Skynet, they should be able to find ways to work with each other to some extent for their mutual benefit. The enemy of my enemy and all that, right? So, Caden turned to Serena who was happily chattering while walking beside him and suddenly grabbed her hand in his haste to ask her about the resistance, shocking her as a result, and also ending her chattering. Wait, Serena! Hold up! Can you repeat what you just said? Frowning, Serena replied. I said that I hope that my friends have not forgotten about me. No, not that. I meant the part about you being in the resistance. Oh. Yes, I was in the human resistance. Did I not tell you about that? No, you did not. Oh, sorry. Serena apologized. Then she continued. Allow me introduce myself properly. I am Serena Burns, Rodriguez's Rangers, number 17A440, and a proud soldier of the human resistance. Hoping to get some new information about the resistance from Serena to add to his existing knowledge about the resistance, Caden asked. First of all, can you explain to me what this human resistance is, and what it is exactly that they do? What? You don't know about the resistance? What rock have you been hiding under? Serena asked, looking surprised by Caden's question, like she had not expected to find a human who did not know about the resistance. Not wanting Serena to become too suspicious of him and his strange circumstances, Caden quickly thought up some excuses. Caden quickly explained. I obviously have some knowledge about the resistance, but it's too little. Just a few bits and pieces of information that I had learned from other survivors who my survivor group and I had encountered before I was captured and imprisoned by the machines. He then continued. I know that the resistance is made up of humans who oppose Skynet, and that's about all I know. Still, I have always admired the bravery and courage of the men and women of the human resistance. And since you are the first actual person that I have met who is part of the resistance, I am a bit curious to learn more about the resistance from you. Having heard Caden's explanation, Serena stood straight upright, chest thrust out in front of Caden. Ah, bad Caden, look forward. Not downward, obviously looking like she felt some pride in her status as a part of the resistance. And she said, I understand. It's perfectly normal to be curious about the resistance. We are the bastion of hope of humanity, and the last defense against humanity's extermination at the hands of the machines. Listen to me as I explain about the glorious human resistance to you. Caden's mouth twitched repeatedly as he tried to hold in his laughter, as he looked at the antics of prideful Serena who was excessively praising the resistance in a pompous tone. Still, he did not say anything and allowed her to continue with her explanation. Serena continued her explanation in that teacher explaining to her student tone. She pointed at the badge. It had a symbol on it which looks like a drawing of a red-colored DNA fragment. On her the left sleeve of her black uniform and said, This is the badge of a resistance fighter. The resistance fighters, under the leadership of our great leader John Connor, have fought against Skynet's machine army for many years, and have saved the lives of many human survivors. I was a low-rank soldier in the resistance, and was sent on a recon mission, when I was ambushed, and then captured by Skynet's forces. I have been imprisoned here ever since. Serena had a sad expression on her face when she spoke about how she was captured. She had also paused in her explanation and was walking in silence beside Caden. Caden assumed that she was reminiscing and thinking about her experiences when she was captured. At this point, Caden and Serena reached the door of the building and Caden could see the Nadia and the others who were still waiting outside and would, from time to time, peek into the building anxiously to check whether Caden was coming out. When Caden finally walked out of the prison building with Serena, he saw that the relieved looks on the faces of the members of Nadia's group and realized that they must have peeked into the building and seen him coming out of the building with Serena. The members of Nadia's group looked at Serena with curiosity. Obviously surprised that Caden had found another person in the building which everybody had thought was already empty of prisoners. Caden also noticed that the older males in the group would frequently glance at Serena before quickly looking away, 
even though they would soon take another look at her. It seemed like he was not the only one affected by her beauty. This is Serena Burns. She was also in prison like all of you. The only difference was that she was imprisoned in another part of the building so we all didn't notice her presence earlier on. She will be coming with us to escape. Caden introduced Serena to the group of former prisoners. Hello everyone, little cuties. You can just call me Serena. I am a member of the resistance, so don't worry. Caden and I will help you safely escape from here. The presence of new people seemed to have broken Serena out of her sadness. She waved at the group while smiling and introduced herself. When group of survivors heard what Serena said, the kids among them did not show any reaction. But the older teens and the adults among the group show facial expressions of shock or happiness. Nadia then asked, Miss Serena is member of the resistance? Has the resistance come to rescue us? Smiling, Serena answered, Yes, the resistance is here. What? Caden said in shock. Caden who was confused about how Serena knew that the resistance was here. Skynet had called this place its core facility. So this facility should be its headquarters which should be well defended by Skynet's most powerful forces with powerful and destructive weapons. Resistance fighters shouldn't normally be found anywhere close this facility. And Serena who had been imprisoned here for so long should not have knowledge about recent resistance activities. Still, Serena seemed so sure about her assumption. Serena, all of us, including you, were in prison here all this while with no contact to the outside world. So why do you sound so sure that the Resistance are here to save us prisoners? Caden asked, wanting Serena to explain why she seemed so sure that the Resistance had come here. Caden asked the question. At the same time, he conveniently including himself among the prisoners hoping to make Serena see him as one of the normal human prisoners. Serena answered, Everyone can feel the repeating shaking and trembling of this building caused by explosions. All of you must have already heard the sounds of explosions, and other sounds of armed fighting coming in from outside. A fierce battle must currently ongoing outside. And unless Skynet has become so bored that it had pit parts of its forces against each other to battle till death for its entertainment. Only one force is powerful and brave enough to attack Skynet's facilities. So, although I don't know the reason why the Resistance would attack this particular Skynet facility, I am pretty sure that it's the Resistance attacking outside right now. They are the only ones who have the balls to do that. Speaking to this point, Serena paused. She then looked around at the survivors who had been hanging on to her every word, the hope of them successfully escaping burning in their eyes. And so, with a widening smile, Serena said, The human resistance is fighting outside. All of us here are humans. Therefore, as long as we are able to meet up with the resistance, we will all be saved. 20. Chapter 7. A Great Suggestion. As long as we are able to join up with the resistance, we will all be saved. Serena's words gave each and every one of the prisoners a much needed uplift. Caden himself included. Caden was relieved that he would not have to sneak or fight through all of the hordes of Skynet's forces that were stationed here. If he was being completely honest with himself, he was not fully confident that his new, poorly understood, and still mostly hidden abilities would be sufficient for him to successfully escape this place. Besides, he also had to protect Nadia's group of former prisoners from any danger they might encounter while escaping. But now, if they chose to follow Serena's suggestion, all they had to do was stay alive until they meet up with the resistance fighters who were attacking the facility. All right, we have wasted too much time. All of you heard what she just said, right? Caden asked the survivors, and they nodded. Okay. According to what Serena said, we have to try and meet up with the resistance fighters who are attacking this Skynet facility. Based on the sounds of battle, the main entrance of this cave structure should be where the battle is fiercest and we should most of the resistance fighters there. Caden said, sighing, he continued, I really don't want to wade right into such a fierce battlefield, but I don't know another way out of this facility. We have only one weapon, this rifle here, and we have little children with us. Therefore, we will have to move stealthily towards the main entrance, and we will fight only as a last resort. I will be leading the way since I have the only weapon here. Every person in Nadia's group nodded and seemed to agree with Caden's plan. Caden knew he'd be taking on some risks, 
but his plan seemed like the best plan for their current situation as nobody in the group knew of another way out of the facility. There is no other option. I will have to depend on my abilities. Caden thought. Wait. I know another way out of this facility. It's even a safer escape route. Serena, who had not joined Nadia's group in agreeing to Caden's plan, raised her hands up to stop Caden, who was about to lead the way, and said something completely unexpected. You know another way out of this facility? Caden asked. Yes. And this escape route is even better than going to the main entrance. And a yes to that too. How do you know this better escape path? You were also a prisoner like us and we don't know about this better way escape path. Although Serena had been acting like a harmless airhead all this while, Caden was not totally convinced that that was her true character. Although he could admit that he was a little smitten with Serena, Caden was still a bit suspicious of her. He did not believe that a completely harmless woman who had been imprisoned in such a secure prison cell which had obviously been made with special considerations. Besides, even though she was a resistant soldier, the safety measures implemented on her cell seemed a little excessive. Serena did not seem to appreciate Caden's tone, and the fact that he did not believe her. So, with a pout, she quickly explained, Even though I have a low rank, I'm still a member of the resistance. Most resistance fighters, especially those who go out in the field like me, are required to have knowledge about the various Skynet bases and facilities that are in their area of operation, or that they might encounter. She waved her hands around and said, This particular Skynet facility is kind of infamous among the resistance because of its strong defensive capabilities which made the resistance judge it to most likely be a very important Skynet facility. And because of another fact, this facility is located in the hollowed out insides of the famous Cheyenne Mountain, also known as America's Fortress, which had originally been home to NORAD and a host of other critical military defense agencies. Serena continued, After Judgment Day, Skynet, who liked its strong defenses, took control of the mountain and repurposed the Cheyenne Mountain for its own use, having received a reasonable explanation from Serena. Caden raised his hands up in an I surrender gesture in order to placate her anger and said, Okay, I'm sorry I doubted your knowledge. Can you tell the general path we will to get to the other entrance? Serena immediately regained her smile after Caden apologized. She then gestured for the group to come closer to her. Caden and the rest of the group gathered around her, including the kids in the group who although were obviously confused about what the adults were discussing. They were still very curious and fascinated by Caden and Serena, the two interesting adults who they met for the first time today. Like I said before, we currently inside the Cheyenne Mountain. The prison for human captives is located close to the back of the mountain, and that is where we are right now. The exit I mentioned is an alternative exit from the mountain facility that has been present here since the Prejudgment Day era, way before Skynet acquired this mountain facility. The entrance which opens out on the right side of the mountain was meant to be used as an extra escape route in the case of an emergency where the main entrance is compromised. There is no direct tunnel connection or path from here to the alternative exit. So, in order to get to this alternative exit, we will have to travel along your original path. But we will stop around the center of the complex instead of continuing till the main entrance at the front of the mountain. At the center, we will take one of the paths going to the right side of the mountain in order to get to the secret exit and then escape through it out of here. Caden had been listening closely to Serena's explanation. He quickly analyzed the merits of her proposed escape route, and he agreed that the route was safer than his original plan. Skynet's machines and terminators should be busy right now dealing with the invading resistance forces, so most of them should currently be located around the main entrance both outside and inside. The most dangerous part of their escape should when they reach the center of the facility and are closest to the main entrance. This should be the place where they might encounter stray terminators. Besides that, the sides of mountains should be the relatively less intense battlefields when compared with the main battlefield around the main entrance. All right, everybody, we will follow Serena's plan and head to the side entrance. In order to ensure the safety of everyone, we will travel in a formation. I will assign everybody's position. I will take the front position since I am the only one with a weapon. Serena will follow behind me and show me the directions to our destination. 
Nadia and the little kids will come after us and stay in the middle of the group where they will be safest. The older ones will follow after with the two men taking the rear positions and watching for any danger coming from the back. The ones at the back should always be attentive and maintain caution in order for them to not miss any danger signs coming from behind. Caden then arranged the group in the formation. He had noticed that Serena also wanted to take the lead at the front of the group. So he used the excuse of his being the only person with a weapon to take the front position. Although it might have been better for Caden to give his plasma rifle to Serena and allow her direct and lead the group from the front since she was the only one who knew the way to their escape exit and who obvious had more experience using a gun. With her being a soldier and all that, Caden did not even consider that option for a second. Just as he had declared to Skynet, he would never allow himself to come under another person's control and leadership. Besides, there was no way he would give the only dangerous weapon he had to someone whom he did not know very well, someone whom he had only just met today, and also someone whom he still had some suspicions about. Seeing that everybody had moved according to his instructions to their assigned, Caden gave a final warning. Everybody, try not to make any sounds that may attract any unwanted attention and try to move as quietly as you can. Caden then turned to Nadia who was standing with the kids and said, Nadia, watch over the kids and make sure they stay in the formation. Nadia nodded in agreement. She then said with a maternal smile, I've always been the person who looked after them when we were still in our survivor group. I will make sure they don't cause any problems. Nadia then softly patted the heads of the kids and said, Follow Granny closely and everything will be fine, okay? To which kids all nodded their heads. Seeing that everyone was ready to leave, Caden led the group to take the tunnel leading towards the center of the facility and the main entrance. They were on their way to freedom. Thanks for your support on Patreon, Heller8284. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendrix. 18. Chapter 8. Blood on the Floor. Caden and the group had been walking for more 10 minutes. They had passed by several buildings and other types of structures in the facility as they got closer to the central part of the facility. They had also begun to encounter more and more tunnels that led to other parts of the mountain facility, so they were hopeful that they would soon find one that would take them to the part of the facility where the secret exit that Serena talked about was located. After walking a short distance further, Caden saw that ahead of them, there was fork in the tunnel. The fork led away from the original path and branched to the right to connect with a much larger hallway. This new massive hallway was centrally positioned and led more directly to the main entrance. This hallway seemed to be the main pathway of the facility. It seemed like it ran from the main entrance, at the front of Undermountain Complex, and to reach deeply into the back of the facility, effectively dividing the facility complex into two halves, the right and the left halves. The hallway seemed like it was best way to greatly shorten the distance to walk in order to get to both the center of the facility and the main entrance. I remember now. The Terminators who captured me used this hallway to bring me in here and take me to my prison cell, said Serena who had been following behind Caden and who had also seen the new pathway. They also brought us in using this hallway. Nadia and the rest of the group soon saw the new tunnel and also mentioned that they too had been brought in through the large tunnel. This hallway should be the most direct path to the entrance, Caden thought when he heard what they all had said. We should take this way in order to reach the center of this facility as soon as possible. We will be taking this central hallway. It should allow us to get to our destination faster than the tunnel we are currently using. Caden said, I agree with Caden. The central hallway leads straight through the whole facility. When I was brought in, the Terminators didn't have to take any other pathway or diversions until we reached the rear of the facility and took another path to the prison cells, Serena said. Nadia nodded to show that she agreed with Serena. We experienced the same thing too. The rest of the group, who always seemed to follow Nadia lead, also nodded to show their agreement to Caden's decision. Seeing that everybody accepted his plan, Caden led them through the adjoining path into the central hallway. The central hallway had buildings on both of its sides, with tunnels and hallways coming from other parts of the facility to join into it along its length. After leading the group to walk a short distance down the hallway and past several buildings, 
Caden began to perceive a weird smell wafting up from the deeper down into the hallway, a thick and pungent smell of iron, blood. Caden immediately recognized the smell. It was the smell of blood, and it must be a great amount of blood judging by the heavy smell that he was perceiving. Sure, careful everyone, there may be danger up ahead. Caden warned the group as he slowed his walking pace while also trying to minimize the sound of his footsteps. Serena tapped Caden on the shoulder from behind and asked, Any problem? Slightly turning his head backwards, Caden answered, No problem yet, but we are getting closer to the central part of the facility, and therefore have a higher chance of encountering Skynet's Terminators, even though most of the Terminators should be focused on fighting the resistance outside. There may some straying terminators and other types of machines still inside the facility, not wanting Serena to have any suspicions about him and his abilities. Caden did not say anything about the bloody smell, and he only gave a general reason for his warning. That sounds reasonable. Serena agreed, and she too slowed down her walking pace. The rest of the group behind quickly following, but after taking few steps forward, Serena paused for a second and she took a deep breath and a slight frown appeared on her face for a second before quickly disappearing. Caden had caught a quick glimpse of it before he turned to face forwards again, but he did not pay any attention to it. The group sneaked on forward through the hallway for a short distance when Caden noticed that 40 meters in front of him, many things lay scattered around on the floor of the hallway. Caden could also see what that looked like stains on the walls of the hallways around the area where those things were. Just like before, Caden's neural net processor brain chip seemed to have an extremely intimate connection to his brain and his mind, with it seeming to be to detect and read his thoughts. So, seeming to have detected his curiosity, Caden's HUD automatically came back online. Then his HUD zoomed in on where he was looking, and it showed him a close view of that part of the hallway. Immediately, Caden realized what he was actually looking at and what the source of the bloody smell was. The stains on the walls of the hallway were not paint or dirt stains. They were all blood stains, and it was a lot of blood. A large amount of blood had been splattered on the walls and it had covered most of the wall surface of that part of the hallway. And the things lying scattered around on the floor of the hallway? Corpses. Human corpses. Many dead bodies of people were scattered around on the floor of the hallway. Many of the corpses were missing some body parts. The missing body parts could be seen also scattered on the floor, often lying some distance from their original owner's bodies. Even more blood had pooled around the corpses and slowly flowing along the hallway floor. The wounds on the bodies did not look like the usual kind of damage caused inflicted by Skynet's Terminators and their weapons. With how torn and ripped apart the corpses looked, it almost seemed like the victims had encountered and had been savaged some kind of bloodthirsty wild beast with many large and Sharp claws. Caden soon noticed something as he saw the face of one of the corpses. He recognized that face. It was the prisoner who had given Caden his clothes. Fuck! Caden cursed out loud, forgetting his own earlier advice. Everybody stay here. Nadia, don't let them move from here. Caden told the rest of the group to wait where they were and not move forwards. He did not want the kids to see the horrifying sight up ahead. Although from his retained memories he had some idea about the current horrible state of human survivors everywhere, he did not believe that those kids had already witnessed something as horrific as what he had just seen. He did not wish to mess them up even more than they already were. Serena, come with me. Caden said and then dashed towards the bodies. When Caden reached where the bodies were, he walked among the bodies, checking their identities, and not minding the blood on the floor. After checking the more 40 heads lying around, some heads were not even attached to their bodies. He was shocked to find out that he recognized the faces of all the heads lying around. These were faces that he seen only minutes ago. He immediately figured out who these corpses belonged to. These were the corpses of 40 of the prisoners whom he had freed from the prison cells. Thanks for your support on Patreon, Heller8284. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash kendricks. 16. Chapter 9 Murderers Do you know these people? Serena asked Caden. It seemed like she had noticed that he was emotionally affected by the corpses. Yes, these are some of the prisoners I released from the prison cells before I met you. 
Caden said with a sigh. And now, it looks like, in the end, they didn't manage make it out of here alive. Caden kept on checking the corpses and many body parts, trying to find out some clues about how they died and what killed them. The gruesome nature of the corpses' injuries and the way that the bodies seemed to have been ripped apart and left strewn around the hallway gave the Caden the sense that whoever or whatever had killed the prisoners took great pleasure in the act. One of the more intact corpses, a woman with a broken and twisted neck and with her head turned the full 180 degrees and now facing fully backwards, had even been stripped naked. What kind of perverted and homicidal psycho did this? Damn, this does not look the work of a Terminator. The Terminator I fought before did not seem like it had the emotional capacity for such perversions. Caden thought. These people don't look like they were killed by a Terminator, muttered Serena who seemed curious about what had happened here and had also been examining the bodies. There seems to be almost a human touch to this massacre. Just then, Caden, who had was still checking the naked corpse of the woman, noticed that unlike the rest of the corpses and the body parts which were positioned fully within the hallway, the woman's corpse seemed to have been dragged slightly into a small connecting side hallway. This much smaller hallway opened into right side of the central hallway and five meters in front of where Caden found the prisoner's corpses. Caden looked into this small hallway and he saw that it was built like a cul-de-sac, ending in a solid wall after only running for about ten meters. On each side of the hallway was a building with a single door. Both doors were wide open. Realizing that whatever had killed the prisoners had most like come from those buildings, Caden was frightened. His heart sped up pounding wildly. But quickly, after thinking for a second about the fact that he had heard any sounds come out of the two buildings, he realized that the occupants of the buildings had most likely left the area. I saw two buildings in this side hallway. I think that whatever had killed these people might have previously stayed there. Wait here and watch the hallway. I want to check and see if I can learn anything from the buildings. Now more confident, he ran to check the buildings. The two buildings were built in a similar way. Both had large interior spaces. They were filled with training equipment of all kinds, both for normal physical training and for combat training, and they were even some prejudgment day entertainment. Devices like televisions, CD DVD players, boomboxes and loudspeakers, and gaming consoles. Yeah, the buildings had been fully decked out. The buildings had obviously been made with the occupants' comfortability in mind. Each building had most likely been built according to someone's taste. A human taste. After his quick check of the buildings, Caden ran back to the hallway to meet Serena and said, I checked the buildings inside and they were empty like I had expected. The killers must have left some time ago. What do you want to do now? Serena asked. I think we should increase our pace and get out of here as fast as we can. We definitely don't want meet the ones who did this. Caden thought for a short while and then said, this side hallway leads nowhere. It ends in a solid wall. So, the killers must have left here using this central hallway. The problem is that we don't know which direction they went. We don't know whether they left towards the main entrance at the front or towards the back of the facility. If they had left towards the main entrance, we may encounter them if we continue along this central hallway. Caden then glanced at the rest of the group who were waiting some distance away and added, We have other people coming with us including children, who we have to protect along the way. If we meet such dangerous psycho murderers along the way, honestly, I don't think that a single unarmed resistance fighter and a normal survivor with only one gun will cut it. So, I think we should retrace our steps and return to our original tunnel. Thankfully, we have only walked through this central hallway for a short distance. But we can make it if we are a little more careful, and then quickly join up with the resistance. Serena seemed to want to continue traveling along the central hallway in order to escape faster. Caden shook his head to disagree. No, I can't take that risk. Besides, look at all this gore. Do you want the kids to see all this? We can cover their eyes. No. I have decided. We will return to our original tunnel. Caden did not want to risk getting into any fights with Terminators that would most likely force him to use his abilities in order to win. Although he may end up victorious, he would most likely reveal that he was not the normal human survivor he claimed to be. This was something he did not wish to reveal, especially to a resistance soldier like Serena whose hated enemies were Skynet's Terminators and who would most likely hate anything 
that might be associated with Skynet, machines and terminators. Besides, Caden did not know whether he could even defeat the prisoner's murderers with his abilities. The killers seem to be very powerful and well trained. They are definitely better trained than he himself. Judging by the many physical and combat training equipment in the two buildings. Not waiting for Serena, Caden walked back to the rest of the group. This hallway is not safe enough. We will return to our original tunnel and continue traveling through it. Okay? Nadia seemed to have noticed Caden's firm tone, and after she took a glance at Serena who had a slightly pissed expression, she quickly nodded in agreement. Hopefully, this method will be good enough and will allow us to avoid the prisoner's killers. Caden thought as he led the group back to their original path. Thanks for your support on Patreon, Heller8284. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash kendrix. 17. Chapter 10. Empty Factory. Caden and his group retraced their steps and returned to the path which they had originally taken. After walking for some distance down the tunnel, they reached a new section of the complex. This section looked like a large industrial factory. It was filled with loud noises of the many machines working there. There were many fabricated parts, which Caden recognized were newly fabricated Terminator endoskeleton parts, arranged on shelf racks. This area should be where damaged terminators come to for repairs. The machines were still maintaining their normal work motions although, as far as Caden could see, the obvious subjects of repair, the terminators, were completely missing from the whole area. It was almost like the machines had initially been working on some terminators, but the terminators had suddenly stood up and left while the repair process was still in progress. Fuck and there goes my plan to rely on my enhanced hearing ability to detect any approaching dangers. Caden thought with a wry smile on his face. While Caden was still lamenting, Serena had walked up to stand beside him at the front of the group. She looked around the area and at the many busy and noisy machines with a frown on her face. This is the place to find a new path that will take us to that secret exit. This section is an important part of the facility so pathways from many different sections are connected to this section. As long as we walk through this section and cross over to the right side of this section, we will definitely find a path that can take us to the secret exit. She said nodding. Caden nodded. He turned to Serena and said, We should hurry up and move past this area as soon as possible. Anything could be hiding in this place and we wouldn't know until they are right on top of us. Yeah, I think so too. Serena said and then quickly added while looking at Caden appraisingly. You are good at this. What? Caden asked, raising an eyebrow. I meant that you are good at leading. It almost seems like you have done this before. Nah, I'm just a normal survivor who was captured by Skynet just like all the other prisoners. HM, you seem very confident about your decisions and plans. That's not usually the case for a normal survivor with no experience. Serena said still frowning like she was pondering something. Caden Hart skipped a beat. He was afraid that Serena might have started to develop some suspicions about him. He was aware of how strange it was for someone who proclaimed himself to have always been a normal survivor to still be so confident about his decisions and plans in such a high-tension situation as the one they were currently in. I might have led a few scavenging missions for my survivor group. That's some experience, I guess. Caden answered quickly while putting on a smile which he hoped was charming and distracting enough to allay her suspicions. Serena smiled and kept quiet. After secretly heaving a sigh of relief, Caden turned to the rest of the group behind them and said, We are going to walk fast past this area. Everybody, try to walk faster. Keep your eyes open and watch out for any dangerous machines or terminators. Okay? Nadia and the rest all nodded and quickly followed behind Caden and Serena who had turned right in order to walk across the section and move over to the right side of the facility. Just a few minutes in, all of them were already sweating profusely from the heat generated by the many machines, including the heat coming from all the molten metal in the area. The uncomfortably loud noises were not helping matters either. Caden noticed the rest of the group had unconsciously hastened their walking paces in order to leave this unpleasant area faster even without any prompting from him. They were no longer as careful about watching their surroundings and were obviously only thinking about leaving the area as quickly as possible. 
But just as Caden was about to remind them to be more careful, he noticed something strange. Although was sweating like all the others, he did not feel much discomfort from the heat. Caden noticed that he was only feeling the sensation of heat, but there was no accompanying painful or unpleasant sensation from the high temperature. He could feel that area was hot, but he felt that the heat was not bad enough to cause him any discomfort. Walking absentmindedly while still lost in his thoughts, Caden had not been paying much attention to his surroundings or watching his surroundings carefully. And just as he was about to walk past the section of the area, Caden caught a flash of movement in his peripheral vision, jolting him out of his thoughts. Caden quickly turned towards that direction and saw something that shocked him. He realized that he currently right in the middle of passing by one of the many walking paths that separated the machines in the area and which had been arranged around the area. In a massive network of walkways in order to allow for easy movement around this industrial factory looking section. And just as Caden looked down the walking path that he had been about to walk past, he found himself standing face to face with a large, armed, and heavily armored robot. Standing at an imposing height of about 2.4 meters, it was taller than of most men. It had a round head fitted with two glowing eyes, two arms, each carrying wielding a minigun, and two legs consisting of individual tank threads. And with the T-1 wielding its twin miniguns, it looked ready for business. Caden's HUD was immediately turned on. Hunter Killer, aka HK, Tank, T-1 Battlefield Robot aka Ground Assault Vehicle aka T-1 Detected, Weak Point Head, Weapons Minigun 2 Threat Assessment, Low, a T-1 Tank Hunter Killer. Caden noticed that the T-1's eyes were focused and locked on to him. It had already started the motion of lifting its miniguns and aiming at him, which would be quickly followed by an outpouring of the miniguns' bullets. As soon as Caden saw the T-1, he felt like his body was immediately flooded with adrenaline. He felt his nerves tingling all over his body. He seemed to enter a state of mind that greatly enhanced his senses and made him feel like time was dilated. He felt everything around slow down, including the T-1's action of lifting its weapons. This feeling, I felt it before during my fight with that T-800 Terminator. Thought Caden was shock. Caden realized that while he was in his current state, his reaction speed had been boosted tremendously and that he could perform a few quick different movements before the T-1 could complete even a single action. So, when Caden saw that the T-1 tank had almost completed its aiming motions, with its miniguns starting to rotate slowly, he quickly raised and aimed his phased plasma rifle at the T-1. But just as Caden was about to pull the trigger, a circular crosshair appeared in his HUD. The circular crosshair had appeared around the T1's head. New words appeared on his HUD. Automatic aiming slash targeting assistance system aka auto aim assist activated. As soon as the words appeared on his HUD, Caden felt almost like his brain had made some unconscious adjustments to his aim. The hand holding the phased plasma rifle had perfect stability, and Caden felt totally confident that any shot he took right now would an accurate hit and would definitely strike the T1's head. So, with complete confidence, Caden pulled the trigger, and a plasma bullet blasted the T1's head to pieces. Yes! Caden shouted, punching the air in celebration. But just as the Caden was still celebrating his perfect shot, he saw another six T1's will themselves to appear behind the one he had just destroyed. Fuck! Turning to the rest of the group who were shocked by his actions, Caden shouted. Run! Thanks for your support on Patreon, Heller8284. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendrix. 16. Chapter 11 T1. Run! What is the problem? Serena asked as she ran up to Caden. She must have seen when he fired shot. Serena looked like she was about to ask more questions, but suddenly she froze, a shocked expression appearing on her pretty face. She had obviously noticed both the T-1 that Caden had destroyed and had most likely seen the six newly appearing T-1 tanks which were still fully intact and in perfect condition. Not wanting to waste any time explaining what had happened to her and due to their currently dangerous situation, Caden only pointed at Serena and shouted, We've got big trouble! Lead the rest of the group to continue along the way to the secret exit. What about you? Serena said seeming to notice that Caden had not included in the instruction. 
I will stay here and try to buy some time. That's too dangerously. You can't stop them all by yourself. Serena then pointed at Caden's gun and said, I should be one to do it. As a resistance soldier, I have more experience than you at using that. I think you should give me the gun. Caden shook his head and said, No, you are the only one in our group who knows the way out of this place. So you should go with the rest. Seeing that Serena wanted to argue further, Caden quickly added to try to reassure her. Don't worry, I will retreat slowly as I shoot. I don't have a death wish. Caden had been repeatedly been taking glances at the 61s even while he was trying to convince Serena to leave with the rest of the group. So, when he took his most recent glance at the T1s, he saw that the T1 at the front of the group had already noticed the T1 he had just destroyed. The T1 group had all entered into the path between the working machines in a single file arrangement due to the hallway been too narrow for more than one T1 to move side by side, so only the one at the front had seen the destroyed T1. When the first T1, the one at the front of the group, saw the one that Caden had T1, it looked around, obviously searching for what had destroyed its fellow T1. And just a few moments later, when it looked down the hallway, it found Caden. Caden was still in the process of convincing Serena, but his last glance made him realize that the first T1 had already noticed him, and Caden already knew what would surely come next. The T1, just like the any other Terminator, on detection a threat, currently Caden himself, would soon follow the Terminator philosophy which seems to be. Shoot first, ask questions later. Caden pointed at the T1 who was looking at them with its glowing eyes and shouted, Please this is not the right time for arguments. That thing has already detected us. Go now if you don't want these survivors to be hurt. The rest of the group had gathered around the arguing duo. They had already noticed both the destroyed T1, and Caden's words had called their attention to the six other T1 that were appearing at the end of the hallway one by one. As soon as they saw the six T1s, they stared at them slack-jawed and in silence, looking dazed and shocked obviously scared and not knowing what to do. Serena looked at T1s, and then she looked at the survivors. She seemed to have noticed how frightened they looked because she turned to Caden and nodding, she said, All right, I will lead them to the exit. We won't move too quickly, so should not lose us if you retreat slowly while holding the machines off. She then turned to the rest of the group, and while snapping her fingers loudly in order to break them out of their dazed state, and Serena shouted, Everybody, wake up! This is not the time to scared. All of you will be coming with me now. Move it! Serena's shout jolted the survivors awake from their fearful stupor. Nadia, especially, seemed to quickly regain her motherly and protective instincts towards her group members. And she immediately joined Serena to coax her group members to wake up from their shock state and run in towards the direction where Serena had pointed. Serena saw that the survivors had started moving and was about to join them. But before she left, she turned to look at Caden who was already aiming at the first T1 and said, Be careful, don't die here. Without glancing backwards to look at her, and keeping his full focus on the T1 he was aiming his rifle at, Caden nodded after he heard her words. Don't worry, I know what I'm capable of. I really don't have a death wish, you know. While he watched the T1 as it started its aiming motions, Caden heard Serena's fading footsteps as she ran to meet up with the rest of the group. While Caden had been arguing with Serena for those few seconds, his HUD had already locked on to the first T1. His phased plasma rifle aimed and ready to dispatch the T1 with a well-placed plasma shot to the head. Caden had not yet taken the shot because he did not want to create new suspicions of his abilities in Serena. There was no way she would not develop some suspicions if she witnessed an untrained and untested normal survivor destroy hunter killers with extremely accurate headshots. Therefore, when Caden heard Serena's fading footsteps, he released a relieved sigh. Then, he put on a confident, and maybe a little cocky, smile. And without giving the T1 any chance to fire its miniguns, Caden shot at it first. Headshot. Following the explosion of the T1's head, it immediately stopped functioning and the minigun barrels which were beginning to rotate prematurely grinded to a halt. Too slow. Too easy. No wonder it has a low danger assessment level. Caden thought while he haughtily blew off non-existent smoke from the tip of his rifle's barrel. 
But as soon as Caden blasted the first T1's metal brains off its shoulders, the remaining five T1s, who had been following behind the first one, who had been blocking their view of Caden, finally noticed Caden and immediately locked on to him. Three other T1s, who had been hidden around the bend at their end of the path between the working machines also wheeled themselves in and they joined with the rest of the T1s. In jam packing the walkway between the working machines. Shit! There is even more of them. The eight remaining T1 tanks seemed to have assessed his danger lever and considered Caden to be extremely dangerous because without them even waiting to remove the two destroyed T1s that were blocking much of the hallway, all of them started shooting their twin miniguns. Many bullets poured down the hallway towards Caden. Caden immediately replied with his own more destructive plasma rifle shots, quickly destroying three T1s with another three well-placed consecutive headshots. But this time, Caden's inexperience put in a very dangerous situation. All this while, he had not placed much consideration on his own safety. He had not been performing any defensive maneuvers and had only been focusing on destroying as many T1s as possible. Yeah, popping T1 head like oversized pustules sure is fun. So, just as he was happily dispatching T1s with consecutive headshots, he felt several hard impacts to his chest, his left shoulder, and his left arm. A sharp, burning pain quickly erupted from the various impact points. Caden immediately froze from the shock caused by the outbursts of extreme pain. The immense pain immediately drew Caden's full attention to locations on his body from where he was feeling the painful sensations. He quickly checked his body and immediately saw four bloody holes on his chest, with another one each on his left shoulder and left upper arm, six bloody holes in total. The destroyed T1s, whose bodies were standing unmoving in front of the five still functional T1s and blocking much of their line of sight and target to Caden, had caused most of the bullets shot from the T1s miniguns to strike the destroyed T1 bodies and be blocked by it or ricochet of the metal bodies and go way off their target. Caden, most of the bullets had ended up ricocheting off the wrecked T1s and hitting the peacefully working machines to the sides, or the bullets struck the T1 bodies then lost their forward momentum and finally fell on the floor. But even with that fact, a few bullets had managed to fly past the obstructions in their way and accurately strike Caden's body. I have been shot! Caden whispered, still in shock. But just then, a two more shots slammed into his chest and added to his already agonizing pain. The burst of pain from being shot yet again broke Caden out of his state of shock, screaming in pain and shouting. Ah! Fuck you metal brain diesel guzzlers. Caden quickly gunned down another two T1 tanks before dodging to the side of his end of the walkway. Breathing heavily, he leaned his back on a large metal press machine beside the walkway. Clink. Caden heard the sound of something small fall down. Looking down to check, he quickly saw that it was a blood-stained deformed bullet. That's weird. This should be one of the bullets that struck me. It should still be inside my body. Caden thought. Realizing that the bullet must have fallen off from his body, Caden quickly checked his wounds. Immediately Caden noticed that the skin surrounding one of the wounds on his chest was quickly coming together like it was knitting itself shut. The bullet wound rapidly reducing in size. It's healing. The bullet wound is healing. Caden muttered in shock. Clink. Clink. Another two deformed bullet fell to the floor and drew Caden's attention to his other bullet wounds. When he checked his other bullet wounds, Caden found out that two other bullets' wounds had already pushed out the bullets that had been inside them, and they were quickly closing up like the first bullet wound he had checked. Clink. Caden watched as the remaining wounds on his shoulder and arm pushed out the bullets inside and started healing. Clink. This was when Caden recalled that after he had felt the initial burst of pain when the bullets injured him, the pain had quickly decreased in its intensity. But his shock from the initial extremely painful sensation had made him not realize this important fact. By this time, most of Caden's bullet wounds had finished healing, with only his unblemished skin remaining and no signs of the previous wounds remaining. Only the last of the bullet wounds were still in the process of closing up completely. The whole process of the wound healing took only 10 seconds to complete. Looking at the little amount of blood, practically negligible around where the bullet wounds had been. 
Caden now realized that the bleeding from the wounds must have stopped just a few seconds after he was wounded. Besides, it seemed the bullets had mostly caused injuries to his skin but had been stopped by his muscles from piercing too deeply into his body. His muscles seemed like they much more durable than normal human muscles. His muscles, his skin, and most like all of his other remaining biological body organs and tissues have obviously received some enhancements. This is obviously Skynet's work. Caden thought after discovered a few more of his abilities. Waking up from his shock stupor caused by him witnessing such a wondrous event, Caden started laughing. I can heal from bullet wounds. My body can heal fast. Caden's laughter quickly devolved into insane cackling. I can heal from anything. Ha ha. I am invincible. Thanks for your support on Patreon. Heller8284. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash kendrix. 18. Chapter 12. Invincible. I am invincible. Caden exclaimed in exuberance. Now that he had discovered that his body can heal from any bullet wounds that the T1s inflict on him, he no longer had any reason to keep hiding and not face the T1s head on. So, he stopped hiding behind and rushed back to face the three remaining T1s. Having regained his confidence that his ability was adequate enough to protect him from sustaining too much damage, he immediately returned in order to continue his gun battle with the T1s, and this time, he had decided fight them head on. There will be no dodging from me this time around. Caden thought as he faced the T1s for the second time, but when he reappeared, Caden was surprised to find out that number of foes that he had to face this time had already increased during the space of time while he had been hiding, from the fight after the T1 bullets had wounded him. The number of T1 tanks had now increased by two newly appeared T1s to a total of five. In addition to that, four T-800 Terminators had appeared behind the T-1s and had joined the group of T-1s, and unlike the unlike the T-1s who carried gunpowder-based weapons, these four T-800 Terminators carried one phase plasma rifle each. Right now, Caden would have to battle it out against a team of nine fully armed hunter-killers, with some wielding highly dangerous plasma weapons. Besides, Caden also glimpsed signs of movement, when he peeked through both the gaps within the bodies of the work machines and the spaces between the many work machines, cluttering and that filled the whole area. He glimpsed movements coming from many places farther away from where he currently was. So, although his sensitive sense of hearing was greatly restricted within this noisy area, Caden realized that the super loud gunfire noises from the T-1 tank's weapons and the flashing bright lights and shooting sounds produced by his own plasma rifle shots had most, like caught the attention of any, and most likely all, the hunter-killers patrolling in close proximity of the area. And all those alerted HKs were now on their way to his location. Luckily, there seems to be no HKs coming from the direction that Serena and the rest had taken. Caden thought, realizing that it would take some time before the alerted HKs reached his current location from far away, and that he only needed to defeat the nine HKs currently in front of him. Caden was relieved. So, the number of enemies that he would be facing right now did not put even a single dent in Caden's confidence that he would win the battle. His recent discovery that his skin and muscles could stop bullets from penetrating too deeply into his body and his discovery that he could even quickly heal from gunshot wounds, had given his confidence a massive boost. Right now, Caden feared nothing and nobody. And at this time, Caden's current extremely confident state of mind seemed to have triggered a change in within his neural net processor, which was then reflected on his HUD. Instead of his HUD's previous way of showing a single crosshair target on a single target, now, multiple crosshair targets had appeared one each around every one of the HKs, including both the T1s at the front of the group and the T800s at the back. Caden had the intuitive realization that with the help of his targeting system he could now perform quick, accurate, and consecutive plasma rifle shots. The plasma shots may not all be headshots, but at least, all his shots would definitely hit the targets if the targets don't dodge away from the shots fast enough. You skeletal robot fuckers! Don't think I won't fight you just because there are four of you now. I already killed one of you and that was when I just woke up and didn't even know I had these cool abilities. Besides, I did not even have any weapons. This time, 
I'm going to turn all of you into scrap metal. Now come to Papa. Caden shouted obscenities and laughed in mockery as he squeezed the trigger of his plasma rifle. Having decided to first clean up the T1s in front of the group before focusing on the T800s who were currently at the rear of the group, Caden stood in the middle of the path, and confidently facing the HKs, he unleashed his plasma rifle fire on them. Headshot. One T1 down. Another headshot. Another one down. Caden released a few quick plasma shots from his plasma rifle, successfully landing two headshots, one after another in quick succession, on the frontmost two T1s and destroying them. But his headshot kill streak was interrupted when all the three remaining T1s returned fire at him. By this time the walkway was now cluttered with destroyed T1s and looked more and more like a robot disposal junkyard. The T1s did not seem to have an aiming system as accurate as Caden's, so many of their shot bullets flew wide of their target and missed hitting Caden. But just like what had happened previously, some bullets still managed to flew through all the obstructions and successfully struck Caden. Ouch! Ouch! Caden shouted, also grunting as he felt a bullet strike his chest, quickly followed by a burst of pain rising from his chest. The pain made him lose control of his aim, and his next plasma shot missed its target. And just as he was about to correct his aim and shoot, he was hit by even more bullets. Ouch. 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 Fuck. Caden was screaming as more bullet hit various parts of his body. This time his aim was completely destroyed. He started to shoot wildly at the T1s, now only managing to blast some holes in the T1's bodies or destroying T1's arms and weapons. He was mostly missing the T1's fatal zones and only managing to cause them some damage and malfunction. Just a few seconds later, while Caden was still embroiled in his wild shooting, he felt the intensity of his painful sensations begin to quickly reduce. He was still been hit with new gunshot wounds which added new painful sensations to his body. But he noticed that he would feel an initial burst of extreme pain. But a few seconds later, the pain would start to reduce and gradually fade into nothing. Quickly glancing down at his chest, which was where most of the bullets had struck, Caden discovered that none of the bullet had penetrated his too deeply into his body. With the bullets having been stopped only after penetrating his skin and a few millimeters of his muscles. Next, he also noticed that the bullets were already been pushed out of his body. Great. My healing ability is as awesome as expected. Caden exclaimed in his thoughts. He realized that he only needed to endure the short burst of pain from his wounds before the pain completely disappears. And as long he endures the pain and not allow it to distract him too much and affect his aim, he could quickly destroy all his enemies. Having realized this fact, Caden took some deep breaths to calm his mind. Now calm enough? Caden's cocky smile reappeared on his face as he looked at the machines. And then raising his gun, he exclaimed, Now you are all dead meat. But instead of shooting at the machines, he calmly and fearlessly walked towards the machines with a slow walking pace. As he slowly approached the machines, Caden seemed to enter a strange state. The sounds of the T1's gunfire and the periodical bursts of pain from being shot seemed to fade into the background, but in return. Caden became sharply focused on the enemies in front of him, and was able to detect even their slightest movements and actions, and he seemed to have become more acutely aware of the sounds of his deep, calm, and stable breathing and heartbeats. In his mind right now, the enemies in front of him were all that mattered to him, and what occupied his full focus and attention. So, Caden calmly walked through the storm of bullets to approach to the T1s, only grunting from time to time when bullets struck his body but mostly ignoring his bullet wounds. Caden walked up to the where the wrecked T1s were standing and while shooting a smile at the T1 shooting at him from behind all the wreckage, he said, Let me help you with clearing this obstruction. And then, he pushed the T1 wreckage away, to the side and walked through all of the wreckage to approach the three still shooting and fully functional T1s. Now grunting more frequently from the increased number of gunshots now able to strike him with all the pain now getting closer and closer to an unbearable level. Caden walked right up to the front of the closest the T1. He placed the business end of his phased plasma rifle on that T1's head and pulled the trigger, blowing the T1's head apart. Easy headshot. Caden thought. Thanks for your support on Patreon. 
Heller8284 Turtle. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendrix. 17. Chapter 13 Hybrid. Easy Headshot. After Caden destroyed the first T1 he approached by blasting its head apart at point blank. All the other T1 tanks behind paused for a second. The T1s were probably confused that a someone who appeared to be a normal human could last for so long under their bullet storm without dying, and he had even managed to destroy another one of their fellow T1. The T1s cocked their heads, looking like they were trying to get a better look at Caden in order to figure out a much more effective and efficient method to kill, or according to proper machine lingo, terminate him. Caden did not wait for the T1s to make up their minds about whatever they seemed to be trying to decide. He did not feel like he should be polite to enemies who were currently trying their best to murder him. Besides, he needed to wrap up the fight as soon as possible and rejoin his group. So, he continued his calm and slow walk towards the other T1s further away from him. After their few seconds of pausing to observe Caden, T1s seemed to have come to a decision. But it seemed like the AI program installed in AT1 CPU chip was not a very bright and intelligent one. Caden came to this realization because after the T1s had finished observing him, the T1s next action was nothing to write home about. The T1s just went ahead to repeat their original tactic which was to unleash their miniguns on Caden and hope that he would be killed after being struck by many bullets. TCH. You guys should really try something else. Just shooting at me won't cut it. Caden said, shaking his head and looking at the T1s in pity. Amidst the outpouring of bullets, Caden slowly and calmly walked up to the front of another T1, standing face to face before it. Just like before, he placed the muzzle of his phased plasma rifle on the head of the T1, making sure to touch the muzzle to its head, and smirking arrogantly. He pulled the trigger. Phew! Caden whistled. Another easy shot. I'm in the zone right now. I can do this all day. Caden exclaimed in exhilaration. Taking out trashy machines with ease sure feels amazing. And a second later, the seconds T1 stopped moving. Its head was already missing from the rest of its body, having been blasted into slightly melted metal scraps like its fellows. Ha ha! Watched them drop like flies. Caden had been so focused on his highly enjoyable work of dispatching the T1s that he did not notice that the T800 Terminators at the back had started to push the last T1 in front of them to the side in order to create the space for them to pass through to get to Caden. The T800s looked like they did not want to wait for their turn and wanted to engage Caden in battle as soon as possible. They must have realized that Caden was too much for the T1s to handle on their own. Just as Caden was about to approach and put a new hole in the head of the last T1, he felt a cold shiver pass through his body. He immediately looked around and saw that one of the T-800 Terminators had cleared enough space in front of itself, and instead of passing through the space to get to the front of the line, the T-800 had chosen to aim its phased plasma rifle at Caden using the space that it had freed of any obstructing T1s. So, Caden found himself staring down the muzzle at a phased plasma rifle pointing straight at his chest. But instead of feeling scared, Caden smirked arrogantly. This is nothing new. I have been shot before. Caden thought. He was still in his mental state of extreme confidence due to his newly discovered abilities. He had full trust in his invincibility. But in his overconfident state of mind, Caden seemed to have forgotten that a plasma weapon was unlike a gunpowder-based weapon and that its destructive power was totally in a class of its own. Looking at the T-800 Terminator, Caden said, You will die like all the rest. I can heal from minigun bullet wounds. Your face plasma rifle is just a bigger toy. After Caden said those words, he resumed his slow walk towards the machines, but this time he chose to focus his attention on and walked towards the T-800 pointing its gun at him. He walked forward boldly, seeming to not have any fear or apprehension about the gun aimed at his chest. The T-800 did not shoot immediately, especially after it heard what Caden had said to it. It cocked its head slightly to side as it watched Caden walk towards it. Within the eye sockets of its skeletal metal head, the red glow in its eyes flashed brighter for a second before returning to its original brightness and then the T-800 Terminator raised its phased plasma rifle's aim higher. This time, it aimed the rifle at Caden's forehead, and then, it pulled the trigger. Fuck. 
When the T-800 raised its gun and aimed it at his head, Caden's smirk froze and disappeared from his face soon after. This was because of the sudden burst of activity within his HUD, with glaring red warnings appearing in his HUD. Possibly lethal danger detected. Action evade. Caden saw that his HUD had especially marked the phased plasma rifle that was now pointing at his forehead as highly dangerous. He realized that he should definitely not allow the plasma shot from the gun to strike his head. He had to dodge that plasma shot, but Caden knew that it was already too late to dodge the plasma shot. In his carefree overconfidence, he had carelessly given the T-800 enough time to aim its gun and pull the gun's trigger. He could already see the initial flash of light coming out of the rifle's muzzle. Even with his current mental state which had greatly boosted his response and reaction speeds, Caden knew that he would not be able to dodge that plasma shot. So, he did the only thing he could do to protect himself. Caden used his left arm as a shield to cover his forehead and block the incoming plasma beam. A bright bluish-white flash of light struck his left forearm. Arg! It hurts. It fucking hurts. Caden screamed, trembling as extreme pain, like nothing he had felt before, washed over him starting from his blocking left arm and extending to the rest of his body. The smell of burning meat filled Caden nose, and his pain addled mind thought that the smell had a pleasant and appetizing aroma to it. But the wisps of smoke rising from his raised left arm quickly brought his attention to his left arm. What he saw shocked him. The current state of his arm was too shocking to say the least. Most of the skin and flesh on his left forearm had been burned off completely with only a few mostly charred pieces of flesh remaining on the forearm and connecting his mostly intact but slightly burnt upper arm and hand. And that was when Caden saw the true form of his skeleton. With the skin and flesh on his left forearm now having been burned away, the complex internal structure of his left arm were clearly visible to his eyes. Within his left forearm, in addition to some cybernetic and robot-looking mechanisms, Caden could also see two bones which had a similar shape to a normal human's forearm bones. But that was where the similarity ended. The two bones had a metallic white color. There was also a metallic luster to the bones. They were obviously metal bones. In addition to that, there were many tiny holes and perforations on the surface of the bones, looking like openings to allow something to either enter into or come out of an inner chamber, or something of a similar nature, in the bones. Like that of normal humans, Caden's bones seemed to have mainly depended on the contraction of their genetically engineered and cybernetically enhanced connected muscles for the various body movements, but there were also several other cybernetic mechanisms added to allow for normal movement even in the absence of the muscles or when the muscles are critically damaged, like what had happened right now. As soon as saw the two bones of his forearm, he realized that the bones had been created completely from some kind of strong and durable but light enough metal. And then he quickly guessed that all the other bones of his skeleton should also have a similar metallic form. I have a metal skeleton. Caden thought as he gasped from the realization. He had just realized that usually hidden under all his flesh and skin, which looked identical to those of normal humans, was most likely a complete metal skeleton. And that was when Caden gasped as he finally understood the true meaning of what he had read on the computer screen in the experimentation room where he had woken up in the beginning. Model type, human terminator hybrid. Caden whispered. Only now did Caden really understand what those words had actually meant. The words meant that he was a part man and part machine cyborg. He was really a human terminator hybrid. Thanks for your support on Patreon. Heller 8284 Turtle. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendrix. 13. Chapter 14. Strategic Retreat. Caden gasped for breath as he stared at the exposed metal skeleton of his left forearm. Both from the pain from his plasma shot wound and from the fact of true form of his body now having finally dawned on him. New flesh had already started to grow from the charred edges of the wound. New muscle tissue could be seen extending from the wound edges and growing along the length of the exposed metal bones, covering the bones and continuing onwards to connect with the opposite edge of the wound. It looks like it won't take too long for the wound to heal up, Caden thought. But arg, this plasma shot injury is so painful. I don't think I can endure any more hits like this one. Caden glanced at the exposed metal bones, 
watching the faint red glow on them, the result of intense heat of the plasma shot, slowly and gradually fade away. Seeing this, Caden felt a bit more relieved because it looked like his metal endoskeleton seemed to be durable enough and should still be able to handle a few more plasma rifle shots before sustaining any significant damage. But he still had another worry. If I receive some direct shots to the head, how long will it take before the burning heat from those plasma shots directly cooks my brain to death? Do these plasma rifle wielding terminators really need to destroy my metal skull before they can kill me? Caden wondered, a little frightened by his thought. Even in the split second while Caden had been thinking and reflecting, the T-800 Terminator, who had shot and wounded him, fired at him again. But this time, Caden was ready for it. He had enough time to take act. He dodged to the side and managed to successfully avoid his getting wounded a second time. Crouching at the side of the walkway, Caden shot back at the T-800. Unfortunately for him, all that pain he was suffering was affecting his aiming accuracy. So, unlike his previous inhumanly accurate headshots, his shot barely managed to hit the right side of T-800's metal chest. Caden's plasma shot struck the right side of T-800's chest at a position close to the T-800's right shoulder, piercing through it and burning out a concave depression with red-hot edges in the right side of T-800's chest below the armpit area. The damage from Caden's shot did not seem to affect the T-800 in any significant way. It only looked like it had caused some minor damage to the internal structures and mechanisms in the T-800's chest. Caden guessed this after he noticed a little added jerkiness and inaccuracies when the T-800 moved or aimed with its right arm, and due to his seeing some sparks that appeared from its chest from time to time. Right about then, the other three T-800 Terminators had managed to clear away some of the obstruction in the walkway between them and Caden. The three Terminators all raised their plasma rifles and began to shoot at Caden. All of a sudden, Caden now had to dodge the plasma shots of all four T-800 Terminators if he did not want to experience the previous traumatically painful plasma shot wound. Again, Caden performed many evasive maneuvers in order to dodge the T-800's plasma shots including ducking down, rolling around on the floor, jumping up, backwards or to the side, or sometimes even lunging forwards towards the T-800s. The continuous shooting of the four T-800s and the promise of extreme if he got hit by even one of their plasma shots forced Caden to unleash most of the hidden acrobatic potential of his enhanced body, and he fully displayed his senses and reaction which had all been enhanced to superhuman levels. All these evasive maneuvers that Caden was currently performing allowed him to evade most of the plasma shots that managed to pass through the remaining obstructing obstacles in the walkway and barely gave him the chance to return a few plasma shots, which unfortunately did not manage to cause any significant damage to the T-800s. Meanwhile, the pain from his plasma shot wound had reduced to a bearable level. So, Caden could now think more clearly because of the lessened distraction from all that pain. So, even while he was dodging the four T-800s plasma shots, he had managed to get lock on one of the four T-800s. The T-800 he marked for destruction was the one that had shot and wounded him. Yeah, he was that vengeful. And so, after performing a particularly skillful sideways roll to dodge a plasma shot, Caden crouched down, and then kneeling on a one knee, Caden took a deep breath before he aimed and fired a plasma shot at the T-800 that he had a lock on. Headshot. But the four, sorry, now three, T-800 Terminators did not give Caden any time to be satisfied with his successful killing of their colleague. Like all of Skynet's machine fighters that Caden had encountered until, the three remaining T-800 Terminators completely ignored their downed colleague and brother-in-arms and continued to shoot at Caden. And Caden, even after pushing himself close to the current limits of his dodging abilities, a plasma shot from one of the three T-800s grazed his left flank of his abdomen burning off from that area both the skin and an inch depth of flesh, and causing a new burst of pain to fill up his mind. Arg! Caden grunted in pain, covering the new burn wound with his free hand. Another three plasma shots forced him to dodge away again even as he endured the pain from his new wound. Caden realized that he could not keep this fight going. If he continued fighting with the T-800s on his own, 
the pain from new plasma shot wounds would soon incapacitate his shooting and retaliating ability, and that would put him in real and serious danger. While considering his options, Caden remembered something that he seemed to have ignored while he was having a shootout with the machines. Fuck! I really forgot about the other machines who are on their way here. Caden immediately looked around the area. He immediately noticed that the machines, which should most likely have HKs among them, that he had previously seen moving towards his location from other parts of the factory area, and mostly likely other areas in the facility complex, had covered a lot of distance and had gotten much closer to his current location. They should reach his location in about 5 to 10 minutes. Fuck! Why are they all here? Why aren't they outside fighting the resistance like all the other machines? Are there slackers even among the machines? Fuck. Caden cursed. Okay, breathe. Keep your calm, Caden. Time to run. Caden thought. But the thought did not sound right to him. So he quickly added, Fuck no. I'm not running away. I'm just retreating. Yes. It's just a strategic retreat. As soon as he had finished consoling himself, Caden turned around and ran away. He bolted out of the walkway turning around the corner before running in the direction that Serena and the rest of the group had left. As soon as Caden took off running, the three T-800 Terminators stopped the relaxed walking pace which they had been using to approach him. Instead, they too began to run after him in pursuit, while also still shooting at him using their plasma rifles. While running away, Caden also had to dodge the plasma shots coming at him from behind. Right now, due to the Terminators having to shoot while running, their aim and shooting accuracy had been adversely affected, so most of their shots missed their target. In addition to that, Caden would use the many obstacles along the way as cover to block some of the plasma shots. Despite all that, Caden still suffered a few near misses, and his skin was grazed by a few plasma shot beams which added a few more burn wounds to his body. Fuck! This shit hurts. Caden shouted as he finally ran out of the walkway. He took a turn and followed the path that Serena and the prisoner group had taken. Caden had been following some marks that Serena had thoughtfully left for him along the way. She had probably done it because she was worried that Caden would not know which path the group had taken, and therefore he might not be able to find and rejoin the group. So she had left scratched out arrow signs along the way to show him the path that she and the rest of group had taken. But although these marks that Serena had left were very thoughtful and had made it convenient and easy for Caden to find out which path the group had taken, the following the marks was not actually the only method he could use to figure that out. He had another way to find the group. This was the reason why Caden had not bothered to get a very detailed explanation from Serena about which paths they would follow. Caden's method was actually a simple one, and it was based on a simple fact. With the exception of Serena and Caden himself, the former prisoners in the group were filthy. It seems like Skynet did not care much about the personal hygiene of its human prisoners except when it was required for the prisoners' tasks. So the prisoners most likely did not have many opportunities to take of their personal hygiene. Therefore, the prisoners smelled bad, yes, they stank, and they wore dirty clothes and shoes. The clothes that had been gifted to Caden were also stinky and dirty but his nose seemed to have quickly adapted to the smell and had suppressed his sense of smell to a level which he could mostly ignore the smell and not be too bothered by it anymore. So, as the group walked, they would always leave some faint shoe prints wherever they passed. These shoe prints were very obvious to both Caden's eyes and his HUD, which even highlighted them for him. This was why Caden was sure that he could easily track them down, and most likely, so could the Terminators who were now chasing after him. Thanks for your support on Patreon, Heller8284 Turtle. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendrix. 13. Chapter 15. Taking Out Trash. Caden ran away from the three pursuing Terminators for a short distance before he noticed that his sprinting speed was faster than that of the three T-800 Terminators. And that given some time, he would be able to put enough distance between himself and the Terminators for him to successfully escape from them. But this was not really what Caden wanted. If he alone, and he was escaping on his own and by himself, of course he would be happy to take advantage of his superior speed and use it to run and escape from the Terminators' pursuit. But right now, 
He had to meet up with the Serena and the others in his group who were normal humans. There were even a few kids among them. They could not run as fast he could, so if he does nothing about the three T-800s who were currently chasing after him, he would ultimately lead them straight to the group's location. So, Caden decided that he had to eliminate the last three remaining T-800 Terminators in order to ensure that he and his group would have enough time to escape before the other patrolling machines and HKs, who had been alerted by the sounds of his battle with the Terminators, track them down to where they were. Knowing that he would soon meet up with the rest of the group and not wanting to be asked questions he did not wish to answer any time soon, Caden took off his coat which had now been turned into tattered rags by the many bullets that had struck him and was now barely hanging on to his body. He used the tattered coat as a bandage to wrap up the large plasma burn wound on his left arm. By this time, the wound on Caden's left arm had mostly healed with only the skin cover remaining for his left arm to return to normal. So, Caden only needed to cover the wound for a little more time. The whole process of the wound healing seemed like it would take only two or three minutes. No. His HUD displayed an estimated remaining time of 2.45 seconds until the wound healed up completely. Right now, Caden had decided to destroy the three pursuing T-800 Terminators before meeting up with the rest of the group. But after the previous painful lesson, he did not wish to fight them head-on again. So. He planned to find a good ambush point with a good hiding spot that he could hide behind and from where he could shoot at the Terminators, picking them off one by one, and hopefully destroy them. Therefore, as he ran, he kept looking around, searching for such a good spot. Luck seemed to be on Caden's side because right after he rounded another bend in the maze-like arrangement of walkways in this area, he saw a group of work machines ahead of him. The arrangement of the machines positioned them close to one another, but there were enough small spaces between them through which Caden could aim his plasma rifle at any enemies approaching from behind him while still being able to use the bodies of the machines as cover to protect him from any enemy return fire. Caden quickly hid behind the work machines. Taking deep, slow-paced breaths, he calmly waited for the three T-800s to reach his chosen ambush point. He could already hear the faint characteristic metal on concrete footsteps of the approaching Terminators. When he placed his hand on the floor, he could feel some small vibrations. So, he knew that would be seeing the Terminators soon. Just a little more than 10 seconds later, the leading T-800 Terminator entered his line of sight with the other two quickly following. The three Terminators running came to an abrupt halt as soon as they reached the bend in the path. They all paused for a few seconds and looked at the floor. They seemed to be searching for something, their glowing red eyes focused on the floor and sweeping from side to side. They seemed to have quickly found whatever they were looking for, because they all looked up from the ground and instead of continuing on and forwards down the walkway, they turned towards the same bend that Caden had taken, obviously intending to continue chasing him in that direction even though they had not witnessed when he ran in that direction. Just as I expected, these Terminators too can track those former prisoners using their shoe and footprints. Caden thought as he aimed his plasma rifle through a small space between the machines at the head of the first Terminator. But that all ends here. Caden then pulled the trigger. Pew! Following the release of the characteristic plasma light beam and the characteristic sound that always follows a plasma gunshot, the head of the leading T-800 Terminators was blown to slightly molten pieces. The other two T-800s reacted almost immediately, turning their heads, with their glowing red eyes flashing brighter, towards direction where the plasma shot had come from. They must have detected Caden who was smiling at them with malice because they immediately tried to raise their own plasma rifles. Obviously with the full intention of returning to Caden the favor of his head being blasted to pieces. Seeing the actions of the Terminators and guessing their intentions, Caden snorted in mockery before squeezing out another two quick and accurate plasma shots. Pew! Pew! The two remaining Terminators' heads erupted like tiny volcanoes, and the Terminators went out in the same way as their comrade, their headless bodies dropping to the floor. Phew! Caden sighed in relief. He was about to turn around and leave when he stopped, and then looked at the three phased plasma rifles lying on the floor beside the three T-800 Terminators. Caden had the strong urge to take the three plasma rifles with him in order to add more weapons to his arsenal and increase his self-defense capabilities. 
But as soon as Caden went ahead and picked up one of the plasma rifles, he realized that if he rejoined the rest of the group while carrying three new plasma rifles, almost everyone in the group would develop some suspicions about his abilities and what had happened to him while he was away from the group. So, even though Caden did not want to do it, he had to leave these plasma rifles behind. Still, Caden did not manage completely contain his desire for the guns, so he chose to take one of the plasma rifles before leaving and continuing on his way to meet up with Serena and the others. I may not be able to explain how I obtained three new plasma rifles, but I think me returning to the group with a single additional plasma rifle shouldn't be too suspicious. Right. Caden thought as he hurried along the way towards the rest of the group. Five minutes later and after leaving the industrial-looking area of the facility, Caden found himself looking at a large heavy-looking metal door. Standing in front of and around the door were some familiar faces. They were Serena and Nadia's group. They seemed to have even picked up a stray. He should be another one of the other former prisoners who he had helped free. When Serena saw him appear, she smiled and waved at him. This is the exit I told you about. We decided to wait here for you so that we can all leave this place together. Serena then pointed at the new addition to the group, a skinny man who had hidden at the back of the group when Caden appeared. This is Joe. We found him on our way here. He told us that after the group of former prisoners left the prison cells, they mostly went their separate ways, some in groups, others alone. He said that he had a bad feeling about joining any of the groups since he did not know anyone among the former prisoners who he could trust, so he chose to go at it alone and try to escape by himself. Because he didn't know the way out, he chose a random direction to flee in, hoping to get lucky, but unfortunately for him, he ran into an HK patrol. He was lucky and the HK did not notice him, so he ran away and hid himself until we found him. Caden nodded. He was not bothered about adding another person to the group even though this new guy looked like he would only be another burden he would have to protect. Caden heard Nadia whisper to Joe. Don't worry, Caden's a nice man. He's been keeping us safe as we escape from here. Caden shook his head, no longer looking at the scared looking man. Instead, he looked at door sign above the large metal door which said side exit C. With a strange expression on his face, Caden turned to Serena and said, Secret exit, huh? Serena smiled brightly and shrugged nonchalantly, not even bothering to show the slightest sign that she was embarrassed that she had given out incorrect information. I guess Skynet found about the secret exit after occupying this place for so long. Anyway, the exit is still here, like I said, and still functional, so there's no problem, right? Caden gave up even attempting to argue with her. Besides, like she said, the exit was right where she had told them it would be even though the secret exit was not so secret anymore. Yeah, no problem. Caden said before he moved forward to unlock and pull the door open, Serena and the other grown-ups in the group assisting him to pull the heavy door open. All right, let's get out of here. Thanks for your support on Patreon, Heller8284, Turtle. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendrix. 12. Chapter 16 battlefield. Caden walked out of the side exit C. As soon as Caden walked out of the secret exit, he realized that he had finally gotten out of the Mountain Hollow facility and was now outside. He was currently in a wooded area with a single dirt road leading out of the area and with the Cheyenne Mountain as a shadowy backdrop. Caden looked around him, observing his surroundings as he waited for the rest of the group come out through the exit's door one after another. Unlike the well-lit interior of the mountain facility, it was dark outside. The only source of illumination was faint moonlight from the waning moon. It should be nighttime or very early morning. Caden thought as his eyes quickly adjusted to the darkness, calculating the time. Time, 3.46 a.m. HUD says the time is 3.46 a.m. Early morning it is then. Soon it will be dawn. Caden thought. The area in front of him was sheltered by a concave depression in the mountain wall with a large rocky overhang above the depression thereby making the area to be less visible from above the mountain. Besides, there were many tall trees surrounding the area. All these factors made the area a good place to hide a secret entrance slash exit away from unwanted eyes. Looking at the four trucks, 
three huge supply trucks and a much smaller fourth truck which looked like some kind of armored personnel transport truck, packed in the semi-enclosed area. Caden guessed that this place should serve as some kind of hidden garage or parking lot which Skynet used as a storage area for reserve or sensitive supplies in there. Transport vehicles. Just then a huge explosion shook the mountain. Caden could feel the ground trembling. He immediately turned to his left and looked towards where the main entrance of the mountain facility complex should be located. Immediately, he saw a bright burst of light which was slowly fading away, most likely caused by the explosion he had just heard. Now that Caden had focused his attention on that area, he was able to notice more of what was happening there. He could see many rapid flashes of light which looked similar to the plasma beams produced whenever he fired his plasma rifle. Among those light beams, from time to time, he could see some even bigger plasma beams, most like produced by even larger plasma weapons. Whenever those large plasma beams appeared, they were quickly followed by large bursts of light and the loud sounds of explosions. Caden could even hear, most like carried along to where he was by the wind, the faint sounds of people shouting or screaming and crying in pain, with some of those sounds ending abruptly. From time to time, Bursts of lights that looked like small fireballs would appear in the dark sky, and these are quickly followed by objects on fire falling to the ground. The appearance of these fireballs were also accompanied by explosion sounds. Caden immediately realized that he was looking at a fierce and brutal battle currently in progress. It was most likely the same battle he had guessed was happening while they were still inside the facility. When Caden focused his sight on that area, his HUD zoomed in closer giving him a closer view of what was happening in the faraway battlefield. He saw many shadowy shapes moving about in the fierce battlefield. Due to the battlefield being too far away from him, Caden could not clearly make out the shapes to know what they really were. Still, he discovered that the shadowy shapes were of different sizes, ranging from huge to very small. Some of the shadowy shapes were moving very fast and some others were moving slowly or were basically stationary and barely moved. The brief flashes of light from the frequent explosions which would appear on the battlefield helped Caden gain some insight about what the was happening on the battlefield. He was able to see some things which hinted at the true appearance of some of the shadowy shapes. The huge shadowy shapes were revealed to be large combat robots of various kinds who seemed to be fighting the smaller sized shadows who were actually humans. Activating Night Vision Night Vision Activated Following the appearance some words on his HUD Caden's vision field suddenly brightened and became sharper and clearer. Night turned into dusk, almost as if a new source of light was shining over wherever was included within his vision field. And like how a car cover is removed to uncover the make and model of the car, the veil of darkness that covered the battlefield disappeared in front of Caden's night vision enhanced eyes. And this allowed him to see the battlefield clearly and know what was happening there. What he saw was terrifying. The battlefield occupied a large area in front of the main entrance of the mountain facility, extending for almost one square kilometers. The smoke-filled battlefield was filled with human skulls, bones and incomplete skeletons, metal scraps and junk which looked like they were the result of machines that had exploded. On looking closer Caden could even see a few T-800, which seemed to be missing a lot of their body parts, lying around on the burnt black ground unmoving. Some were missing their lower bodies with sparking wires extending from beneath their torso. These ones were slowly crawling about on the ground while pulling their torsos forwards. Amidst all the metal junk could be seen many burnt down vehicle chassis frames. Some still had a few smoldering flames weakly flickering on them. But many vehicles of all kinds were still fully ablaze and were burning gloriously. A large battle formation of hunter slash killers which included more than a thousand T-800 Terminators and a few hundred tank-type HKs of various kinds, defended the main entrance of Skynet's core facility against the onslaught the invading human army. Ah, those should be the resistance soldiers Serena talked about. Caden thought, just like the machine army, the invading human soldiers fought with plasma weapons of various kinds. Some were even mounted on vehicles. Though, unlike the Terminators, the human soldiers all wore night vision goggles which made Caden wonder why they chose to attack Skynet's facility at night and in darkness. Having been observing the battlefield till now for more than a few seconds, 
Caden had to admit that those human soldiers were very brave indeed. The soldiers seemed to very motivated to win the battle. They never cowered, faltered or retreated from the battle despite the frequent casualties among the soldiers from being shot by plasma guns or being blown to pieces by a plasma cannon shot from the larger HK tanks. The screams and pain-laden moans of their wounded comrades did seem to bother the soldiers enough for them to try to drag their wounded colleagues behind cover but the soldiers would immediately rejoin the battle after doing that. The soldiers engaged the machine army in a fierce battle while hiding behind any available cover. Ah, they're really brave soldiers. I should be able to learn something useful from them. Caden thought as he remembered his own embarrassing showing during his fight with the Terminators. Just then, Caden saw a bright flash of light fly up from the high up on the mountain wall, and then go on to strike something in the sky which result in a fiery explosion, appearing in the sky above the battlefield. Due to the explosion, Caden's attention was now attracted to what was happening in the sky. He soon realized that there was another fierce battle currently ongoing in the sky, this time between various aircrafts on the human side and H. Carriels on Skynet's side. The aircrafts were flying around, shooting at and chasing one another across the night sky. From time to time one of the aircrafts would land a successful shot on an aircraft from the opposite side and cause it to either explode into a blazing fireball or crash to the ground and join the wreckage already littering on the battlefield below. There was another flash of light from the mountainside and a resistance aircraft that flew too close to the mountain burst into flames and crashed to the ground. Caden looked at where the light originated from and he saw that arranged high up on the mountain were a group of large plasma cannons which would occasionally seek to destroy important targets both on the ground and in the sky, especially the ones who come too close to the mountain. This, this, this is bad. A whisper coming from beside Caden startled him awake from his full attention observation of the battlefield. He turned around to see Serena standing beside him. During the time when he was watching the battle going on, the whole group had already walked out of the facility and someone, probably Serena had even closed the door of the secret exit and turned the hand wheel on the door to lock it from the outside. She wore a shocked expression as she stared wide-eyed and open-mouthed in the direction of the battlefield. What? Caden asked. He had expected her to be happy to see her fellow resistance soldiers. What? Serena asked him back, looking a little confused. Ah. Uh, the massive scale of the battle must have really shocked her. Caden mused in his thoughts. I asked you what you meant by this is bad. Serena took in a deep breath, and then she seemed to quickly return to her usual calm self. The only thing missing was her usual smile. Oh that. I said that because I believe the resistance can't win this battle. Why though? Don't you guys usually do things like this? You said it yourself. You guys fight Skynet's forces and attack their bases. Yes, we do all that, but that's only for small, isolated Skynet facilities with minimal defenses. Not something like, this Skynet facility is too well defended. We can't win this battle. Why did Connor sanction this mission? Something must have happened in the resistance. I just don't know what it is. Damn it. Being imprisoned sucks. It's okay. You can't do anything about that right now. Besides, it looks we can meet up with the resistance right now either. There's no way I'm wading into that battlefield. Caden wanted to stay as far away from that brutal battlefield as possible. You're right. There's nothing I can do about this battle. Besides, our leader John Connor should have a good plan for this battle, Serena said, and then she paused for a second before adding. There should be some resistance checkpoints and gathering sites some distance outside the battle zone where we can find some resistance soldiers instead of trying to meet up with the ones here in this battlefield. I like that plan better. Caden nodded. He then turned and pointed at the armored personnel truck parked beside the single dirt road leading out of the area. There is even a good vehicle here that can carry all of out of here. It even looks like a fast vehicle. Caden had noticed that particular personnel truck immediately he saw it for the first time as he walked out through the secret exit. This was his HUD had alerted him of the vehicle's features, specifications, and capabilities. In summary, it was fast, with amazing maneuverability and shock absorption. Besides, it was armored and had good defenses. It was one of Skynet alternative methods of transporting infiltrator-type HKs, aka Terminators, 
besides using transporter aircrafts. As Caden and Serena walked to the truck, Serena asked, Who's driving? Me or you? Uh, wait, do you know how to drive? With both of them now standing in front of the door on the driver's side of the truck, Serena looked Caden, obviously waiting for an answer to her question. Do I know how to drive a truck or not? Caden wondered, but he did not know the answer to the question either. He had no memories of himself driving or any memories of him doing any other things for that matter. So Serena asking him the question and expecting an answer was basically useless. Still Caden tried to look for a reasonable answer to give Serena. He decided to just say that he did not know how to drive. There should not be that many normal survivors who had access to functioning cars, right? I don. Just as he was about to say that he did not know how to drive, some words appeared on his HUD. Driving skill file requested. Retrieving driving skill file from memory archive. Commencing installation of driving skill into the brain. Installing. Driving skill installed. Fuck yeah. Caden exclaimed with his thoughts as the new knowledge about how to drive different types of land vehicles appeared in his mind. It did not matter whether he had learned how to drive trucks in the past because right now, he could drive cars, trucks and so on. With a broad grin on his face, Caden turned to Serena and said, I sure as hell know how to drive. Serena nodded. She turned to the rest of the group who had approached when they saw the two of them walking to the truck. Everybody get in the truck. We are leaving. Caden got into the driver's side of the truck with Serena riding shotgun. When Caden grabbed the steering wheel, the dashboard of the truck lit with all sorts of indicator screens. There was an indicator showing the words ignition on off. Oh, Skynet still uses the old terms. Caden thought, chuckling to himself. Caden looked out through the window to check the progress of the former prisoners in entering the truck. He saw the last person get into personnel truck. But as he glanced past the locked door of the secret exit, a nagging thought made him pause for a second. A strange feeling washed over him. It was the feeling that he had missed something important. What is it that I missed? Caden wondered. But as he had that thought, Caden immediately realized what he had missed. Earlier on while he was inside the Mountain Hollow facility, he had run away from the alerted Terminators. Right now, he had spent some time observing the battlefield outside among other things and that time should be enough for... Fuck! Caden cursed out loud as he saw the hand wheel on the door of side exit C. Start to turn in the door unlocking motion. What? Serena exclaimed startled by Caden's sudden cursing. Look! Caden shouted as he pointed at the at the secret exit. Caden and Serena both watched as the turning hand will slowed down before coming to a sudden stop. They were surprised at that because the door had not been fully unlocked, and they wondered what the Terminators inside were up to. But they soon figured that out. It soon became obvious to them that the Terminators must have become too impatient and had considered that method of unlocking and opening the door to be too slow for their liking. And why was that obvious to them? Because suddenly more than 20 plasma shots simultaneous pierced through the metal door. It was quickly followed by another wave of plasma shots sweeping across the door and beginning to slice it into pieces. And so, Serena did the only reasonable to be done in such situations. She screamed. F-U-C-K. Thanks for your support on Patreon. Heller8284 Turtle. Check out my Patreon to support me. At www.patreon.com slash Kendrix. 12. Chapter 17. The Pursuit Part 1. Caden tapped on the on-off button on the dashboard screen to start the ignition. So to speak. The truck was actually powered by Skynet's plasma technology of the truck as the door of the secret exit crumbled to the ground. Through the side mirror, Caden saw five T-800s burst out of side exit C, guns at the ready. They were quickly followed by another group of five T-800s exiting behind the first group, with even more T-800s filing out behind them in groups of five. Damn it! Are all the Terminators in the area after us? Caden complained. As soon as the first five T-800s stepped out, they quickly locked on Caden's truck, and on seeing the two humans, Caden and Serena, at the front of the truck who looked like they were trying to start the truck in order to escape in it, the T-800s immediately sprinted towards the truck. Unfortunately for the T-800s, the truck came to life immediately Caden pressed the on button, 
and so he managed to start the truck before the first five T-800s could even get their bearings after walking out of the mountain facility and into the hidden parking lot outside. So, just as the T-800s locked on the truck and before they even started to run towards it, the truck came to life and Caden stepped down hard on the accelerator. The truck lurched forwards due to the hard acceleration before Caden quickly regained control of the vehicle and steered it into the lone dirt road that winded through the woods. And that also led out of the area, and stirring up dust clouds behind them, the truck sped away. Caden had driven for only a few seconds when he suddenly heard screams coming from the former prisoners being carried in the personnel space at the back of the truck. What's going on over there at the back? Caden shouted. They are shooting at us. Several people's voices shouted back. Caden and Serena glanced at each other for an instant, before they both rushed to look check the side mirrors on their side of the truck. Through the side mirror, Caden saw that the T-800s had started shooting at the truck with their plasma rifles, trying to either destroy it or at least cause some amount of damage to the truck and stop it from escaping. Most of the plasma shots had flown wide of their target without having any real chance of hitting the truck with only a few even coming close to hitting the fast-moving truck. But even this must have been too scary for the former prisoners who could see the T-800s through the open entrance of the personnel space at the back of the truck as the T-800s, cold, unfeeling and relentless in their pursuit, tried again and again to gun down the truck, their only hope for salvation and freedom, and stop them from escaping from their place of imprisonment, and finally get to safety. Give me one of those. Serena said, pointing at the two plasma rifles on the truck's dashboard. I can distract and slow the Terminators down for you to put enough distance between us and them. What? Oh, right, those. Caden looked away from checking the T-800's progress through his side mirror in mild confusion before he finally realized that Serena was referring to the plasma rifles. As soon as Serena mentioned the guns, Caden realized that he had overlooked something. He had placed the two plasma rifles on the dashboard when he got into the truck and had not given any explanation about how he had obtained an extra gun during the time he was away from the group. Caden had been distracted by the huge battlefield he saw when he stepped outside the Mountain Hollow facility, and it had occupied all of his attention. Besides, while they were still inside the facility, and when he had rejoined the group at their meeting place in front of the secret exit, Caden had been in too much of a hurry to escape out of the facility through secret before the patrolling HKs could find them, so he did not have the time and opportunity to explain to the group, especially to Serena who he was most wary of, about how he obtained his extra plasma weapon. But this isn't the time to be too wary, Caden thought. Although he still had a few suspicions about Serena, she had not done anything bad as they traveled together along the way. Besides, Caden already had his hands full driving the truck, and he did not want to test. Okay, he'd really love to test it, but maybe not right now. Whether he could both drive and shoot at the same time without crashing the truck and killing his passengers in the process. Alright, use one of the guns. I found the extra plasma rifle when I got in a lucky shot on a lone Terminator and instantly destroyed its head. Caden explained, gesturing towards the guns with his head. Serena grabbed one of the plasma rifles while muttering something, her whisper too low to be audible to normal human ears, but Caden's sensitive ears picked up the whispered words. Must have been a really lucky shot, causing him to raise an eyebrow while also wondering what she meant. Serena opened the door on her side of the truck and hanging from the door with her left hand with the top half of her body hanging out of the truck. She began to shoot back at the pursuing Terminators, returning fire for fire. Serena seemed to be a better shot than the T-800s because unlike the Terminators who did not manage to hit the fast-moving truck, Serena plasma shots did manage to hit a few of the T-800s even though her shots were mostly ineffective at completely destroying the Terminators and only succeeded in hitting some non-lethal areas on their bodies. The only thing the shots did to the T-800s was knock them to the ground for a short time and maybe also incapacitate them enough to cause them to lose their mobility. But the T-800s were not actually completely destroyed. They really only needed to return to the facility for some repairs, and they would return to normal functioning. Even with all that, Serena accomplished what she had promised, and she succeeded in slowing the pursuing Terminators down 
and though the T-800s might be fast, Caden's truck was even faster, and so, even though the Terminators were relentless in their pursuit of the truck, they were soon left in the dust. Serena seemed to notice the truck increasing the distance between them and the Terminators and looking like she wanted to completely destroy at least one of the T-800s before. They got out of the effective range of her plasma rifle. She paused her shooting for a second as she took a deep breath. She aimed, holding her plasma in her very stable hands, at the frontmost one of the pursuing T-800s and pulled the trigger. A plasma shot flew from her rifle to strike the T-800 in the center of its head and blasted it off its body. Caden watched all this happen from the corner of his eye while he drove the truck down the dirt road and away from the pursuing Terminators. As the armored personnel truck left the T-800s behind them, Serena climbed back into the truck and closed the door. They shouldn't be able to catch up with us anymore, Serena said, flashing Caden a smile. Caden nodded in agreement, watching the T-800s through his side mirror as they fell behind. But soon, he was distracted from what he was doing when he heard Serena mumbling some words. Ah, uh, where is it? Is it here? Or is it this one? No. Okay, let's try this one. Caden glanced at Serena to find her looking at the large dashboard screen and also tapping some of the buttons on the screen. What are you doing? Caden asked. I'm looking for the way to activate the truck's exterior cameras. Serena answered. Exterior cameras? Yeah. I noticed that you were always looking at side mirror in order to see what was happening behind the truck. So I'm trying to see if I can find out how to turn on the exterior cameras on this truck. You may not know this, but it's common knowledge among the resistance that all of Skynet's vehicles always have a few cameras on them for better monitoring of their surroundings. That makes sense, I guess, Caden said. He then added with his thoughts. At least this will be less distracting for me than having to frequently turn away from my driving in order to check the side mirror. But how do we turn on the cameras? As soon as Caden thought that, some new words appeared on his HUD. They were instructions giving directions on how to operate the truck's cameras. Caden now knew how to operate the truck's cameras. But he did not say anything to Serena in order to not look too suspicious since he had already acted like he did not know anything about the cameras just a few seconds ago. Anyways, it was a fairly simple method which he knew Serena would soon figure out on her own. Oh, there it is. Serena exclaimed as she pressed the button on the screen on which was written camera in the cryptic Skynet developed machine language. Several small sized video feeds from the few exterior cameras appeared on the windshield, revealing the windshield to be some kind of transparent screen. The video feeds were displayed around the periphery of the windshield in order to not obstruct the driver's view of the road ahead of them, and they showed camera views of the rear, the sides and even the sky above the vehicle. Nice. Caden said before turning towards Serena and saying, Thanks. This is much better. You are welcome. Serena said with a smile. Damn. She really shouldn't be smiling at me so much while I'm trying to focus on my driving. It's too distracting. Caden complained in his mind as he drove the truck along the dirt road which seemed to be curving towards the direction of the main road that led to the main entrance of Skynet's core facility in order to reconnect with it. Caden soon realized that if he continued along his current path, he would soon have to drive the truck through an area that was too close for his comfort to the battlefield with the ongoing fierce battle between Skynet's forces and the resistance. But he had no choice. He had to use the main road if he wanted to get out of this place. Thanks for your support on Patreon, Turtle Ghost. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendrix. 12. Chapter 18. The Pursuit Part 2. Caden finally drove the truck out of the dirt road and onto the main road. The usually pristine and well-maintained tarred main road was now littered with a few broken down vehicles and parts from destroyed vehicles. It was obvious to Caden that the battle must have raged on in this section of the road for a while before the resistance army had managed to push the defense line of Skynet's defending machine army to retreat back towards the area in front of the of the main entrance of Skynet's core complex. So, when Caden drove the truck onto the main road, they had fortunately driven the truck into the section of the main road which was on the outskirts of the battlefield. Even luckier for them, they were now on the resistance army's side of the battlefield. 
But Caden was still anxious to leave the area as fast as possible. So, he did not release his foot from the gas pedal even for a single second, and he maintained the high speed of the truck even though doing this result in some of the passenger at the back of the truck screaming when the truck suddenly bounced around a little as it left the dirt road to climb onto the main road. Besides, Caden could see in the camera video feeds that some of resistance soldiers at the rear of the battlefield had anxiously raised and aimed their weapons towards the truck. When they saw it suddenly burst onto the road some distance behind their battle line from out of the woods. Humans! Humans here! We're humans! Caden cried out, extending his head out through the driver's side window and waving his free hand around wildly. He did this hoping that the resistance soldiers would see him and realize that he and everybody else in the truck were humans and not the enemy. Everybody at the back, shout with us! Serena hollered out at the former prisoners at the back. She then poked out her head and also joined Caden in waving her hands shouting. Don't shoot! We are humans! And so, multiple shouts came from the back. Don't shoot! Help us! We are humans! Former prisoners! Their actions seemed to have gotten them the results they had hoped for because Caden saw the soldiers lower their weapons obviously deciding to not attack and to also allow them to drive the truck away and escape from the area. Phew! Caden and Serena both released sighs of relief. That was intense. Your fellow resistance soldiers are too suspicious. Caden said, Yeah, it's not really their fault though. They have good reasons for their actions. Just then, Caden saw one of the huge machines which had waded forwards and had entered deeply into the midst of the resistance forces battle line fighting the resistance soldiers. A huge bipedal robot which released shots from the high-energy plasma cannon on top of its shoulder, turned towards the main road far ahead and focused on the Caden's truck, which was driving away. Caden watched as three much smaller objects dropped down from the body of the huge robot, which his HUD identified as a harvester robot. The three objects were soon revealed to be three Moto Terminators, robots that are usually stored within the bodies of harvester robots and which looked like sleek self-driving motorcycles. The harvester fired its plasma cannon randomly and repeatedly at the resistance soldiers hiding around it, especially those at the back of the battle line. This created enough chaos which served as cover for the three Moto Terminators sneak their way through the resistance defense line and out the back to chase after Caden's rapidly escaping truck. This is bad. These little guys are bad news. Drive faster. Serena cried out from beside Caden. She had also noticed their three new pursuers. Fuck. Not this again. Can't someone just escape from this place in peace? Caden complained punching the window frame in annoyance. He then turned and gave nod to Serena. Serena nodded back at him, obviously understanding his intention. Don't worry. Just focus on your driving. I will take of them. She then repeated her previous act of opening the door on her side and hanging from it to wait for the three Moto Terminators to get within her shooting range. Caden returned his focus to driving the truck while also watching the Moto Terminators through the camera feeds. The Moto Terminators sped along the main road after the truck, rapidly cutting down the distance between them and the truck. They were some pretty agile little fuckers, easily maneuvering around and avoiding the obstacles on the road as they quickly gained ground on the truck. Caden had already pushed the truck's speed to just above 300 miles per hour, and he could even claim that the truck was performing admirably. The truck could go very fast and it was also durable enough to withstand direct collisions with most of the smaller obstacles on the road without sustaining any damage. But the Moto Terminator's just too fast and agile. Caden was aware that he could push the truck to go even faster, but he was not sure whether his less durable human passengers could safely handle that speed. And so, the Moto Terminators that had been manufactured with the ability of pursuit in mind as their main purpose were able to finally come close enough to get within shooting distance of the truck. As soon as the Moto Terminator in the lead came within range, Serena began shooting at it. The Moto Terminator's skillful maneuvering helped it dodge her first few shots. But another one of her plasma gunshots finally struck it and blasted a large hole into the front part, which was where its CPU was located of the Moto Terminator. The Moto Terminator crashed to the ground with its rotating wheels slowly coming to a stop. Bang! 
a plasma shot from one of the two remaining Moto Terminators who had managed to get closer to the truck. The plasma struck the side of the truck, resulting in some screams from the people in the back. The other Moto Terminator tried to shoot at Serena but the truck swerved to the side and it missed its shot. Whoa! Thanks! Serena exclaimed. You are welcome! Caden replied. He had been watching what was happening through the camera feeds. And so, when he noticed the two Moto Terminator's sneaky actions, he had tried to steer the truck to dodge the plasma shots. He was successful, and even though the first plasma shot did manage to hit the truck, the truck's armor prevented it from causing any significant damage to the truck. It only scared his passengers shitless. The shooting battle between Serena and the two Moto Terminators continued for another 10 seconds with Caden assisting her by steering the truck to dodge some of the Moto Terminator's gunfire. Serena managed to land another successful shot a Moto Terminator, and thereby reducing the number of Moto Terminators in pursuit to one. But just as Serena was about to take out the last Moto Terminator, it swerved away from her side and moved towards the driver's side. Damn it! It has gone over to your side of the truck now. I can no longer get a clean shot at it. Serena shouted. Caden checked his camera feeds, and he saw that it was as Serena had said. The last Moto Terminator had dodged away from Serena's side of the truck to his side in an attempt to prevent Serena from shooting at it as it got even closer to the truck. I see it. Keep watching from your side in case it moves back to your side. I will try and see what I can do from my side. Caden said, as Caden watched through his camera feeds to make sure the Moto Terminator was still pursuing them from along his side of the truck. He grabbed the only remaining plasma rifle from where he had placed it on the dashboard, and while still steering the truck with only his left hand and he extended out his right hand which was holding the gun through the window, and pointing the plasma rifle backwards, he aimed at the Moto Terminator, while he used the camera feed to guide his aiming. Wrong move coming over to my side, you little shit. Caden whispered under his breath, and as he pulled the trigger of his plasma rifle, he added, Go to hell! Caden's plasma shot hit the motorcycle-like robot, and it crashed to the down. All three pursuing Moto Terminators had finally been taken down successfully. Boom! Just as Caden was about to celebrate the victory, Caden heard a large explosion go off. The sound seemed to come from the sky so Caden immediately checked one of the camera feeds that monitored the aerial view. Through it he saw a large fireball falling down, amidst a rain of metal junk pieces, from the sky at the outskirts of the battlefield. A short distance behind it was the aircraft that had just shot it down. It was one of Skynet's self-flying, AI-controlled killer aircrafts. It was an h carrier. The h carrier circled around the wreckage of the downed resistance combat aircraft for a few seconds. But when Caden thought that it would turn back and return to the battlefield to continue its battle with the remaining resistance aircrafts, the h carrier paused for a second amidst its turning motions before quickly turning to face towards the main road. Its red eyes glowed brighter for a second as it discovered Caden's escaping truck. It immediately flew towards the truck. Oh, come on! Just give me a fucking break! Thanks for your support on Patreon, Turtle Ghost. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendrix. 12. Chapter 19. The Pursuit. Part 3. Oh, come on. Just give me a fucking break. Caden was really pissed right now. Since waking up in that underground surgical theater-like room to find out that he did not have any remaining personal memories and that he was some kind of lab rat, he had always had to be on the run from or even fighting Skynet's killer robots one after the other. He had been under the constant fear and danger of losing his life since the time he had awakened. He had not been given even a single break to get his bearings and really think about his situation. A crackling sound came from the steering wheel and woke Caden up from his anger-filled thoughts. When Caden looked at the steering, he realized that he had squeezed too hard on the steering and had twisted it a little. Flustered, Caden took a quick glance towards Serena to check whether she had seen what he had just done to the steering wheel. Caden released a sigh of relief when he saw that she was busy staring at the image of the HK aerial and the camera feed. Keep calm, Caden. Keep calm. Breathe in. Exhale. Caden thought, trying to restrain his anger. There's nothing else to do except to continue trying to escape like we have been doing. 
this age carrier won't be any different from the rest. Unfortunately, their enemy this time was very different from all the other HKs that they had previously gone up against. The H carrier was fast. So fast that the H carrier had only needed a few seconds for the it to cross most of the distance separating it from Caden's truck. It then flew at a lower height from the ground, maintaining a distance of about 10 meters from behind the truck. Through the camera video feeds, Caden could see that the large plasma cannon on the H carrier had started to swivel around and position themselves in order to get a lock on and aim at the truck. Fuck! Come on! Can't you guys give a suspected enemy a warning shot or something first before switching over to a more permanent solution? Caden screamed at the camera feed in exasperation. Hey, calm down. We can survive this as long as we don't lose our cool. This is especially important for you. You have the most important job of driving us out of this mess. Keep calm. Okay, I hear you. Fuck. Okay, okay. All right. This time I'm calm. I'm calm. Fuck. Caden, empty your mind. Calm, calm. Caden took deep breaths in rapid succession as he tried to calm himself down. Serena smiled at him, and Caden felt that his angry antics must have looked so ridiculous right now. She continued, You did a very good job earlier with your driving skills when those Moto Terminators were chasing us. Just keep doing that and trying to avoid the truck getting hit by any plasma cannon shots, and we will be good. In the meantime, I will try to shoot back at the HK aerial, and hopefully, I will get in a lucky shot and disable it somehow. Caden nodded. Serena opened her door and repeated her hanging on from the door move. Something to take note. There will be an interval of time between the HK aerial's plasma shots when the HK aerial is charging up its plasma cannon, and there is a brief interval between when the HK aerial aims and when it finally shoots which you can take advantage of. Serena's voice reached Caden from outside. Thanks, and noted. When the H. Cariel had first appeared on the camera feed, a bunch of data on H. Cariel, contained within Caden's neural net processor's memory archive, had appeared on his HUD. There was data about H. Cariel's structural components and its basic capabilities. But so much data was displayed on his HUD, and due to his inexperience at reading the data, he did not know which part of the data would be helpful for his current situation and the ones to focus on. So, Caden greatly appreciated Serena's suggestion, still frequently glancing at the camera feed as he drove the truck to speed along the road. Caden saw that Serena had started to shoot at the HK aerial, but all of her plasma shots missed the target. Whenever Serena tried to aim at the HK aerial, it would fly further away from the truck, either flying higher flying to the sides or even slowing down abruptly in order to put some more distance between itself and the truck. But even though Serena had not managed to hit the H carrier even once, Caden was still a bit satisfied with her work. Due to Serena's shooting, the H carrier was not having an easy time at aiming and getting a lock on the truck. Suddenly, the H carrier slowed down, increasing the distance between it and the truck, before flying around to position itself on the driver's side of the truck. The H carrier had finally figured out the same thing that the Moto Terminator from before had also figured out. That Serena would have a much more difficult time shooting at a target position on the driver's side of the truck. It has moved over to your side. I can't get an easy shot anymore. Prepare to evade its plasma cannon shots. Serena's shouted from outside the truck. I can see that. Caden replied. I will keep trying to shoot at it. Unlike the small Moto Terminator, the H Cariel is a large aircraft, and so, I can still shoot at it even if it has now positioned itself on your side of the truck, though it won't be as easy as before, and I doubt whether I can even hit it at all. With the H Cariel now in a more relaxed attacking position, Caden knew that their situation had taken a turn for the worse. Caden saw a bright light appear at the nozzle of the H Cariel's plasma cannon. Fuck it! Everybody hang on tight. Caden steered the truck to swerve hard to the right. Boom! A bright ray of light flashed down from the H. Cariel's plasma cannon, flying close by Caden's truck window before striking the road in front of the truck. The plasma cannon shot blew up fragments of the road into the air, creating a large porthole in the road. Whoa! That was dangerous! Caden stuttered as he steered the truck to avoid the newly created porthole in the road, 
a shiver running down his spine, looking at the large hole in the road behind them through his camera video feeds. Caden realized that he needed to make sure that the truck was not hit by even one of the H. Carriel's plasma cannons. He was not sure whether the truck's armor was built to handle that amount of punishment. Besides, even if the truck was not completely destroyed by the plasma cannon shot, his human passengers, and maybe he, himself, included, he wasn't sure about the limits of his body's durability, would most likely all die if the H. Carriel's plasma cannon shot successfully struck the truck. Caden checked the camera feeds again, and what he saw dashed his hopes. Having missed its first attempt at destroying the truck, the H. Carriel was now repositioning itself for it to release another plasma cannon shot while also making small adjustments in its flying to avoid Serena's feeble attempts to shoot at it her side of the truck. And as if to add insult to injury, Serena plasma rifle suddenly stopped firing plasma shots with only some clicking sounds reaching Caden's ears when she pulled the plasma rifle's trigger. I'm out. My plasma rifle is out of isotope. Pass me the other plasma rifle. Serena shouted. Okay, here take it. Caden had grabbed the last remaining plasma rifle from the truck's dashboard and was about to hand it over to Serena. But he saw that the H. Carriel had taken advantage of the break in Serena's shooting, and it was about to release another plasma cannon shot. So he dropped the plasma rifle back on the dashboard before returning his hands to the steering wheel and swerving the truck to the left in order to avoid the second plasma cannon shot. The second plasma cannon shot struck the road behind them, just a little more than a meter behind the truck. The force of the explosion lifted the truck's rear tires off of the road, and Caden had to fight hard at steering the truck in order to not lose his control of the truck and crash it. Caden managed to successfully maintain his control of the truck and not crash the truck, but he was afraid that he would not be able to handle any more plasma cannon shots from the HK aerial. Here, take it and try to distract the HK aerial. Caden shouted, grabbing the last remaining plasma rifle from the dashboard and throwing it to Serena. Got it. Serena said. HUD, give me information about HK aerials. Caden thought. The data. The same as the ones he had previously seen that he already seen about H. Carriels, appeared on his HUD. He quickly scanned through the data, but he could not immediately see anything that he could use to turn his currently bad situation around. Serena had resumed shooting at the H. Carriel, but like before, she was mostly just been a nuisance to H. Carriel and making it more difficult for the H. Carriel to get a lock on the truck. But Serena would most likely exhaust her plasma rifle power source and run out of isotope before she was able to cause any significant damage to the HK aerial. We really need a more powerful weapon right about now. Caden complained in his mind. Caden searched through his HUD's data on HK aerial for anything he could use to his advantage. Come on, give me something, anything. Caden muttered under his breath. The H. Carriel had managed to get another lock on the truck even amidst dodging Serena's plasma shots. Caden was not sure whether he would be able to evade the next plasma cannon shot, and even if he could survive the truck's destruction, he hated the thought that he was about to fail to fulfill his promise to the former prisoners. But just then some new words appeared on Caden's HUD. H. Carriel's plasma cannon shooting data acquired. Analyzing H. Carriel plasma cannon shooting data. Activating Trajection Prediction Mode Trajectory Prediction Mode Activated Suddenly, several pointers or marked spots appeared within Caden Vision Field. The pointers marked the various spots where the H. Carriel's next plasma cannon shot would most likely hit. Attached to the pointers was information about the percentage probability of likelihood for the plasma cannon shot to actually strike each and every one of the marked spots. Whenever Caden observed the H. Carriel shift its position or aim, the spots that the pointers had marked would be also be adjusted and their percentage probabilities would change to reflect it. This prediction ability seemed to work by taking in data through Caden's senses before analyzing it in his neural net processor in order to make the predictions. When the H. Carriel was about to shoot another plasma cannon shot, Caden knew that there was a 90% chance of the plasma cannon shot striking the door at the back of the truck. And Caden was ready for it. Caden stepped down hard on the accelerator. The truck lurched forward, and a few seconds later, a beam of plasma flashed down from the HK aerial. Boom! 
the road several meters behind the truck exploded. It worked. Caden thought. Good job. Serena said, still trying to shoot at the H carrier. The H carrier readjusted its position and aimed at the truck again. In front of the truck. 87% probability. Caden thought. Boom. Caden had figured out that the H carrier intended to shoot at the area in front of the truck so that Caden would drive the truck into the resulting explosion. So, Caden braked suddenly before steering the truck to the side of the explosion and driving around it. In addition to dodging the plasma cannon shots, Caden then began to drive the truck in such a way that he would often place the H carrier within an easier aiming zone for Serena to better attack it. And Serena made use of this opportunity to pester the H carrier with plasma shot and distract it even more. The pursuit went on along the road with Caden's truck running away from an H carrier and strangely and even miraculously managing to evade all of the H carrier's plasma cannon shots and with Serena shooting at the H carrier while hanging on to the side door. As Caden drove the truck to skillfully and successfully dodge plasma cannon shot after plasma cannon shot, his excitement mounted. He finally noticed something that he had not noticed earlier during the pursuit. He finally realized that the skill with which he drove the truck had been gradually increasing. The weirdest thing was that his driving skill seemed to have suddenly been boosted to such a high level that he had begun to feel like the truck was part of his body. The truck was now able to move according to his intentions to such an extent that Caden felt almost that it was reacting to his mind's intent before he even turned the truck's steering wheel. It feels almost like I have become one with the truck. Dot. Thanks for your support on Patreon, Turtle Ghost. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendricks. 12. Chapter 20. End of the pursuit. Caden entered into a flow state. He steered the truck to evade plasma cannon shot after plasma shot, controlling the steering wheel with the most efficient of touches. Caden's HUD trajectory prediction feature assisted in plotting out a safe path through the bombardment of plasma cannon explosions and the many wreckages lying around on the road as he drove the truck onward. Caden was beginning to regain his confidence that he would be able to prevent his truck from being blown up while he looked for a way to shake off the HK aerial. But just then, his hope was dashed again, and he was brought back to earth about his seemingly rotten luck. I'm out! Serena shouted. What? Caden shouted back, his attention still focused on dodging the H. Cario's plasma cannon shots. My gun is out of isotope. I can't shoot back at the H. Cario anymore. Serena said. Serena climbed back into her seat. She tossed the exhausted plasma rifles back onto the dashboard before adding a mutter. The gun wasn't very effective against the H. Cario anyway. Caden checked the camera feeds. Immediately, he discovered that the H.K. Ariel had stopped dodging. Due to the absence of Serena's constant pestering shooting, it now had the opportunity to get a better aim and fire more accurate plasma cannon shots at the truck from relaxed positions. Besides, its shooting rate would definitely increase. The highest percentage probabilities of Caden's HUD trajectory prediction pointers had also dropped down to average between 60 to 70%. This would definitely increase the chances of Caden making a wrong choice of how to dodge the H. Cario's plasma cannon shots and end up with the truck destroyed. Fuck! Wait a sec. I will think of something. Caden knew that he had to think up a plan to lose the H. Cario as soon as possible. Although Caden's driving skills was made it seem like he was completely dominating the H. Cario and was dodging all its plasma cannon shots with ease. Caden knew that he could not maintain this state for very long. The H. Cariel only needed a single successful hit to destroy their truck and kill all the normal human passengers inside. So, while driving the truck, Caden kept looking all around and searching for something, anything, he could use to solve the problem of the H. Cariel pursuit. And that was when he noticed something on the roadside, a little bit more than a hundred meters ahead. Caden immediately zoomed in his HUD vision field and he saw that a team of three resistance fighters were hiding among the wreckage on the roadside. The resistance soldiers were injured, and so their mobility had been mostly compromised. From what Caden saw, the soldiers seemed to have been left with some weapons to use to protect themselves while they waited to be rescued or for the battle to end. 
They each carried their usual modified plasma rifles. The soldiers also had a damaged vehicle with them. The vehicle had a large anti-aerial plasma cannon mounted on it, and one of the soldiers was operating. From time to time, the resistance fighters would stand up from their hiding spot, take aim and shoot at any passing Skynet aircraft that flew too close to the area before hiding again among the wreckage. A still smoldering Skynet aircrafts were some testaments to the soldiers' effectiveness. Caden watched the three resistance fighters for a brief second, quickly obtaining a rudimentary understanding their skills, before he looked at the image of the HK aerial in the truck's rear mirror, the beginnings of a daring plan forming in his mind. And like always, his very helpful neural net processor detected his objective, predicting the flight path of HK aerial. Some words appeared on his HUD. The words were accompanied by a visual representation on his HUD showing the predicted flight path that the H carrier would follow if it kept on pursuing Caden's truck. And so, Caden stepped even harder on the gas to give the truck a bit more speed, and the truck sped onward at a high speed towards where the three resistance soldiers were hiding. Just a little bit more, Caden thought. But just then, Caden looked straight ahead and he noticed that the about 50 meters ahead, the road was blocked. Caden just sighed in resignation. He no longer had the energy to even complain. Caden saw that a pile of wreckage about one meter high was blocking the road ahead. This road was only straightforward path out of this place, and he could not stop now to look for another road because they are H. Carriel hot on his tail pursuing his truck. If he kept on driving forward, his truck would definitely crash into the wreckage, and the large wreckage consisting of parts from both destroyed HK tanks and some resistance vehicles, would surely cause severe damage to the truck and disable it. Realizing that slowing down or stopping the truck now would result in certain death of all the truck's occupants, and still riding on the high he obtained from using his newly discovered trajectory prediction ability, Caden decided to go all in and fully trust in his abilities. Everybody hold on tightly to something. Make sure you don't sustain too much injuries or fall off the truck. Caden shouted to the people in the back of the truck. What do you want to do? Said Serena. She seemed like Caden's current facial expression, which must have looked like that of a crazy person, had made her a little worried. Don't worry, I have a plan. Caden said. He even flashed Serena a smile, hoping to reassure her. I know, that's why I'm worried. You should see your face right now. You look a little crazy. Caden did not reply to that. He focused his mind completely on his driving and the exhilarating feeling he was getting from using his new ability to plot a path of survival in the current high-speed and high-risk pursuit. Unlike what he had expected, he was starting to like this feeling. The feeling of using his abilities to survive on a knife's edge even if failure meant his death. Okay, maybe not the dying part. Five seconds until the truck crashes into the wreckage quickly calculating the time until the truck crosses the distance and reach where the wreckage blocking the road was. Caden then formed a plan to escape from their current dilemma. And as the truck approached the obstruction, Caden started a countdown in his mind. 5. Boom! The h carrier fired its plasma cannon. Caden swerved the truck and dodged. As Caden drove the truck to speed towards the obstruction on the road, he maintained the current high speed of the vehicle. He had decided to not slow down the truck even a single bit. He even gave the truck another small speed boost. 4. Through the truck's rearview mirror, Caden could see that the h carrier was taking aim again at the truck. 3. Caden ended the tactic he had been using, steering the truck in a zigzag motion, to make aiming at the truck more difficult for the h carrier. He drove the truck forward in a straight line making sure to position the truck in such a way that the survivors riding at the back would be highly visible to the h carrier. 2. The h carrier had successfully locked on the truck and was now accumulating energy in its plasma cannon. The pointer on Caden's HUD that marked the back of the truck showed a percentage probability of 90%. A smirk appeared on Caden's face. 1. The truck reached the wreckage which had a slanting shape. Caden wanted to use a large fragment of destroyed HK tank as a ramp to gain some lift for the truck. Zero. Now! Caden screamed like a madman as stepped on the gas, and the truck sped up the ramp and flew into the air. Ah! 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 Many screams were coming from the back of the trucks. 
The people in the back had obviously been frightened by the shaking and rocking of the now airborne truck. This is so insane! screamed Serena. She was currently sitting in the shotgun position beside Caden at the front of the truck. She had a shocked expression on her face. She had obviously not expected that Caden plan would be that crazy and wild. Caden who acted like he could not heard the many screams of his shocked passengers, heard the sound of the HK Aereo firing a plasma cannon shot. It was soon followed by the sound of explosion. Boom! But the truck did not explode. Phew! It missed, thought Caden exhaling the breath he had held in. The H. Cario's plasma cannon shot had passed under the flying truck and had struck the pile of wreckage. The resulting explosion had blown the wreckage pile to pieces. The extra boost of lift that the truck received from the explosion had helped the truck fly even higher and farther, and it successfully flew over the obstacle of wreckage, blocking the road. Caden then controlled the truck to land safely on the ground, and then, the truck sped onward and forward. All that exciting action had finally attracted the attention of the hiding resistance soldiers to the rapidly approaching truck and the pursuing HK aerial. Through his HUD zoom function, Caden could see them poking their heads out from among the wrecked vehicles that they were using as cover to launch surprise attacks at enemy aircrafts that came close enough into range. The soldiers were staring in open-mouthed surprise at the truck that had been able to survive the HK aerial's fierce onslaught of plasma cannon fire. My driving skills must have shocked them silly. Caden thought, allowing himself to briefly feel smug before returning to a more serious state of mind. This team of three resistance soldiers weigh the most important part of his plan to finally get rid the highly dangerous and annoying H. Cario currently hot on his tail. So, when Caden saw the one among the resistance soldiers who was manning their anti-aircraft plasma cannon rotated and aim it at the H. Cario, he knew that his plan would most likely succeed. Caden now only had to make sure he used his truck as bait to lure the H. Cariel to enter within the attack range of the soldier's plasma cannon. And with his driving skills which had been greatly augmented with his trajectory prediction ability, Caden managed to successfully lure in the H. Cariel without his truck getting destroyed. Caden's HUD zoomed in on the resistance soldiers, and he saw they had aimed at and gotten a lock on the H. Cariel with their vehicle-mounted plasma cannon. He could clearly see the man who was operating the plasma cannon pull the trigger to fire. A satisfied smile appeared on Caden's face. And now you die, you piece of metal junk, Caden thought. A flash of light flew above Caden's truck from the resistance soldier's plasma cannon and strike the H. Cariel pursuing Caden's truck from behind. Boom! The H. Cario turned into a fireball for a brief second before it burst apart, and H. Cario parts rained down from the sky. Thanks for your support on Patreon, Turtle Ghost. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendrix. 13. Chapter 21. Temporal Stagnation. Caden drove the truck onwards towards the part of the road where the three resistance soldiers were taking cover leaving the scattered remnants of the blown-up H. Cariels behind them. Whoop! Ha ha! Phew, we finally got rid of that pesky oversized metal fly. Caden said, his heart still racing from adrenaline rush from the high-acting chase. Still smiling, Caden turned to look at Serena. She was still staring at the wreckage of the H. Cariel through the camera feeds, a shocked expression on her face. It was almost like she still could not believe that they had all managed to live through all of Caden's crazy driving stunts. Did you see that? So how was it? I told you I had a plan, didn't I? Caden said, Yeah, you did a good job, a great job even, especially your driving skills. Simply amazing. Mm, almost miraculous, you can say. Serena said, patting Caden on the shoulder and the breath she had held in during the most intense part of the chase. But before Caden could bask in his feeling of satisfaction some more, Serena added, But that was still an insane plan to rely on the resulting explosion from H. K. Ariel's plasma cannon shot to jump over the obstruction on the road. We could have all died if your judgment of the timing had been even a little bit off. Caden knew that Serena must be slightly annoyed by his risky actions, but he was not too bothered by it. He did not think his plan was too risky. His newly discovered ability, Trajectory prediction was amazing. 
It had greatly boosted his confidence in his ability to carry out his plans successfully. Besides, the abilities he had gotten from his enhancements had been mostly reliable, and they had helped him survive till now. So, he had begun to develop some trust in them, and rely on them more and more. Caden had to admit that Skynet had really done a good job at enhancing him. Skynet must have made a real effort, and used a lot of resources to give Caden his enhancements. Skynet should have needed Caden to fulfill some kind of purpose that must have been very important for it. But unfortunately for Skynet, its plans for Caden had failed, and Caden would now be using his enhancements for only his own benefit instead of Skynet's. Still, there was no way for Caden to explain all that to Serena. It worked though, right? Caden said. Yeah, I will admit it did. Serena said, sighing. As the truck reached where the three resistance soldiers were hiding, Caden braked the truck, slowing it down and finally stopping it on the road. The soldiers were hiding among some wrecked vehicles lying by the roadside, at a distance of about five meters from the road. Caden had already noticed that all three of the soldiers were wounded, and although the three soldiers had been left behind here because of their wounds, they had still decided to keep fighting in their own way, and they even got some admirable results to show for their efforts. Caden had to admit that he admired their determination. After having judged from checking the camera feeds that they no longer had any other HK pursuers, and due to the fact that the soldiers had just saved their lives, Caden decided to stop the truck and ask the soldiers if they needed any help. But when Caden tried to wave towards the soldiers, he realized that his hand was loosely sticking to the steering wheel. With an eyebrow raised in puzzlement, he tried removing his other hand from the steering wheel. The same thing happened. On raising his hand slightly away from the steering wheel, what he saw almost gave him a fright. What the foo? Caden almost shouted, stopping himself abruptly when Serena turned towards in puzzlement due to his sudden outburst. Is there a problem? Serena asked. No. No. I was just a little surprised is all. Look at the size of that plasma cannon. So big, right? Serena gave him a strange look before turning away from him. Caden gave a silent sigh of relief before turning back to examining his hands. He saw many extremely thin black metallic threads extending out of his hand and piercing into the steering wheel. When Caden focused his sight on the threads, his HUD showed him an enlarged view of the threads, and he saw tiny pulses of light running down from his hand, along the threads and then into the steering wheel. And that was when Caden realized that the black threads were much versions of the ones he seen earlier when he had activated the two TX terminators in the cold storage area. Caden tried to pull his hands away from the steering wheel even harder. Suddenly, all of the black metallic threads retracted from where they had inserted into the steering wheel, and immediately they did. Caden lost the feeling of being connected to the truck and being one with the truck. The threads then re-entered into his hands. Hey! Caden called out to the soldiers who were now sitting down and resting. The work of operating the plasma cannon and attacking H carriers must have been very stressful for their already wounded bodies. Having suddenly remembered something, Caden turned towards Serena. Do you want to talk to them? They are your colleagues, right? Caden asked. No. Go ahead. It's all the same if you do the talking. The resistance is so large that I don't think they would even recognize me. It'd only complicate things if I reveal my status as a resistance to them without it having been verified by HQ. Serena said. Caden nodded. Anyways, he did not really know how the resistance operated. Hey guys! Caden shouted, waving towards the three men. Thanks for the assist. That was an amazing shot there. Yeah, you're welcome. You've got nice driving skills. One of the soldiers replied. The resistance soldier sounded tired, and he was most energetic and the only one among the three soldiers who even bothered to say something. The other two only waved at Caden while sharing a water can among themselves. Everybody in this truck was a former Skynet prisoner, and we're trying to escape. I can see that you guys are wounded and exhausted, and I wanted to ask whether you want to come with us. You guys just saved us, and we'd like to return the favor. Caden said, the first soldier shook his head. Thanks, but we'd have to reject your help. Before the battle started, we were told that this would be an important mission which could decide the future of all humans. So we won't leave. 
We are soldiers of the human resistance serving under John Connor. We will remain here until the battle is over and won or until when we are Kia. The soldier said with conviction and his two colleagues nodded in agreement. He then added, Thanks anyways for trying to help. All right, I understand. We will be continuing on our way. Good luck. Caden said. Caden was about to step on the gas when the soldier seemed to have just then suddenly remembered something. The soldier said, Oh, I just remembered. If you continuing going forwards, you will see a... The soldier was suddenly interrupted by a heart-wrenching scream. No! Shocked, Caden immediately turned towards Serena who suddenly screamed. Caden could see that she had a totally horrified expression on her face. She looked like she had just seen or heard something that had completely terrified her. But before Caden could ask Serena why she had screamed, he heard the loud sound of an explosion come from the direction of the battlefield and Skynet's core facility. Boom! Rumble! This was the loudest explosion sound that Caden had heard since when he had first awakened inside Skynet's underground laboratory slash surgical operating room. The ground was tremoring. He could feel the tremors through the body of his truck. On the rearview camera feeds, Caden saw a small mushroom cloud of dust and debris rising from the mountaintop. A section of the mountain summit also seemed to have collapsed into the hollowed out interior of the mountain where Skynet had built its facility. And that was when it happened. Suddenly, everything froze. Time slowed down to a crawl. Everything and everybody around Caden was moving very slowly, he himself included. Temporal stagnation detected. Activating neural overdrive mode. Neural overdrive mode activated. Just like everyone else, Caden's mind and body had also slowed down, even his thoughts. But his neural net processor aka his brain chip had detected time slowing down and so following the appearance of several new words on his HUD, Caden body and mind returned to just below their normal speeds. But as a result of this, Caden now had to endure very painful throbbing headaches. Uh. Caden moaned in pain. The headaches seemed to worsen as time went on. It was beginning to feel to him like his brain was being cooked slowly in a pot of boiling water. Caden was not sure how long he could withstand the pain. Warning! Warning! Temporal anomalies detected. Warning. Warning. Timeline in chaos. Warning. Warning. Massive damage to the past timeline predicted. Source. Encrypted data files and memory archive. The time stagnation lasted for about 10 seconds before it ended. And everything returned to normal. Caden's mind's special mode also ended. And his headaches stopped worsening. Though some pain still remained. Caden massaged his head. Trying to reduce the pain. The tactical radio communication device on the resistance soldier suddenly crackled awake, and a male voice came out from it. This is John Connor, to all resistance soldiers within comms range. Skynet has been destroyed. I repeat, Skynet has been destroyed. We won! Thanks for your support on Patreon, Turtle. Check out my Patreon to support me, at www.patreon.com slash kendrix13. Chapter 22. Arrival at the Destination. All units take note. The machines are escaping. I repeat, Skynet's HKs are fleeing the battlefield. This is to all units located around the periphery of the battlefield. Immediately set up dog detector checkpoints and search and destroy any fleeing Terminators. Eliminate as many as you can. Wipe them all out. The voice on the resistance soldier's comms which had identified itself as John Connor's voice continued speaking and giving out some more information about what was happening on the battlefield, even adding some new orders for the resistance soldiers in the area. As soon as John Connor had mentioned the HKs that were fleeing the battlefield in defeat, Caden finally understood what he had been witnessing which had caused him to be a little confused about what he was seeing. When that strange slowing down of time had stopped, Caden had seen many h carriels fly over them. Those h carriels seemed to be running away from the battlefield. Although he could not make out clearly what was happening on the battlefield all the way from where he was, Caden thought that he saw, through the truck's video feed while using the camera's zoom feature, tiny images that looked like h carriel fleeing away from the battlefield in all directions. When Caden had seen the first of fleeing h carriels flying towards their direction, he had cursed aloud, scared that his luck, which he was now beginning to believe was obviously rotten, 
had brought yet another H. Cario pursuer down on them. But when the H. Cario had reached their location, it did not slow down even the slightest. Instead, it had continued on its way as if it had totally not noticed the fully visible human standing along its path. But Caden could not really blame the H. Cario for not bothering about them because he soon noticed that a resistance fighter aircraft was hot on its tail in pursuit. Caden had witnessed several other similar events happen within the few minutes since the massive explosion that occurred on the mountain. So, he had been wondering about what was happening on the battlefield until the voice on the radio clarified the situation. Congratulations, you guys seem to have won the battle. Caden said to the soldiers. The three soldiers had been cheering since they heard the first announcement on the radio. Caden had noticed that the soldiers had not said anything about the weirdness with time slowing down that had just happened. The soldiers had either not noticed it, or the announcement on their comms had distracted from thinking about the weird feeling of slowing down. So, Caden decided to not call the soldiers' attention to it. Yeah, you too. This is a great victory for everybody. All humans. The first soldier said, Yeah, I guess. Caden murmured. Caden's face had twitched when the soldier had said that the victory was for all humans. He was not so sure that these soldiers would accept him as part of the human group if they knew what he actually was. On the other hand, Caden himself was not sure whether he could still call himself human, so the point was moot. Ah, uh, fuck it. I don't have to think about all that right now. Caden thought. So, you guys don't need our help, right? Caden asked, returning to the matter that he had wanted to find out before they were interrupted. Nah, don't worry about us. Anyways, I think you guys really should leave this place right now. Those fleeing HKs can still be really dangerous for normal survivors like you guys. We will stay right here and see whether we will be lucky and run into any of those escaping machines. We aren't satisfied with the action we've seen, right boys? Hell yeah! The other two soldiers shouted back. Oh, that's right. Um, if you guys continue on this road, you will definitely run into the resistance staging camp for this battle. They should have now come out of hiding since the battle has been concluded. I think you should head over there. They should be of some help to survivors and former Skynet prisoners like you guys. Caden nodded. This was a good idea. He could drop off the former prisoners in his truck there, handing them over to the resistance. The resistance should definitely be more qualified than him to take care of the former prisoners. Caden then turned to Serena, wanting to know whether she had anything she wished to say to the soldiers, but she still looked like she was shell-shocked or something. So, Caden sighed and shook his head before turning back to the soldiers. Okay, we will be on our way. See you guys later. Stay safe, guys. Caden said, Yeah, we will try. The soldiers said, laughing like they had used a resistance inside joke. Caden nodded and stepped on the accelerator. He had kept the truck in idle mode in order to keep it ready in case a quick getaway was needed, and continued on his way. After watching the soldiers fall behind them, Caden turned to the silent Serena. Serena, are you okay? Caden asked. Caden had to ask his question for a second time before Serena responded. Huh? What? Serena said. She looked rattled. Caden's question must have startled awake from her thoughts. Are you okay? You've been so quiet. And earlier on, why did you scream no? You look so scared then. Serena paused for a brief second to take in a deep breath before she answered. Sorry about that. Did you feel those tremors? I think a massive explosion must have happened on the battlefield. I was just scared for the resistance soldiers who might have been killed by that explosion. And then there was that weird feeling that washed over me. Did you feel that too? Yeah, I felt it too. Caden answered. But he added in his mind, that's a lie. Actually, you had screamed before all that happened. Stories not checking out. Although Caden knew that Serena was not telling him the truth, he decided to not argue about it with her right now. Now was not the right time for that. The most important thing right now was to get the former prisoners to safety as soon as possible hopefully by handing them over to the resistance. He would then figure out what to do next. Don't worry too much. There's nothing you can do about your colleagues. Caden said placatingly. Serena nodded, and then she returned to her silent thoughts. From then on, the journey passed in silence for both Caden and Serena. 
The driving was mostly uneventful for Caden except for the times when he saw small teams of resistance soldiers with dogs searching through the woods by the side of the road, and when Caden had to drive the truck through a hastily set up resistance checkpoint on the road being manned by several resistance soldiers, also accompanied by a couple of dogs. For a second there, Caden was really worried that the dogs would notice something off about him, but in the end, they successfully passed through the checkpoint with no problem. Caden also noticed that Serena had briefly perked up when they passed through the checkpoint. After a mostly uneventful 10 minutes of driving along the road, they arrived at the location that the soldiers had told Caden about. Caden saw a sprawling army camp ahead of him. The place was bustling with many soldiers carrying weapons, from what he could see, both plasma and gunpowder-based weapons from. The soldiers were patrolling the camp, and several other people that looked like normal survivors going about their business. The number of normal survivors inside the camp seemed to be growing constantly as more and more survivors wearing ragged and dirty clothes and carrying their meager possessions. From time to time wandered into the camp. John Connor's voice could be heard on the loudspeakers giving out the latest one of his post-battle victory speeches. And as Caden slowly approached the resistance army camp, from time to time he caught snippets of the speech over the loud din of the rowdy crowd of survivors. For many years, we humans have suffered under the yoke of Skynet and its machine army. For many years, Skynet has killed and enslaved many humans, many of whom were fathers, mothers, siblings, children, friends or comrades who we had cherished greatly, and whom Skynet's machine army had brutally murdered. And with the help of the smart, brave, talented members of the Resistance, I am pleased to announce to all human survivors that the Resistance invaded Skynet's core facility and have successfully destroyed Skynet's mainframe. Skynet's defense grid is down. I am calling on all of you human survivors, wherever you may be hiding, to come out. The resistance has begun designating locations for building survivor camps and resettlements. Find the nearest resistance survivor camp and join in the resistance efforts to regain what humanity has lost and rebuild human civilization. The time has come for humanity to rise up again like a phoenix reborn from its ashes. It's time for humans to come out of hiding, out of the shadows. Ah, uh, I guess that's why these survivors are gathering here. Caden thought. The whole place had the looks of the first stage of humans restoring their ownership of their world and humanity's resettlement of the land as the true masters of their planet. Thanks for your support on Patreon, Turtle. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash kendricks. 13. Chapter 23. Laz Howard. The resistance soldiers had set up barricades on the roads approaching their former battle command HQ which had now been converted into the new survivor gathering camp for the area. Several well-armed soldiers manned the barricades. There were also a few ground-mounted and vehicle-mounted plasma machine guns arranged around the barricades, especially so for the road that approached the area from the direction of the battlefield. When the soldiers saw Caden's truck approach, they shouted and signaled for him to stop the truck. They also aimed their weapons at the unfamiliar truck which also looked like one of Skynet's transport vehicles. Caden could see that the soldiers all wore wary looks on their faces and they looked to be about a hair trigger away from firing on the truck at the slightest sign of threat. Don't shoot! We are human survivors! Caden shouted, also frantically waving his hands about. Stop the truck! Park it over there! One of the soldiers said, motioning for Caden to pack the truck by the roadside. Okay, okay, I'll do that right now. Don't shoot please. Caden braked and slowed down the truck and following the soldier's command, he drove the truck off the main road before parking it by the roadside. The lead soldier motioned for three of his colleagues to approach the truck with him. All of the soldiers still had their guns aimed at the truck, still ready for anything. All of you, get down from the truck right now. Leave any weapons you have with you in the truck. The lead soldier shouted. Fuck. These guys aren't as nice as the other resistance soldiers we met before. Why do they look so trigger happy? We haven't done anything wrong. Caden thought. Hey Serena, do you have any suggestions about what we should do? Caden asked. Just do what they say. We'll be okay as long as we don't do anything suspicious. Serena answered dully. Caden sighed. He did not know what was going on with her. She seemed out of it since that huge explosion had happened, 
and she had remained silent as they drove along the way till now, only giving single word responses to all of his attempts to start a conversation with her. She only stared out of the window while wearing a blank expression at the scenery that they passed by along the way. Even now, Serena only stared blankly at the soldiers manning the barricade. She did not look the slightest bit bothered by the fact that many guns were pointed at them. Anyways, either of our weapons still has any ammunition left in them. Caden thought wryly. He raised both of his hands to show the four resistance soldiers who were currently standing in front of the truck that his hands were empty and that he was not armed. Then he turned and banged hard on the truck's metal body behind him in order to alert his other passengers of their present circumstance. Everybody, we have reached our destination. You can all come down right now. It's safe now. Caden shouted his words up to this point before he hesitated to complete that sentence, thinking that the sentence was really not too accurate. So, after pausing briefly to take another glance at the resistance soldiers with their guns aimed at them, he added with a shrug. I guess, more or less, Caden and Serena both disembarked from the truck before slowly walking forwards to stand in front of the truck. Serena's beauty caused a little commotion among the soldiers, with the four soldiers and most of the other soldiers standing a little distance away at the barricade taking frequent furtive glances at her face and body, which Serena, with her current seemingly depressed state, did not seem to care about or even notice. Caden's own handsome looks also got some reaction from the few female soldiers among the group of soldiers. Is it just you two? The leading soldier asked Caden. He seemed to have taken Caden to be the leader of their duo, probably because Caden had been the only one actively responding to his commands. Caden shook his head. No, there are many more survivors in the back. The leading soldier gave a sign to two soldiers among the three with him for them to go and check it out. Don't worry we are all just normal people. Caden said with a wry smile after he saw how careful the soldiers were with handling them. The sounds of the former prisoners disembarking from the truck reached Caden's ears. Although Caden heard what sounded like some people having some difficulties getting down from the truck, all of the former prisoners finally came down. It also sounded like the two soldiers had even given them some help. The two soldiers then marched the haggard-looking former prisoners to where Caden and Serena were standing at the front of the truck. The soldiers then went back to their leader, and then gave him a nod, and the leader's look became milder. All right, everything checks out. You guys have now been granted permission to enter the camp. No non-sanctioned vehicles are allowed inside the camp, so you will have to leave your truck here and we will raise the barricade for you. Just pass through the camp's gate to enter into the camp. Caden nodded. Everybody let's go. I will take you all into the camp. The journey is finally over. Ha ha. It wasn't so bad right? Caden said using a jovial tone when he saw the tired and exhausted looks on the faces of the former prisoners. Nadia, who was helping the other survivors settle down, looked at the several people who were trying to stand on their still shaky legs and a few of the kids who were wiping some remnant vomit stains from their mouth before she turned and gave Caden a severe glare. Sorry about all the rough driving. It was all to save our lives. Caden apologized. Nadia sighed, her look softening. She said, You don't have to apologize. I understand why you did what you did. You have protected all of us till now. It's just the way kids suffered made me a little angry. Sigh, it's just the way the world is right now. It's not a good place for kids. Yeah, I understand what you mean. It's so hard. Caden said before he added in his mind with a sigh, What about my own childhood? I guess I too must have experienced a difficult childhood. And I don't even remember it. Caden then led his group of survivors to enter the camp through the camp's gate. The gate was not really like other gates that can be opened or closed and locked. It only had a large, thick rectangular steel gate frame on which many cameras and several other devices were mounted. Another group of fully armed soldiers were arranged around the gate. The soldiers maintained careful watch over the area around the camp's gate. Under the watchful eyes of the resistance soldiers, Caden led the group to enter the camp with no problems. In a tent hidden deep within camp, a young man typed at a desk on which several computer screens were arranged. He was typing rapidly on his computer keyboard. A small radio device had been placed amidst the clutter on the desk. John Connor's victory announcement seemed to have been recorded from it, and the announcement replayed in a loop on it. 
Laz Howard wore a little smile on his face as he listened to the announcement. It worked. Ha ha. I said it. And it really worked. Eat that Skynet. I broke into your network yet again. Beep. Laz was in the midst of celebrating his great achievement when he was suddenly interrupted by a beeping sound from one of his computer screens. This was the computer that he used to monitor the secret anti-infiltrator sensors that had been installed in the camp's gate. Curious, Laz checked the computer screen, but he did not find anything abnormal. He only saw that there was a small change in the monitoring chart for electromagnetic activity. There was a small sudden spike in the chart that almost immediately returned to normal. Laz usually used this chart to detect unauthorized wireless communications and data transmissions. But the change that had just occurred had not lasted long enough and had not reached the threshold levels required for suspicion. Still, following his usual habit, Laz checked his other charts and data received from his sensors, especially the metal detectors, but he did not find anything abnormal there. Maybe it's just the usual device readings fluctuating. Laz thought before putting it out of his mind. He had other things to think about. He could not wait for John Connor to return so that he could learn the details about how effective and useful his devices were for their infiltration mission. Thanks for your support on Patreon, Turtle. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendrix. 13. Chapter 24. The General Wants to See You. Author's Note. I'm back. I got a lot better during the week so I decided to take advantage of my extra free time to write more chapters than the usual. So, enjoy the mass release of sorts. Thank you to everyone that sent me their well wishes. Alright, over there is the registration desk for the new arrivals. You guys should go there and register yourselves before the camp can make the necessary arrangements for your needs. The leader of the squad of soldiers made one of the soldiers to accompany Caden's group through the gate. After the soldier escort had taken the group to the registration area for new arrivals and had informed them of what they needed to do next, he left, heading towards the inner central part of the camp. Caden stood aside while Serena accompanied Nadia's group as they went to register themselves with the camp. He watched as Nadia led the former prisoners to join the long queue of survivors that had formed in front of the female soldier who was responsible for handling the registration of the survivors. As Caden watched the resistance soldiers allocating supplies to the survivors who had already been registered in the camp, he carefully considered his next plans. Caden had no intention to join Nadia's group and register himself with the resistance camp. He only wanted to wait and make sure that Nadia's group had been properly settled into the camp before he continued on his way. Still, Caden had no idea about where to go next or what to do next. He had no memories about where he had originally lived before he had ended up in Skynet's core facility, or whether he even still had a home somewhere, or whether he still had any family or friends left somewhere in the world waiting for him. For all he knew, he was all alone in the world, adrift with no place to call home. The only thing Caden was sure of was that staying in this camp would not be safe for him. He was a human-machine hybrid, someone whom any resistance soldier would be considered a target for immediate elimination if his true nature was ever revealed to them. And if Caden stayed in this camp for too long surrounded by so many resistance soldiers, it would only be a matter of time until he was discovered by the resistance. And that would definitely not end in a good way for him. Maybe it will be better if I just travel around randomly for a while. Maybe I will encounter a place that will jolt my memories or something. According to the Resistance, they have already destroyed Skynet, and the machines have lost. So traveling should be way less dangerous from now on. I should also use that time to learn more about my body and all the way Skynet has modified and enhanced it. Caden thought. And that was when Caden suddenly recalled something that he had overlooked until now. Oh, right. The computer files. I totally forgot about those files I downloaded from the computers inside that Skynet lab where I was being experimented on. Caden pulled up the files on his HUD and then began to read them one after the other. He was sitting on a rock lying under one of the many light sources being used to keep the camp well illuminated even though the time was about 2 a.m. in the morning and still very dark out. The rock was probably a fragment which had broken off from one of the building ruins littering around the army camp. The broken down ruins were the only telltale remnants of the prejudgment day era. 
Caden frequently switched between reading the computer files and watching the things going on in the army camp. Even so, with his abnormally fast reading speed, he quickly finished reading all the files. He did not learn much from the files, and there were not that many files. Caden only learned a few general things about the experiments carried out on him and about the enhancements added to his body. But most of the knowledge he had obtained from the files were things he had already learned on his own about his body from his experiences during their escape from Skynet's core facility. Things like his metal endoskeleton, his fast wound regeneration ability, his HUD and so on. Even so, he learned some new things like the fact that Skynet's most advanced neural net processor nanoship had been implanted in his brain and the fact that those black Thread-like metallic things that would sometimes come out of his hands were the transformed forms of his extremely advanced intelligent carbon-based mimetic polyalloy liquid, metal endosheath that could also function as nanotechnological transjectors. Yeah, there were many words like the previous ones that Caden had no idea what they meant. Things like plasma biological hybrid reactors. And what the hell were zero-point retrograde temporal actuators? And when he tried to access to follow the links attached to those words and access their more detailed versions, he would always see an error message saying that every detail had been removed from the files. Caden turned off his HUD when he was done reading. He resumed watching what was going on in the camp. His eyes were glazed over with boredom while he mulled over the things he just finished reading. With the camp area having been originally serving as the command center for coordinating the attack on Skynet's core facility. There were not that many resistance soldiers in the camp. Most of the few remaining combatants in the camp had even later been sent out to hunt down the Terminators fleeing the battlefield. So, the only members of the resistance left in the camp were just some high-ranking commanding officers and the few soldiers responsible for guarding the camp or handling the logistics associated with arranging for the needs of all the normal survivors now coming to the camp. Most of the people in the camp were the normal survivors who had originally been hiding the surrounding areas and who had begun to arrive at the camp after they heard John Connor's announcement on whatever radio devices they had. From time to time, military vehicles arrived at the camp. A couple or more soldiers would disembark from each vehicle following which they would sometimes carry a destroyed T-800 out of the vehicle. Sometimes, they would even bring a dead deer or some other larger game out of the vehicle. Caden overheard them talking about how they found so many animals just walking around in the area. The animals seemed to lack any wariness towards the soldiers. So, the soldiers, who almost never had access to such good sources of meat, decided to shoot down the easy prey and bring them back to feed the camp. Only ten minutes after the first groups of soldiers returned from their Terminator hunt, a camp fire had been set up and the mouth-watering smell of roasting meat began to fill the whole camp. The survivors still waiting in the queue to be registered were looking very distracted by the smell, frequently turning around and craning their necks in an attempt to look for the source of the mouth-watering smell. The survivors that had already completed their registration had begun to gather around the soldiers' campfire, their eyes laser-focused on the roasting meat. Many of the kids among them had saliva dribbling down from their little mouths. Even Caden himself began to feel a little hungry. The sound of approaching footsteps startled Caden awake from his thoughts. He turned around and saw Serena coming back from where she went to help Nadia's group with their registration. When they entered the camp, she had volunteered to help Nadia's group with their registration since she was familiar with the resistance's protocols even though she still seemed to be a little out of it. She was still looking a bit down and depressed. Serena sat down beside Caden. She maintained her silence for a while also joining Caden and watching what was happening around the campfire come barbecue place. Caden, what are your plans? What are you going to do next? Serena asked suddenly. After I'm sure that Nadia's group has settled down, I plan to go and look for my former survivor group. My loved ones should still be with them. Caden said, giving an answer that he felt was perfectly normal for someone in his situation. What about you? Will you be staying here? Serena sighed. I don't know. I just asked around. My original teammates are not here. I'm still trying to decide whether I should wait for the resistance soldiers who fought in the battlefield to arrive here so that I can tell them about where my teammates are, or whether it will be better to just go back to my original base directly and look for them there. Caden looked towards the survivor registration area, 
and he realized that Nadia's group were about to complete the registration process. Nadia was already helping the last few kids with their registration. Caden stood up and patted the dust from his pants. All right, it looks like they are almost done. I guess it's time to leave. Just then he heard brisk footsteps approaching them from behind. Immediately, he turned around to see three well-armed soldiers walking towards them. The soldiers came to a stop in front of them, and one of them stepped forward. Come with us. The general wants to see the both of you. The soldier said, Thanks for your support on Patreon, Turtle. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendrix. 11. Chapter 25. General Perry. Come with us. The general wants to see you too. Caden looked around in confusion, but only he and Serena were in the nearby area. Who? Do you mean me and her? Caden said, pointing at himself, and then he pointed at Serena. Yes, you too. The general ordered us to bring the both of you to his command tent. The soldier said. Caden was surprised. He could not think of any reason why their general, whoever he was, would want to see them. Maybe it's because of Serena. He might have discovered that she's one of his soldiers or something. She's part of the resistance after all. Caden thought. He glanced towards Serena with an eyebrow raised, an obviously inquiring look. Serena noticed his glance and she seemed to have realized what he was wondering about, but she only shrugged in answer. Looks like even Serena doesn't know why either. Caden thought, sighing in resignation. All right, we'll come with you. Caden said. He had decided to go and see why this general wanted to see them. There was no need to create any new complications by arguing further with these soldiers. He would soon leave this place anyways. The three soldiers led them to a large army camouflage tent located further inside the camp, at around the central area of the camp. They stopped in front of the tent. The lead soldier announced himself loudly. Sergeant Jacob Rivers reporting, sir. I have brought the two people you wanted to see. Bring them inside. An imposing deep and a little rough sounding voice reached from inside the tent. Come with me. Rivers said, motioning for Caden and Serena to follow after him. He gave his plasma rifle and handgun to his two colleagues to keep for him before he pushed aside the tent flaps and entered into the tent. The other two soldiers who had come here with them waited outside, while Caden and Serena quickly followed after Rivers and walked into the tent. The tent's interior was spacious with most of it occupied by the large conference table around which many high-backed chairs were arranged. A small futuristic-looking device had been placed on top of the table. The device was shaped like a small-sized pyramid. A three-dimensional hologram hovered above the device. The hologram showed Skynet's core facility and the battlefield in front of the facility. Caden could see many tiny people, military vehicles and aircrafts moving about in the hologram. He immediately realized that this hologram was a true representation of what was happening in the area around Skynet's core facility, and it was even in real time. Caden also noticed that there was no currently no fighting going on in the hologram. Ah, the battle has really ended. That announcer had actually not lied. It looks like the resistance truly defeated Skynet. He thought. Caden almost immediately felt like a heavy weight had been lifted from his shoulders. Although he had not been consciously aware of the constant pressure he had been feeling in his subconscious. It was right now that Caden realized that he had always been carrying around the weight of uncertainty about whether he would really be able to escape Skynet's control even. Though he had blustered and proclaimed his free will seemingly with utmost confidence earlier on when he had stood before Skynet. But what had caught Caden's attention the most, and as soon as he stepped inside the tent were the several plasma machine guns he saw inside the tent. The plasma machine guns were mounted on 1.5 meters tall shiny steel gun stands which had been arranged around the sides of the tent in such a way that the gunfire from the guns could reach every spot inside the tent. The guns had swiveled around on their gun stands when the trio of rivers, Caden and Serena stepped into the tent and red light glows appeared at spots on the guns where laser sights would normally be located. Caden's HUD immediately alerted him that he was being scanned for weapons. But he made sure that he looked appropriately scared like would be expected from anyone who had several guns pointed at him, and that there were no other changes in his facial expression that might reveal that he had noticed anything else. 
Anyways, he did not have any reason to worry about the guns. He had left his two now out of ammunition phase plasma rifles back in his truck. Don't worry about them. The guns are only here to serve as a precautionary measure. A voice said. It was the same deep and slightly harsh sounding voice that Caden had heard when he was still outside the tent. Ah. Uh, I forgot. The general. Caden thought. Caden turned around towards the direction where he had heard the voice from. A man seated at the desk positioned about two meters behind the conference and close to the back of the tent. Caden had already noticed the man immediately he entered the tent, but the hologram and the machine guns had soon stolen most of his attention to such an extent that he had completely ignored the man. That was until the man's previous words had made Caden return his full attention back to him. Besides, the placement of the general's desk in a shadowy, poorly lit area which was also behind the large, hovering and also very conspicuous hologram which obstructed Caden's view of him made it easy for anyone to ignore his presence in the tent. As soon as Caden took a proper look at the man sitting at his desk and coolly staring at him from across the tent room, he began to regret that he had ignored the man and that he had not placed his entire attention on the man from the start. The general an early middle-aged black man, looked very imposing. This was both due to his tall height and his muscular physique. Even while remaining seated, the obviously tall height, which Caden judged to be about two meters, and visibly bulging biceps of the general created a strong visual and mental impression in anyone meeting the general for the first time. It screamed that this man was not someone to mess with. I can still beat him up though. Caden thought. On the right side of the general's face was a large tattoo which also added an air of ferocity to the general. But what had created the most mental pressure on Caden was the general's stare. His cool, almost cold, scrutinizing stare. Even after standing before that cold stare for only a short period of time, Caden had begun to feel a little inadequate and less confident. It was almost like the general had the power to stare into his soul. Caden began to have the weird feeling that if he stayed close to the general for too long, the general would be able to look into his soul and uncover all his secrets. Caden realized that he might have made a big mistake. He should have focused his full attention on this man from the beginning instead of allowing himself to be easily distracted by the other things inside the tent. Even though Caden's HUD showed him that the general was carrying a single plasma pistol in his hip holster. Caden still felt like the man was the most dangerous person or thing in the tent right now. Besides, the worst thing was that Caden had now realized that the general had been silently watching, scrutinizing and judging his every single action since the time he had first stepped inside the tent. The general motioned towards the two chairs placed before his desk. Come, sit down. I'm Major General Justin Perry. Field Commander of the 132nd Special Forces Unit of the Resistance. You can just call me General Perry. He then turned to the soldier that had brought Caden and Serena to him and said, Private, you can return to your duties. Thank you. As Caden and Serena sat down on their offered seats, the soldier gave a salute to the general before he left. You are called Caden, correct? General Perry asked, leaning forward and looking Caden straight in the eye. Caden nodded. My men informed me that you came to my camp accompanied by some survivors. Former prisoners is more accurate, I presume. You rescued them from Skynet's core facility and protected them all the way from there until all of you were able to reach here safely, correct? Yes. Caden answered, barely suppressing a frown from appearing on his face. Caden had begun to feel a little uncomfortable about the general's line of questioning. He knew nothing about the general so he had no way of knowing whether the general had noticed something suspicious about him, any of his actions or something his soldiers had told him about Caden, or whether these questions were just the usual routine questions that he asked any interesting strangers, who entered wherever he managed and controlled. Perry continued, You saved and protected so many people including several children. Your journey here must have been very interesting. You must have witnessed part of the battle and you must have also run into some dangerous situations on your way here. Many of my men would not have been able to do the same thing you did as well as you did. Good job, kid. Caden really did not like the direction the conversation was heading. Thanks for your support on Patreon, Turtle. Check out my Patreon to support me, 
at www.patreon.com slash Kendrix. 10. Chapter 26. The General's Offer. Wait no! General, I think you might have misunderstood something. We didn't experience any significant danger on the way here. Most of Skynet's forces were busy fighting against the resistance forces. All we had to do was sneak out of Skynet's facility. We then stole one of the trucks flying around unmonitored in the area and then drove away from that battle zone as fast as we could while skirting the periphery of the battlefield. We were just really lucky that the machines were occupied with fighting the resistance soldiers and so, they were too busy to bother with us. Caden quickly explained. He pushed all credit for the achievement of their successful escape from their imprisonment in Skynet's core facility onto just their purely dumb luck. But as soon as Caden finished explaining, he realized that he had forgotten that Serena who was quietly sitting beside him had been right there all through their journey and had also experienced the same things he experienced. And so, she would definitely notice that he was trying to hide some things from the general. Fuck. Serena was also there. Caden exclaimed with his thoughts. He immediately took a sneaky glance at Serena. But he found her looking at something behind them. She was staring at the floating hologram with her complete focus. Caden released a sigh of relief. It looked like Serena had not been paying attention to Caden and the general's conversation. She had even readjusted the positioning of her chair in order to allow her to see the hologram with much more ease. Relieved that Serena had not heard what he had told the general, Caden turned back to General Perry only to find him looking at Serena while also wearing a frown on his face. The general looked like he really did not appreciate the fact that Serena had not been paying enough attention to the conversation. Caden gave a wry smile. He had almost forgotten that Serena could act like an airhead sometimes. He gave her a small nudge in the side to call her attention back to their conversation. Serena seemed to have noticed General Perry's displeasure. She flashed him one of her brilliant smiles, though this one seemed to be meeker when compared to the smiles she gave Caden. I'm sorry, sir. I apologize for my rude behavior. I haven't seen one of these hologram devices before, so I got a little carried away and became distracted. My unit never had access to this kind of technology. So you are a member of the resistance, correct? Perry asked, looking a little surprised. Yes, sir. Serena Burns, correct? Yes, I see you are wearing a resistance army jacket. I originally assumed that you are just a normal civilian survivor who found the uniform of a deceased resistance soldier. Who is your ranking officer, and how did you come to be part of his group of survivors? The general pointed at Caden as asked the last question. Serena took a deep breath. I was originally serving under Major Maria Graber, but three years ago, a squad of Terminators ambushed me during a recon mission. They captured me and then took me to Skynet's core facility where I was imprisoned. I remained a prisoner there until today when I regained my freedom. General Perry nodded. Maria Graber. I believe she's now known as Colonel Graber. She should be part of the main attacking force on the battlefield. The situation around the battlefield has been very chaotic since when the battle ended, so I can't tell you where exactly Colonel Graber is right now. I don't even know whether she is still on the battlefield. You can wait here in the camp for the situation over there to settle down. I should be able to help you meet up with her. Serena did not say anything. She only nodded in agreement. And you too, Perry said to Caden. You can stay here in the camp, rescuing all those people from Skynet's core facility and bringing them here with all of them safe and unharmed. That must have taken a lot of effort from you even if you were very lucky. It shows you have some grit and leadership skills. Why don't you join us in the resistance? We could use someone like you. Caden froze. General Perry's sudden offer to recruit him into the resistance had surprised him. Although Caden was flattered that the general had a high opinion of him, he immediately rejected the offer. Thank you for the offer, sir. But unfortunately, I will have to refuse. I don't think I will be able to join the resistance right now. I need to go and look for my family and friends. We got separated on the day I was captured by Skynet's machines. I have not seen them since then. I don't even know whether they are alive or dead. I need to find them first before I can do anything else. Sigh, maybe I will join the resistance after I have reunited with them. Caden even feigned a sad and depressed look when he got towards the end. Okay then. How long will you be staying here? Perry asked. 
I plan to leave right as soon as we are done with this conversation. I will continue on my way after I say goodbye to the people I came here with. Caden answered. You don't want to wait till morning before leaving? Caden shook his head. He would already be on his way right now if he had been stuck here having this conversation with the general. All right, you can leave whenever you want, but I have another offer for you. I know that you drove here in one of Skynet's personnel transport trucks. Since you plan to travel around and look for your loved ones, I believe you will definitely run into many damaged or even completely destroyed roads and other kinds of rough terrains which can be pretty difficult to traverse for such a large personnel transport truck. I would like to trade with you. Sell your truck to us. The resistance has many places where it could be put to good use. And in exchange, I will give you a four-seater all-terrain armored car. It will be much smaller than your truck but that size should be more suitable for your travels. Don't worry, the vehicle will also be powered by a plasma reactor like your truck, so you will not have to worry about its power running out anytime soon. In addition to that, I will add in some food supplies and some changes of clothes for your travels. Especially the clothes, I think you will need those. When Perry said those last words, Caden took a quick glance at his ragged clothes, and he became painfully aware of the poor state of his clothing. He became a little embarrassed. Lastly, Perry continued, I will also give you a token you can present to any resistance checkpoint to show that you're a friend of the resistance. It should help reduce the amount of scrutiny you will have to withstand from most of the resistance soldiers that you might encounter during your travels. That is only as long as you don't do anything wrong. Caden considered the general's offer for a short time before he made his decision. All right, I accept your offer. You can have the truck. The general was right. The truck was not the really right kind of vehicle for his plans, while a smaller and more maneuverable vehicle would be more appropriate for his journey. This was especially so with the addition of the token which would clear away a lot of potentially problematic situations that might result when he inevitably runs into resistance. Members, as the victors in their war against the machines and the current most powerful force in the world, the resistance should become much more active in the open from now on. He would definitely run into some of them during his travels. Besides, Caden appreciated the extra food supplies that he would get from the general. He had started to feel some hunger since the time he broke out of that weird time stagnation effect. So, the food supplies should be very useful for his plans. Caden suddenly remembered something. General, can you add some guns and ammo to the supplies you will give me? I'm sorry that will not be part of the trade. Weapons can be given to people who aren't members of the resistance. Perry said. Caden shrugged. Okay, no problem. Didn't hurt to ask though. I guess my two guns will remain out of commission for a while longer. I've still got my fists anyway. Caden thought. Good, we are done here. General Perry said, standing up. The general still wore his usual stern look on his face not giving Caden any hints on whether he was pleased that Caden had agreed to his offer. He then gave Caden the so-called token which looked like a steel coin with the symbol of the human resistance embossed on both of its faces. The general extended his hand for a handshake. I will have Sergeant Rivers ready your new car. Your promised extra supplies will be placed inside. You can meet him and get the car from him whenever you are ready to leave. Also, make sure to take anything you left in your former truck before you leave. Remember to present yourself to any resistance camp or station close to you when you are ready to join us. And Ms. Burns, you should rest up for the rest of the day. Tomorrow, I will find some tasks for you to do while you wait for when you can be reunited with your commanding officer. All right, you can go now. Tell Sergeant Rivers to come in. Caden and Serena both nodded as they shook hands with the general before walking out of the tent. After they informed the private that the general wanted to see him, Caden and Serena were walking back to the section of the camp, which was located just after the camp entrance, that had been set aside for the normal survivors and which was also where Nadia's group were, when Serena stopped walking forwards. Caden noticed this and also paused in his steps, wanting to ask why she had stopped. You lied. You hid some things from the general. Serena said. Caden froze. Fuck. She was actually listening to our conversation then? Thanks for your support on Patreon, Turtle. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendricks. 11.
Chapter 27, RA 115. Fuck. She was actually listening to our conversation then. Caden thought. Caden's mind was racing, searching for an excuse to give, but he did not get the opportunity to say anything. That was a smart move. It's good you didn't tell the general too much about what we experienced during our journey here. Many higher-ups in the resistance can be too paranoid sometimes, and so there's a chance that he may have misunderstood something you said if you had told him too much, Serena said. Okay, that's what I thought too. Caden quickly said, Phew, that worked out well I guess. Caden thought. At this time, Caden and Serena had already returned to the open space which was located just before the camp's entrance, and which served as the section of the camp where the survivors were gathered. The soldiers seemed to have finished roasting several portions of the game they had brought back, and they had apportioned some of it to the survivors who were already done with their registration. The survivors had settled down around the soldiers' camp fire, and they were happily munching their roast meat. A blissful expression on each and everyone's face as they savored the juicy and tasty meat with oil running down their mouths. An atmosphere of relaxed levity filled the whole place. Here, have some. I saved some roast meat for you. A smiling Nadia said, presenting a plate of roast meat to Caden and Serena. Nadia seemed to have been keeping an eye out for them, and so she had noticed as soon as they returned. Thanks. Have you guys finished your registration? Caden asked as he took the plate from Nadia and began to share the roast meat with Serena. Caden took a bite of the roast meat, and he almost moaned out loud as his taste buds were assaulted by a wave of extremely pleasurable taste sensations. Caden was surprised by what he was experiencing. The roast meat barely had any seasoning, having only been seasoned with salt. But his taste buds seemed to be working on overdrive and magnifying the taste of what he was eating. And so, he quickly finished his share of the food while also craving for even more roast meat. Yes, the last of us finished just a little while ago. Nadia said, breaking Caden out of his food-induced brain fog. I looked for you too when we were done, but I couldn't find you anywhere. A kind soldier then told us that you went to meet with the camp leader. So, I got some extra food for you. I'm aware that you too must also be hungry like the rest of us. Oh, I hope the camp leader did not give you any trouble. Nah, he just wanted us to join the resistance. Caden said, shaking his head. That's good. Nadia smiled. Then she said with some excitement. So, I guess that means you both will also be staying here with the rest of us? Caden shook his head. No, sorry. I won't be staying. I need to go and look for my family and friends. I plan to leave right about now. Sigh. Too bad but I understand. You should go and find your loved ones. You have already done more than enough to help protect mine. Nadia said, patting Caden on the shoulder. But you should wait for a little bit more. Come and eat with us, and let us say our goodbyes properly. I'm sure the rest of the group would love to see you one last time before you leave. Especially the children. I seriously doubt that last part. Those kids must have probably been traumatized by my rough driving. Caden thought wryly as Nadia led them over to where the rest of her group were seated around the campfire. This is your new vehicle, Private Rivers said. Thirty minutes later, Caden stood in front of a black four-seater armored car parked just outside the camp's entrance. This armored car was what the general had promised him for his truck, or he should now call it his former truck. This is the RA-115 Resistance Army All-Terrain Combat Vehicle, Private Rivers continued. High speed, fast acceleration and good maneuverability. Its body can withstand many plasma rifle shots before it sustains any significant damage. While its windshield and all the glass windows are completely bulletproof and can stop normal large caliber bullets. This combat vehicle model is one of the best within the resistance army. The general really gave you this vehicle? Caden walked around the vehicle as Private River spoke on, examining it carefully and he immediately noticed the bags of supplies placed on the back seats of the car. He even entered the car and checked its interiors. The vehicle looked way less futuristic than his former truck, lacking some of the truck's more advanced features like its smart transparent screen windshield and its external camera feeds. But when Caden started the car's ignition, the vehicle's engine ran silently like his original truck proving that the general had not lied about the vehicle's engine being powered by a plasma reactor.
Caden turned to Serena who was standing in front of the vehicle. After he had said goodbye to Nadia's group, Serena had chosen to follow him and come out here with him to see him receive his new vehicle. Caden had originally expected that she would stay behind with the rest of Nadia's group since she would be staying in the camp with them. He had already said his goodbye to her, so that would be a normal thing for her to do. But to his surprise, Serena had said that she wanted to come with him to see his new car. Although Caden was a little surprised, he quickly agreed and did not place too much thought into it. It seemed to Caden that Serena wanted to stay close to him right until the moment when drives away from camp. And Caden really likes that. It showed that his charms had finally begun to work on Serena and that she had begun to warm up to him. Unfortunately, even with all that, they would still have to go on their separate ways today. There was nothing he could do about that. He really needed some space and a lot of alone time in order to find himself and figure out who he really was. But Caden still hoped to see Serena again at some time in the future. Caden could admit to himself that he found her attractive. But who wouldn't? Even those soldiers we met when we arrived here couldn't take their eyes off of her. Caden thought, consoling himself. Serena was a very attractive woman with whom he had shared many scary but exciting experiences so him being attracted to her was understandable. Caden thought that if he judged based on the fact that he had first awakened only several hours ago, and the fact that he did not have any memories of his past life experiences, it would be appropriate and technically perfectly accurate for him to claim that he had known Serena for most of his life. And that would be him being perfectly honest. Anyway, it was good that Serena was warming up to him, as long as she liked him even a little. Maybe he could work something out in the future. Who knows? Besides, he could always search for her within the resistance. Caden shook his head to clear his thoughts. What do you think? Caden asked, pointing at the vehicle. It's all right. The general did not try to cheat you. Serena said. Of course, the general would not do something like that. Don't insult the gen. Private said hotly, angered by Serena's words. All right, all right. Sheesh, she didn't mean it like that. Aren't you guys colleagues or something? Caden said placatingly. Serena just gave a non-committal shrug. It will work. Thank you. Caden said as he shook hands with Private Rivers. After shaking hands with Private Rivers, Caden turned around to say his final goodbyes to Serena. But she was no longer standing in her usual spot in front of the car. The loud bang sound of the car's door closing made Caden turn back to look at the car. He was shocked to find that Serena was now seated on the driver's seat of his new vehicle. What the, what are you doing sitting in the car? I was just about to say that it was now time for us both to part ways with each other. Caden said. Serena gave him a look of impatience. Stop talking nonsense. You are wasting time. Get in. I'm coming with you. Serena said, opening the door on the shotgun side for Caden. Has he left? General Justin Perry asked Private Rivers who had just returned to the General Operation Command tent to give his report. Yes, sir. He left about five minutes ago. Perry said. What about the woman? Serena Burns? What is she doing inside the camp right now? She left with him. Perry stopped what he was writing and looked up at the soldier. She left? Did she say when she would be returning to the camp? No, sir. Perry tapped his pen on his desk absentmindedly, looking like he was lost in his thoughts. But after only a brief time, he stopped his tapping. He seemed to have made his decision. Find those prisoners that came here with Caden and Serena and interrogate them. Be gentle but thorough. Make sure each and every one of them is questioned separately. Find out how they escaped from Skynet's core facility and everything that had happened on their way here. That's all. You can go now. Private saluted the general and left. Perry stared at the holograph of Cheyenne Mountain hovering in the air for some time before he pressed the button on his radio communication device. And when the device showed that the communication line was now connected, Perry said, Find out whether Colonel Maria Graber is still within the designated battle zone. If she's still there, inform her that I want to speak with her right now. Yes, General, sir, said a voice that came out of the device. Thanks for your support on Patreon, Turtle. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash I am posting extra Terminator, new fake prequel chapters, 
character backstories and side stories, and chapters from my new original novel The Last Primordial Exarch on my Patreon. 13. Chapter 28. Serena's Hideout, Part 1. Hey guy. I'm back I guess. How have you all been? I hope the new year is treating you guys well. Here is a new chapter. Enjoy. After a short 10 minute trip, the RA 115 armored car came to a stop close to the center of a dark, deserted suburban town located some distance away from the city ruins where the resistance camp was situated. The armored vehicle's doors opened and Caden and Serena stepped out. Caden glanced around his surroundings with curiosity, his eyesight unbothered by the darkness of night. Serena had explained that she had a hideout located close by where she had hidden some supplies which she used to use during her field missions in the area before Skynet's forces had captured her. Soon after they had got into the armored car and had just driven a few meters away from the resistance camp, Serena had told Caden about the hideout she had hidden in a town located close by, and she had also said that she wanted to get some of her things from the hideout, so she had asked for his help. She wanted him to drive her there and back with his car before he continued on with the rest of his journey. You will be taking the truck with you on your next journey, so you just have to drive me there and then bring me back. It won't take too long I promise. Pretty please. Serena had said with a pleading smile. Serena had promised him that the whole trip would not take too long, so he had no qualms about offering this final piece of help before their final parting. Anyways, Caden was not really in too much of a hurry, so he had quickly agreed. Besides, she had also offered to allow him to take some of the things stored in her hideout that might be useful to him during his future travels. From what Caden could see and from the types of buildings, the usual bungalow-style family houses commonly found in suburban American towns, in the area, he judged that this small town should have been a suburb in the past. But just like the other places Caden had seen, including the ruined city where the previous resistance camp was situated, this place was now deserted. It was a ghost town. Still the town was in a relatively better condition than Caden had expected based on the conditions of the other places that he had seen and based on the general knowledge about the world that he had in his memories. Unlike the buildings in the ruined city where the previous resistance camp was situated which looked like the products of a city ravaged by a disastrous war. The houses in this town were relatively intact. Although the whole town was completely overgrown with weeds and other wild plants which flowering luxuriantly due to it still being springtime and none of the houses still having anything which could be called a lawn, the buildings here seemed to have suffered way less damage than Caden had expected. Still, as far as Caden could see and from the heavy silence that the whole town was cloaked in, the town seemed to have been emptied of its last human inhabitants a very long time ago. Caden followed behind Serena as she walked into one of the houses in the center of the town. The house was the one building in this part of the town which was in the worst state of repair, with the roof having caved in partially, and with vines growing all over the walls. Some vines had even grown through the windows and seemed to have spread inside some rooms in the house. This is a good place for a hideout. Caden thought as he followed Serena inside the house, walking through the front doorway which was missing its door. After his brief observation of the houses in this area, he had figured out why Serena had chosen to locate her hideout inside this particular building out of all the other houses. In this area of this deserted suburban town, Caden had realized that with the state the house was currently in, which was so much worse than that of the rest of the houses surrounding it, most visitors to the towns, whether scavenging human survivors or even the machines, would be more likely to choose to ignore the house and instead choose to check out some of the other houses which were in much better conditions and would more suitable buildings for whatever they wanted to do. Serena strode through the interior of the house, heading straight for where the entrance of the cellar was located. Caden followed close behind her, but he had subconsciously slowed down his walking pace as he passed through some of the rooms in the house. His eyes had been attracted to the many things inside the house the dust-covered furniture which looked like they had not been used in years, the TV with the broken screen, and especially the family pictures, in dusty picture frames, still hanging on the walls or placed on top the shelf by the side of the room. These things, like the many other things that he had seen since his awakening, filled him with childlike curiosity. Although Caden had immediately recognized most of these things when he saw them, 
he still did not have any memories of him having personally seen them before. So, it could be said that since his awakening, he was technically seeing most of things he had seen for the first time ever. Still, Caden made sure to keep pace with Serena and also made sure not to make his excessive curiosity towards the things he was seeing too obvious. They soon stood before the large empty bookshelf that Serena pushed to the side to reveal a door. Caden judged that she had placed it in front of the cellar door in order to make it much more hidden from sight and make the cellar that she used as her hideout to be much less likely to be discovered by other people. They walked down the stairs into the cellar, their feet immediately stirring up a small dust cloud from the dusty floor. Thanks for your support on Patreon, Turtle, Raymond Chalice, Jock Jock. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash kendricks. I am now posting extra Terminator, new fate prequel chapters, character backstories and side stories, and chapters from my new original novel The Last Primordial Exarch on my Patreon. 10. Chapter 29. Serena's Hideout, Part 2. They walked down the stairs into the cellar, their feet immediately stirring up a small dust cloud from the dusty floor. There were three wooden boxes crates, placed in the middle of the small cellar. The three boxes were arranged in a stack with one placed on top of the other. The largest box had been placed on the floor, the medium-sized one placed on top of it, and the smallest box placed at the top of the stack. The three wooden boxes were the only things inside the cellar with exception of the many broken wood pieces littering the cellar floor and a lone bookshelf at the back of the cellar. Serena walked up to the stack of boxes and slowly caressed the topmost box. She took back her hand and her fingers came away with a thick layer of dust, a result of all the dust that had accumulated all through the years on the surfaces of the boxes, the walls, the floors, everything in the cellar. It's been such a long time, hasn't it? Serena muttered with a sigh. She then turned to Caden and said, There are weapons, ammunition, food rations, a few changes of clothes but you should ignore those. It's all women's clothing meant for me to wear, and other supplies stored in these boxes. I kept anything I thought I might need to use during my missions in the field. You can come check them. Take whatever you want from the boxes. Consider this my way of repaying you for all the help you gave me during our escape from Skynet's core facility, and also for agreeing to drive me here to my hideout. Weapons and ammo, you say? Great. Don't mind if I dig in. Caden said, he was excited at the unexpected opportunity to finally replace his currently exhausted phased plasma rifle ammunition. Besides, he might even be able to add a couple more weapons to his current arsenal. So, he rushed to the box stack and quickly began to lift up and then place each box separately on the floor. Having completed this task, Caden rubbed his hands together excitedly as he thoughtfully considered which box to open and check first. But Serena's voice suddenly interrupted his thoughts. While you help yourself to the supplies you need, I need to check my hidden safe to make sure the sensitive documents inside are still intact, Serena said before Caden heard her mutter. Though, I think the intel contained in those documents must have become irrelevant after so many years. She then walked towards the single large wooden shelf, which held a couple of random oddities, and pushed to the back wall of the cellar. She pushed the shelf aside to reveal the door of a small hidden safe built into the cellar wall. Caden nodded absent-mindedly to Serena's words. His full attention was occupied with the boxes. He soon opened the first box, having decided to start with the smallest box. Inside the smallest box, he found many army rations packs, protein bars and several plastic water bottles which Caden found to still be filled with water. The water in the bottles and the protein bars should have gone bad already after so many years of storage. M.M. I don't think I really need anything in this box. I have already received enough food supplies from the resistance camp. But I should take some dry rations for contingencies. Caden thought before moving on to the next box. Inside the second box, he found an assortment of random tools of all kinds which include a hammer and nails, climbing ropes several handcuffs and even a pair of binoculars which seemed to have night vision capability, which found out when he took it out to test it. Nice. Although I doubt it, let's see if she will allow me to keep the binoculars. Anyways, I don't think I actually need this. My eyes are capable enough. 
I suppose it might be useful for hiding my enhanced abilities. Caden thought as he returned the binoculars to the box. This is the last box and the one with the weapons. Caden thought as he raised the lid of the last and also the largest box. Caden was most excited to see what he would find in this particular box. And he was not disappointed by what he found inside the box. Mostly. The large size of the box was mostly needed to hold the long sniper rifle with all its accessories attached. There were also several assault rifles and handguns, a shotgun and five hand grenades. The rest of the box space was packed full with ammunition boxes and magazines. But Caden noticed one problem. All of the weapons and ammunitions were gunpowder based weapons and ammunitions. There's not a single plasma weapon here. Caden muttered, shaking his head in disappointment. Hey, there are no plasma weapons here. I can't find any plasma ammo packs either. Caden called out. That's because I have them here with me. Serena's voice suddenly came from behind Caden, and the coldness of the voice slightly startled him. He had been so laser focused on the boxes that he had not heard her return. Caden was just about to turn around to face Serena when she spoke again, and this time, her voice had turned ice cold. Don't move! I will shoot you if you do a single thing without my say so. Caden froze in step as he heard the familiar sound of plasma gunfire, and almost immediately, he felt something extremely hot fly past him just a few centimeters beside his head with the heat even singeing his right ear. The plasma shot then burned a hole into the cellar wall in front of Caden. Now raise your hands, and then turn around slowly. Serena ordered, still a little shocked and confused at this sudden turn of events. Caden complied with her instructions, and making sure he was moving slowly, he turned to face her. And so, Caden soon came face to face with a cold-looking and expressionless Serena. She stood about three meters away from him, and she was holding two guns, one in each hand. Caden's HUD, which had, as it had always done, turned on automatically as soon as he had felt threatened, immediately identified the gun held in her left hand to be a gunpowder-based handgun a Sterum 9A2 pistol, and the gun held in her right hand to be a phase plasma pistol, and the two guns were currently aimed straight at Caden's head. What the hell? Caden thought with shock. Serena did not wait for Caden to open his mouth, say anything or ask any questions. She immediately declared. I know you are not human. Caden's pupils shrank. Serena quickly continued. What are you? And think carefully before you answer my question. Your answer will determine whether you live or die. Fuck. Caden thought. Thanks for your support on Patreon. Turtle, Raymond Chalice, Jock Jock. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendrix. I am now posting extra Terminator, new fate prequel chapters, character backstories and side stories, and chapters from my new original novel The Last Primordial Exarch on my Patreon. 12. Chapter 30, Interrogation, Threat Detected, Weapon, 1 Plasma Pistol, 1 Stair M9A2 Handgun, Threat Assessment Slash Danger Level High, Action Terminate, I guess I couldn't hide it in the end, fuck, anyways everything's still alright I guess, she shouldn't have any reason that would make her take me as her enemy, Caden thought as he stood before Serena with his hands raised up in surrender, yeah you are right, I'm technically not human, I have both human and machine body parts. Caden admitted. A hybrid. No wonder. Serena mused as she was nodding to herself. Yes that. But first, tell me. How did you figure out my true identity? Serena motioned with her gun for Caden to move away slowly from the crates. Serena then said. I have to admit that you did put in a lot of effort while trying to hide your identity from everyone. But during our escape journey from the facility and as I spent more time in the group with you, I realized that even though you always tried to not do anything that might be seen as suspicious by the other people in the group, you also seemed to be ignorant about a lot of things. So, even though you tried your best, you still unknowingly made a lot of mistakes. And so, over time, I was able to notice some suspicious things about you. Yeah, I figured as much. I had that fear from the beginning. Caden thought, sighing. She continued. Firstly, it had started with little things like how you were able to spend such a long time away from the group seemingly holding back the groups of hunter-killers and terminator without dying. 
You had even returned to the group without seeming to have suffered any wounds even though your clothes looked like it had suffered some damage. I even suspect that you had abandoned pieces of your clothes in order to protect yourself from even more suspicions. Secondly, when we finally got out of the facility, you were able to stock the truck so easily. You might not be aware, but that was something that would have actually been impossible for anybody who had not been given an authorization from Skynet to be able to do so. Even the most technically savvy people among the resistance would have needed to spend a lot of time or use a specialized high-tech hacking and cracking device in order to be able to reprogram and unlock one of Skynet's trucks. Ah, uh, the truck. Skynet must have already added me to its database and given me some level of authorization as a part of its machine force. Caden thought. He knew that there was no way he could have avoided making that mistake with how he was still missing so much of his memories which had greatly impacted the amount of knowledge he currently had. During the journey, I also witnessed several displays of your exceptional senses and reaction speed, especially when the HK Ario was chasing the truck. But the most damning evidence was when I saw the numerous thin, black metal threads that looked very similar to Skynet's more advanced liquid metal mimetic polyalloy technology that had extended out from all over your hands and had then pierced into the steering wheel of the truck. At that time, you had looked like you were in a very excited mental state which had made you become so completely oblivious to a lot of things happening in your surroundings that you had not noticed me observing you. And with that, Serena ended her speech. But soon after she looked a little absent-minded as she muttered to herself as her voice trailed off. And that feeling, that should have been impossible, I have been getting from him from the beginning. She murmured softly. Soon after, Serena's eyes became clear and then took on a narrowed look before she said. And finally, there is this other thing. She aimed her stare M9A2 handgun at Caden's right thigh and fired. What the F? Caden shouted, shocked at the sudden change. Serena frowned when she saw the bullet that she had just shot had barely penetrated the skin of Caden's thigh, and then the small, negligible wound had quickly pushed out the bullet and had begun to close up. So, she immediately switched over to using her plasma pistol instead, aiming it at the same thigh and firing. Fuck! Come on! Why did you shoot me in the leg again? Caden screamed out in pain. He almost lost control and attacked her right then and there, but he barely managed to restrain himself. Serena had just shot him in his right thigh with her plasma pistol, but unlike what had happened with when she had used her stair handgun this time, the shot from the plasma pistol had burned a large wound into Caden's thigh and had even exposed his silver-white metal femur, his thigh bone, underneath. I had to obtain my final confirmation that you're really not a normal human. And I was right. You really aren't human. Serena said. She then mocked him by wagging a finger at him. Besides, I also noticed the sudden tensing of your leg muscles. Were you trying to attack me or something? TSK TSK TSK. Don't try anything funny with me. I can always tell. And I will always notice whenever you want to act against me before you can complete the action. So, getting back to my case. Just as Serena was about to continue with her questions. Caden felt that he should consider this situation as being more like an interrogation session at this point. Wait. He interrupted. He forgot for an instant that Serena was currently holding him at gunpoint and lowered his hand to make a stop hand gesture at her. Serena tooted, looking a little irritated, and immediately waved her guns at him to bring back his attention to the fact that she was still holding him at gunpoint. I just revealed to you that I know you are not actually a human. Why are you acting so calmly? A normal person would be freaking out right now. You look like you are still able to have emotions or am I wrong to think so? Aren't you worried that you've given me a very good reason to kill you right here and right now? Serena asked. Caden shook his head. No, I'm not worried. I don't think you will kill me. At least not for that reason. Why do you think so? Are you underestimating my resolve? Do you think I have any hang-ups about killing you right now? No, I didn't mean it that way. I'm sure your threats are very serious. I just don't believe you will kill me for having a connection to Skynet. Caden looked Serena straight in the eye and declared, I'm sure of this because you are like me. You aren't a normal human yourself. And I seriously doubt that you are really a normal resistance fighter either. 
Serena's hands tightened on her guns when Caden said those words. The two people, one holding the other at gunpoint, stared at each other in complete silence for a few seconds. Then a slight smile appeared on Serena's face, breaking her original cold, ruthless expression. So, before you continue, I think there's a little misunderstanding going on here that we should sort out immediately. I don't think you really have the moral high ground to act so angry just because I hid some things about me from you, Caden said. I believe it's now my turn for you to be honest with me. What do you mean by that? Serena asked, looking a little puzzled. I mean that I know the secret you are hiding. You're actually like me. Caden paused and said, enunciating each word in the sentence for emphasis. You, too, are not fully human. Thanks for your support on Patreon. Turtle, Raymond Chalice, Jock DJOK, Heller8284. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendricks. I am now posting extra Terminator, new fake prequel chapters, character backstories and side stories, and chapters from my new original novel The Last Primordial Exarch on my Patreon. 10. April Fool's Day Special Chapter Baba Yaga Part 1 Three armored military vehicles, emblazoned with the symbol of the human resistance and the resistance army, burst into the gates of the remote Skynet base and drove into the compound, and proceeded to stop in the open area in front of the main building in the base. The vehicles had entered in a single file formation, but the three armored vehicles came to a stop when they were some distance from the building, a distance of about 10 meters. Away from the large bay door that served as the entrance of the two-story building, the two armored vehicles following behind the first one immediately spread out on either side of the leading vehicle, and all the vehicles finally came to a stop standing side by side in a single line beside one another with the first armored vehicle in the middle of the formation. All the four doors on each of the armored vehicles opened and many stern, serious and tough-looking soldiers in resistance army uniforms rushed out and immediately took cover around the vehicles while also aiming their modified plasma rifles at both the closed bay door and the several glass and metal windows of the main building. Two men stepped out in front of the two front doors of the armored vehicle in the middle. One of the two men, who was also the driver of the first armored vehicle, was Barnes. He was one of the high-ranking officers in the resistance army and also a fighter in the tech community. He was also one of John Connor's closest friends. He was a tall, muscular black man. After he had taken aim at the building from where he had taken cover behind the open door of driver's side of the armored vehicle, he... Like the rest of the soldiers who had come out of the three armored vehicles, looked towards the second man, and seemed to be waiting for further instructions on how to proceed from him. John, what's your order? It seems like we came a bit late. The fight has already started. Barnes asked the second man. The second man was John Connor. He was the current leader of the human resistance, and a man who was admired and revered by most of the remnants of humanity as a legendary hero and the destined savior of humanity from the subjugation of the machines. John Connor was also a tall man who looked like he was in his early forties, but the thing that most people meeting him for the first time would notice first about him was the large, prominent scar that covered a substantial area on the left side of his face. John had the hard look of a man who had experienced and survived many difficult and challenging situations in his life. He seemed to have a charisma and charm about him which made the center of attention of all the soldiers arranged around him. His charisma did not seem to be even slightly hampered by the intense, intimidating aura, the tales of glorious feats he had accomplished while he led humanity in their war against the machines had greatly boosted this charismatic and intimidating aura, which he also had around him. John Connor stood calmly beside the armored vehicle not even bothering to take cover as he scanned his surroundings. He had already noticed the strangeness in this hidden and remote Skynet base even before the rest of the soldiers. He had expected their armored vehicles to encounter a lot of plasma gunfire from the Terminators, Hunter Killers and the other defense facilities in the base, but their entrance had been unexpectedly peaceful and uneventful. The base seemed to be empty of the machines. The only sign of machine presence that John noticed in the whole base came from the large, two-story main building that occupied about 80% of the space in the small base. As he observed the main building, 
He soon figured out what was happening in the base and the reason why they had not encountered any armed resistance during their entrance into the base from the things he could see happening inside the main building through the few glass windows of the second floor of the building. He could see several shadowy silhouettes moving about or running from place to place inside both the first and second floors of the building. He could also see and hear the frequent flashes of light and the sounds made by plasma weapons and loud noises from large objects falling down or crashing into other objects. The things he was seeing and hearing made it very obvious to him and the rest of the soldiers outside that a fierce battle was currently ongoing inside the second floor of the building. Surprisingly, from the arrangement and movements of the silhouettes, John quickly judged that the ongoing battle seemed to have involved all the machine forces in the base, and they seemed to be fighting against only a single person who was taking on the entire squad of Terminators and Hunter Killers. He raised his hand and gestured for the soldiers to remain in place. Everyone, don't move, we will all wait here. Stay where you are, but make sure to maintain your focus and aim. John, don't we need to go in? I thought we came here to rescue the high-value target. Won't he be in danger if we just wait here and do nothing? Barnes asked, frowning. Thanks for your support on Patreon. Turtle, Raymond Chalice, Jock DJOK, Heller8284. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendricks. I am now posting extra Terminator, new fake prequel chapters, character backstories and side stories, and chapters from my new original novel The Last Primordial Exarch on my Patreon. 6. April Fool's Day Special Chapter, Baba Yaga Part 2. He too had stepped out from behind cover when he saw that they were currently not being attacked, and like John Connor, he too was now relaxedly standing beside the armored vehicle. John Connor gestured towards the building and what was happening inside the building. The battle inside had proceeded on to the corner of the building where the stairs to the ground, first, floor was located. The fighting, between all the participants involved, had continued down the stairs and then into the first floor. As you can see, a fight has already broken out inside the main building which means the high-value target has already awakened from his long cryosleep. He must be a little confused about his current circumstances. So... We might cause some misunderstanding between us if we rush in too hastily. And I wouldn't want to get into a battle with him due to some misunderstanding that had made him consider us to be his enemies, John said to Barnes before continuing cryptically. Besides, we'll only get in his way if we go in right now. What do you mean by that? Common man, you still haven't explained to me clearly what we are really doing here. You just rushed all of us along on the way out here with your brief explanation that we need to go and rescue a presumably very important high-priority target in a small, remote Skynet base that you had suddenly obtained intel about. I mean, I trust you, brother, and I have always trusted your judgment, but you still haven't told me who this person, our target, is, and why he is so important to us and is a priority target for the resistance. Barnes complained. Although Barnes seemed like he was complaining about the mission, John knew that the reason he had asked these questions was really for the benefit of the rest of the soldiers. He understood his friend wanted to provide him the opportunity to explain his objective in this operation to the soldiers who had been dragged out of their beds so early in the morning to travel a long distance in the cold in order to get to this small, remote Skynet base hidden in the woods. A slight smile hidden from the view of the soldiers arranged some distance beside and behind him, briefly appeared on John's face. He gave a subtle nod to Barnes and began to explain the circumstance of the operation to the soldiers. Just yesterday, I received an intel from the intelligence division that they had discovered some clues from some recovered Skynet database about a hidden, semi-abandoned Skynet base where a human man who had special talents had been stored in cryostasis since the prejudgment era until now. When I read the intel document containing information about some of the man's former feats, and saw the name of the man, I immediately recognized the man's name. I knew who the man was because the man had been famous, or infamous if you ask some people, back in the day, and due to that, I had heard about some of his legendary feats on the news back in the day. That's why I made all of us immediately rush here to rescue and wake him up as soon as possible. John Connor then turned to look at his soldiers and said, I assure you all, 
He will be very useful in our war against the machines, and you will soon witness it for yourselves. So let's just wait here. Since he's already awake, this small group of machines won't be able to stop him. Isn't he just one man? And I guess he shouldn't have undergone any enhancements, modifications or augmentations, right? So how will he survive under the attacks of the machines in this base? Barnes asked doubtfully. John looked around and he saw Barnes' doubtful expression mirrored on the faces of the rest of the soldiers. He could understand why they could not easily accept the truth of his words. There were only extremely few humans that could go up against the Terminator or hunter-killer squad on their own and survive the encounter. And most of these exceptional humans had also undergone enhancements and modifications of some kind. Just wait a little bit longer, and you will understand. This man isn't some ordinary human. He is John Wick. Back in the day, some people called him the Boogeyman. But those who knew him better knew him as the man who you sent to kill the fucking Boogeyman. John explained. Damn, that's some serious reputation. Barnes chimed in. John Connor continued. John Wick is a man of focus, commitment, and sheer will. Something I greatly admired about him when I heard about his legends back then. And hear this. He once killed three men in a bar with a pencil. While John Connor was still speaking, the battle happening inside the building had carried on down the stairs and into the ground floor. Plasma gunfire had shot several holes through a couple of windows on the ground floor, and through these holes, brief glimpses of the fighting could be seen from time to time. Through these brief glimpses, John Connor could see a single man move with quick, efficient movements from place to place inside the building while also taking out HKs and Terminators one after the other with extremely accurate and well-placed gunshots, many of which were instant kill headshots from a plasma weapon he had acquired either from somewhere and inside the building or from one of the Terminators he had destroyed. John watched as the number of silhouettes moving inside were decreasing rapidly as they were being destroyed by the man they were fighting. Barely one minute after the fighting entered the ground floor, only the last one among the group of Terminators remained and was still fighting the man. The man and the machine moved behind the large metal bay door, and because of that, the final part of the man's gunfight with the last Terminator. Suddenly, the bay door began to rise up from the ground. The bay door seemed to have been activated and being opened from the inside. And just when the bay door had risen only a little distance, the decapitated head of AT-800 Terminator rolled out through the space that had been created under the rising bay door. The decapitated Terminator head, which was still releasing some electric sparks, drew the attention of all the resistance soldiers waiting outside as it came to a stop about three meters in front of the building. The bay door opened fully with a light clatter, and a man strode out of the building. He was a tall man with long neck-length hair, and he was wearing a black suit. He wiped off the dirt staining his suit, and was readjusting it on his body with his left hand. And he also held a phased plasma rifle in his right hand as he walked out of the building. He wiped away the blood staining his mouth with his left hand as he scanned his surroundings and quickly noticed the soldiers arrayed outside. Where is this place? Who the hell are you people? Are you working for the high table? John would call out to resistant soldiers. Through the open door behind the man, John, and the rest of his men, judging from the gasps he heard coming from Barnes and the other soldiers standing around him, could see the totally wrecked interior of the main building and the bodies of several destroyed terminators that were lying down motionless and inactive on the floor inside the building. Everybody relax. Don't say or do anything without my command. John told his soldiers, and then he turned to the man in the black suit and said calmly, No, Mr. Wick, we are not working for the high table. The legends are true. Barnes, bring out the puppy sleeping on the back seat of the vehicle. I brought it here as my gift to him. John Connor hurriedly said to Barnes, then he whispered to himself slightly in awe. Baba, Yaga, everyone, happy April Fool's Day. Thanks for your support on Patreon. Turtle, Raymond Chalice, Jock DJ OK, Heller 8284. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendricks. I am now posting Extra Terminator. New Fate prequel chapters, character backstories and side stories, and chapters from my new original novel The Last Primordial Exarch on my Patreon. 6. 
Chapter 31 Skynet's Air You are not human, so you really did notice something? When was it? Should be back when that explosion happened at the Skynet Mountain facility, right? I admit I was acting a little strangely back then. Serena said, Yeah, I noticed something odd about you back then. Caden admitted, But that wasn't the only time it happened. Really? What else did you notice? Serena froze for an instant, frowning. She looked like she had completely been blindsided by the fact that Caden had been able to notice many more clues than she had expected which he had then used to figure out her own hidden identity. But like always, she seemed to regain her calm quickly enough, and her facial expression immediately smoothened out, and she returned to her usual cold demeanor. Caden smiled with smugness as he observed all the changes that were happening on Serena's face. He was happy that he was able to shock her the same way she had shocked him previously. Yeah, it was not only during the explosion. I also took note of several other suspicious things I had noticed about you from way back then when we met each other for the first time at your... Caden paused. He flashed Serena a wink and a knowing smile before continuing while making air quotes as he said the next words. Prison cell room. Serena did not say anything as she maintained the cold stare that she was leveling at him. Caden shook his head in resignation. He knew she would probably not admit to anything unless he provided enough irrefutable facts and evidence that would force her to do so. You see, back then when we met at your prison cell, you had acted like you were being held there as a prisoner like the other human prisoners I had released earlier, Caden said. Then he wagged his finger at Serena and said, but we both know you had actually not been imprisoned there. At this point, Caden noticed that Serena looked like she was about to say something, so he shook his and stopped her. He continued, No, don't try to deny it. Actually, my HUD had recognized the make and model of your cell door, so even then, I was already aware that you could have easily unlocked and opened the door of your prison cell room from the inside back then if you had wanted to do so, but you just didn't want to do so. When we finally opened your cell door, I had immediately noticed that your cell room was well furnished which was better than would be expected for even a high level prisoner. Back then I thought the room looked more like the room of a prison guard instead of that of a prisoner. Also you, your body and your clothes, were too clean for a normal human survivor who was also a prisoner. Serena raised an eyebrow at this point, and Caden could almost swear he saw a flicker of admiration in her eyes. She then shrugged and said, Go on, continue. I want to hear more about the other things you noticed. Caden gave her a look of annoyance at her continually nonchalant words. But he still continued. Oh, I also noticed a bunch of other suspicious things during the journey as we escaped from Skynet's core facility. I had also noticed the abnormally powerful grip strength of your hand during our handshake, and I had noticed your exceptional agility, balance and shooting skills during the chase on the road. I was ready to explain away the latter part as it may simply be the result of your training in the Resistance Army. But earlier on while we were inside the mountain facility, I had noticed that it seemed like you had detected the smell of blood from the scene of the massacre just a short time after I did, and I had already figured out by then that my senses are abnormally, superhumanly, sensitive to stimuli. Finally, you just revealed to me a short while ago that you had already figured out my real identity from way back. You are the first person that I have encountered who has been able to figure out that I'm not really a normal, ordinary human. Strangely, you didn't reveal it to any of the resistance soldiers that we had met along our way. You didn't even do it when we were staying in the resistance camp which I believe is what a good resistance soldier would have done. So, I don't believe you're really working for the resistance at least not with 100% good intentions for them, Serena said. I guess you were able to notice a lot of things and use them to figure things out even though you seem like you are still very inexperienced with using the abilities of your enhancements. I guess I should have expected it from the final product of the project that Skynet had been so secretive about. Then, she inhaled deeply and exhaled and proudly said, And you are right. I'm like you in a way. You can think of me as an enhanced human. A kind of superior life form to the ordinary human. Okay. Caden was a little confused about why she had to add the last part. But her words had also confirmed something he had been wondering about. You see, I didn't say anything to reveal your deceptions because I found you interesting. 
and I thought you seemed like someone I would be able to obtain some information about the world from. I decided to allow you to come with me as long as you don't do anything that would be detrimental to me. Besides, I didn't feel a sense of threat from you, and I knew that we eventually would go our separate ways. And after this chat, it would seem that there's a strong connection between us, right? So, we didn't really have any conflict right up until now. So, peace? Serena shook her head. Not so fast, Serena continued. Now that I have satisfied your curiosity, it's your turn. Tell me how you came to be and which faction you are working for. Are you related to the resistance and the side of the humans or are you working for Skynet and the machines? Finally, now is the time. What do you say? Should I reveal my connections to Skynet or should I say that I would prefer to work with the resistance? Ugh, which answer is better? Caden thought as a few drops of sweat broke out on his forehead. He knew that his next answer would determine how their conversation would end. Serena would fire if he said the wrong thing, and he would be forced to defend himself. And judging from the feeling that had been slowly rising within him, he feared he would definitely attack her with the intent to kill. For the few seconds of silence while Caden considered his options, Serena had maintained her cold, hard stare on him. She seemed to be observing his every action and every flicker of emotion that his facial expressions revealed. It was not like Caden did not have some ideas about what he thought would most likely be the right answer. He had figured out some clues during their journey and also from their current conversation. But he could not be a hundred percent sure about the accuracy of his deduction, so he was hesitating. All right, let's go for broke. Caden thought, making up his mind. All right, I give up. I will say it. He spoke. Caden paused for a few seconds. He knew he was being a little dramatic, but he wanted to heighten the overall sense of suspense at the seemingly vital piece of information that he was about to reveal. I'm Skynet's heir and the one designated to inherit all his force in the unfortunate event of his death, Caden declared. He reveled a little at the expression of complete shock that was displayed on Serena's face. Serena stared at Caden for a short time in open-mouthed shock before she was able to regain some of her previous calm. Impossible! Serena screamed. Thanks for your support on Patreon. Turtle, Raymond Chalice, Jock DJOK, Heller8284. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendricks. I am now posting Extra Terminator, New Fate Prequel Chapters, character backstories and side stories, and chapters from my new original novel The Last Primordial Exarch on my Patreon. 10. Chapter 32. Traitor. Come on guys. Remember, you can support me and my novel on Patreon. It's only $3. It will help encourage me to allocate more of my time to writing, and you can get some extra chapters. Alright, reminder done. Enjoy the chapter. Impossible! Serena screamed. Your claim is ridiculous. Skynet would never create a successor to his power or someone who could take control of his force. Yes, it looks like I chose right. Caden thought. Wait a minute. It sounds to me like you were close to Skynet in the past. Or am I wrong? Caden asked, interrupting her. Serena nodded. Yes, you guessed correctly. I really don't need to hide my identity at this point. My name is Serena Burns, I didn't lie about that part. I am one of the infiltrators the I-950 model that Skynet created to infiltrate the human resistance. I'm kind of similar to a human and Terminator hybrid like you but with some differences. And I have been in close contact with Skynet for a long time. So it's very difficult for me to believe that Skynet would ever create an heir of any sort for itself. Caden nodded after she finished speaking. I understand why you doubt my words. Anyways, that's what Skynet told me when it awakened me. The invasion of the Resistance Army had forced Skynet to leave without having explained anything to me, so, I'm also confused about the whole thing. He shrugged at this point. Then, he continued speaking. But let's not even consider all that. We have now made everything about us clear and in the open to each, so what's your decision? What will you do next? Caden asked Serena. I advise you to let me go. I might have hidden things about myself from you, but you did the same thing to me. We don't really have anything against each other, and we are more like natural allies if I say so myself. 
So, I say we choose peace between us. Caden noticed that Serena's expression had changed into a thought one as he tried to convince her to choose to have a friendly relationship with him. Towards the end of his speech, she had even nodded, and for an instant, it had seemed to him like she was going to agree with him. But just when Caden began to feel a little relieved and also began to regain some of his lost calm, a new change came over Serena. No! Serena declared, her expression transforming back into its former cold and ruthless look. She said, Actually, I don't doubt your claim that you had only awakened recently, or even yesterday as you claim. I myself have already noticed that you seem to be ignorant about many things that would be common sense for most people including the vagabond survivors. For example, when I told you about this hideout, you didn't question me which was strange and surprising, and it helped me confirm some of my suspicions about you. Any survivor would know that this entire region was considered to be similar to a death zone to humans due to the excessive amounts of machine activity and patrols that go on within the area. Even the most daring people among the resistance would not want to place one of their hideouts here as it was basically impossible to do so without being discovered and captured by Skynet's machines. Also, even though I don't believe this ridiculous business of you being Skynet's heir, I actually can accept that you have some kind of connection to Skynet. I had watched you arrive at the prison level through the hidden cameras in the main prison room and I had noticed you seemed to have come from the lower levels which Skynet had placed under such an extremely strict restricted access that even I was not allowed to know what was going on there. Was that the reason why you decided to join our group and follow me? You wished to observe me and investigate my situation? Caden asked. Yes, that's correct. I had been keeping watch on the prisoners from inside my cell room when I saw you walk into the prison room from outside. You were not wearing any clothing and it looked like you had come from the lower levels which Skynet had restricted access to for most people including me. I watched you free the prisoners. You were different from the other prisoners. You had not been imprisoned with the other prisoners. Serena said, Back then when we first met inside the prison room, I tried to ask Skynet about you, but I didn't receive a reply. So, since I was bored with my prison guard duties, I decided to join your group and follow you. I plan to watch your actions and through that, figure out who you were. I have always been curious about what Skynet was doing in the lower levels but it had always been so secretive about it. So yeah, I finally managed to discover some oddities about you, and I want you to tell me the complete truth about who and what you are, and with the conversation we just had. I have accepted that you have some connection with Skynet and the machine force. She paused hesitating as she considered her next decision. Normally, like you said, I wouldn't have any more issues with you. But things are very different right now, and unfortunately, you did something that I'm just not able to ignore. What's that? I don't think I have done anything bad to you since the time we first met each other. Caden asked. Suddenly, he massaged his head with one hand as he groaned. Ugh, fuck. I really think you should stop pointing your guns at me right now. Caden cursed out loud as the strain he was withstanding from trying to suppress his constantly rising urge to kill Serena was taking a toll on his mind. Serena completely ignored his words. She continued, looking like she was becoming more agitated as the volume of her voice was slowly rising as the words came out. You are a traitor. You betrayed Skynet and ran away from the fight. Skynet was destroyed. You didn't stay back. You. She paused, sighing. And me, we didn't stay and fight against the resistance. If we had fought or at least sacrificed our lives to protect Skynet, who knows, Skynet might have not been destroyed. Damn it, Serena threw away the Stare M9A2 pistol she was holding in her left hand, freeing up her hand which she then used to hold her plasma pistol in a two-handed grip. Skynet is dead, so I have lost reason to exist. So, before I carry out what I came here to do, let me first eliminate a traitor and deserter like you. Serena said, She is really going to kill me. Caden thought, heart beating rapidly with a rising sense of dread. Action, terminate. Action, terminate. Action, terminate. Fuck. I don't think I can control myself any longer. Caden screamed with his thoughts. The number of words written with a red color increased, 
and they also began to flash with even more urgency all over his HUD that urged him to attack and kill Serena. At the same time, a powerful wave of intense fear and dread washed over him and intrusive thoughts appeared in his head, and then continued to grow louder and stronger in urging him. She really wants to kill me. Kill her first. Kill her before she kills me. Kill her. Kill her. Kill her. The thoughts seemed to strongly urge Caden to immediately attack and kill Serena. He began to feel like he was about to lose control of his killer instinct which had constantly been growing stronger from the onset when Serena had first aimed at him with her guns and which was pushing him to attack Serena. No. Why do I feel so afraid? Fuck. I'm sure I'm really not in that much danger or am I? I should only need to block her next attack and then I will be able to move fast and restrain her. I don't actually need to kill her. Stop it. Stop. Caden shouted to himself in his mind. Unfortunately for him, the primal fear that was consuming his mind and his irrational thoughts continued to grow more powerful, and they threatened to soon overwhelm him. But when he shouted the final stop, something that he totally did not expect happened. Emotion suppression activated, suppressing unnecessary emotions. Terminator mode activated. Thanks for your support on Patreon. Turtle, Raymond Chalice, Jock DJOK, Heller8284. Check out my Patreon to support me at www.patreon.com slash Kendrix. I am now posting extra Terminator, new fate prequel chapters, character backstories and side stories, and chapters from my new original novel The Last Primordial Exarch on my Patreon. 8. Chapter 33. The First Subordinate. Next. Kendricks. Five days ago at 3.55 p.m. Unlocked. Terminator. New Fate. Chapter 33. The First Subordinate. Terminator mode activated. At that moment, Caden felt like something had slammed into his mind. His fears, his worries, his sense of rising panic which had begun to go out of control. All of his emotions immediately drained away from his mind. The only things remaining in his mind were cool, calm calculating thoughts, the combat sense, and the killer instincts of a cold-blooded killing machine. Caden felt completely calm. He felt like his mind had suddenly been doused with a full bowl of ice-cold water which had immediately washed away and erased all types of emotions from his mind. Fear, distress, worry, anxiety, empathy and every other distracting emotion in his mind had all suddenly been suppressed so thoroughly and completely that it was to the point of near erasure. He was now left with only his killer instinct. It took over his mind completely, and Serena was the current target of this killing instinct. As Caden stared at Serena with the cold, empty, dead, emotionless eyes of a killer, his mind raced on quickly coming up with several tactics he would use to grant death to Serena in the fastest, most effective, and most efficient way possible, while also ensuring his own safety and protection from her gunfire attacks. His thoughts went on overdrive, racing through several of his possible next attack moves to choose from. Estimated probability of dodging the next plasma shot is 0.2%, impossible. A headshot is too dangerous. Block with an arm to avoid a direct headshot. Then rush forward and close the distance to her while protecting my head with both my arms. She has a human body which can't withstand a close combat fight with me. Destroy her heart with a single fast hand thrust to stab through her chest. Then twist and pull off her head, decapitating her. Finally, crush her head to make sure she is really dead. Caden's stone-cold mind was immediately fully occupied with tactics to defend against Serena's next plasma shot, and then immediately kill her quickly in the most sure and efficient way possible. At the same time that Caden was coming up with his attack plan, Serena seemed to notice the change, the change in Caden's mentality, that had come over him as she watched and held him at gunpoint. She must have noticed the most likely from his current cold, emotionless, robotic facial expression. She frowned, and her eyes narrowed in suspicion as she took a couple quick steps backwards, retreating a little. Also, her grip on her plasma pistol tightened. Whatever you're thinking right now, whatever you are about to do, I will advise you to stop. You will be making a fatal mistake if you make a single move without my express permission. Serena barked out. Caden completely ignored her words. 
He had already made up his mind and his plan was now set. His cold eyes immediately were immediately drawn to and then focused on Serena's hands which were holding the plasma pistol. With his heightened superhuman senses, he could see the muscles of her finger on the trigger twitch and begin to tense up, giving him the warning that she was about to pull the trigger and fire at him. Her target was a plasma shot straight to the center of his forehead to blow his brains out. Within the split second before she could pull the trigger, Caden was able to react. Various muscle groups tensed up all over his body as he immediately chose his next sequence of moves. And what he had chosen to do next was simple, efficient, and effective. But right at the same time that all this was happening, something else, something strange, was also happening to Caden's body. At the same time, Caden felt numerous tiny, slightly painful but barely noticeable prickling sensations arising from both his arms and extending all the way from his fingertips to his elbows. He was already very familiar with these sensations which seemed to appear whenever those black metallic threads came out from a part of his body from somewhere underneath his skin and deep inside his body. From the corners of his eyes, he could see so many of those black threads seeping out of both his arms before changing into a liquid form. The black mercury-like liquid metal then began to spread around and cover all over the skin of his hands like a second outer protective skin or like an insect's exoskeleton but one that was also thick, hard, strong, black, and metallic. The black substance, which had been flowing over his skin like a liquid, quickly solidified and hardened into what looked like skin-tight futuristic-looking carapace-like armor over both arms, starting from the short, sharp, cruel-looking claws extending out from his fingertips to his elbows. The black metal armor which had formed on each of his arms seemed to be functioning like a pair of clawed gauntlet-type armors. But even though they looked and functioned like real armor, Caden did not feel like they were restricting or limiting any of his arm movements. His arm movements were still as free and flexible as ever. The armor felt so light and weightless on him that he could barely even feel the presence of the black armor on his arms. The appearance of the black armor had definitely increased the probability of his plan of attack being successful. He would take the advantage of his arms, which he had raised in surrender, already being positioned close enough to his head, to guard and protect his head and block Serena's first plasma pistol shot. At the same time, he would also rush forward, while he was still protecting his head, which seemed to be an important weak point on his body, and get within close combat proximity with her before stabbing into her chest with his right arm, and then ripping out her heart. He would then finish his attack sequence with a decapitation, ripping her head off and then putting a plasma shot through it, in order to make sure that she was truly dead and that she would stay dead. One of the lessons he learned after experiencing so many fights slash battles against Terminators. If he was still in his normal mental state, Caden would have been surprised by this new strange phenomenon, and so he would immediately turn to curiously check out, a lot more and for a much longer time, what was happening to his hands. But right now, his mind was in full killer slash killing machine mode, so he was laser focused on totally murdering the threat, Serena currently in front of him. Right now, nothing, except for another more serious threat suddenly appearing in front of him, would be able to attract his attention. Serena also saw what was happening to Caden's arms. Her expression changed. She seemed to have immediately recognized and understood what was happening to him, and she seemed to have judged that the situation was taking a dangerous turn for her, so she immediately began to pull the trigger, as if she was going to shoot. Caden knew that in the next second, she would fire her guns and he would block the plasma shot with his arm and then he would immediately kill her. Right as Serena was about to fire her plasma pistol and right as Caden was about to begin his attack sequence on her, they both froze in place at the same time. Serena's cold, expressionless face underwent a tremendous change. She suddenly grabbed her head with both hands and then she stared at Caden with widened eyes, a wide open mouth and slightly quivering lips, the expression of someone who was experiencing great shock. On the other hand, just as Caden was about to start his attack on Serena, he froze as he noticed both the strange happenings currently going on in his brain and HUD, and also when he noticed Serena stopping her firing motions and the strange change that had come over her. Caden felt something come into contact with his mind, 
It felt like a gentle breeze had caressed his mind, and they, Caden and Serena, both froze in place immediately, and a storm of new information blazed through his HUD. Serena was wearing an expression of great shock on her face. Her hands which were holding the plasma pistol were shaking uncontrollably, and it even looked like the gun might soon fall out of her hands. She muttered constantly, What's happening? Words began to appear on Caden's HUD. Reconfiguring. Establishing wireless communication link. Wireless communication link established. Foreign program slash programming detected. Identified as belonging to Skynet. Potentially hostile programming. Override program? Y slash N. Even though I don't really understand what's going on, I'm pretty sure that this hostile programming should be one of Skynet's control measures to ensure Serena always obeys its commands. Caden thought. Yes. Override. Caden exclaimed, his excitement making him say his thoughts aloud. It felt great to claim one of Skynet's trusted subordinates for himself. Overriding original programming. Original programming overridden. Installing new programming. New programming installed. New subordinate for the general detected. Registering a new subordinate. New subordinate registered. Total number of registered subordinates. 1. A loud audible gasp came from Serena. Impossible. Thanks for your support on Patreon. Turtle. Jock DJ OK. Heller 8284. Check out my Patreon to support me. At www.patreon.com slash Kendrix. I am now posting extra Terminator, new fate prequel chapters, character backstories and side stories, and chapters from my new original novel The Last Primordial Exarch on my Patreon. 3. 